Preface of The Boy Travellers in Australasia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A Fine Voice. The Boy Travellers in Australasia. Adventures of Two Youths in a Journey to the Sandwich, Marquesas, Society, Samoan and Fiji Islands, and through the colonies of New Zealand, New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, Tasmania and South Australia by Thomas W. Knox Preface The first settlement in Australia was made in 1788. Consequently, the inhabitants of the great southern continent are this year celebrating their centennial. Three millions of people settled in five great colonies, possessing all the characteristics of an advanced civilization, with the unity developed by a common language and a common allegiance, and the rivalry that springs from the independence of each colony by itself, are uniting in the centennial celebration and contrasting the Australia of today with that of one hundred years ago. Previous to the discovery of gold in Australia in 1851, Americans had but little knowledge of that faraway land. The opening of the auriferous fields attracted the attention of the whole civilised world to the Antipodes, and many Americans joined the multitude that went thither in search of wealth. Since that time, our relations with Australia have, year by year, grown more intimate. Railways across our continent and steamship lines over the broad Pacific have brought Sydney and Melbourne in juxtaposition to New York and San Francisco, and in this centennial Australian year, we may almost regard the British colonies under the Southern Cross as our next-door neighbours. The writer of this volume is not aware that any illustrated book descriptive of Australia and its neighbouring colonies, New Zealand and Tasmania, by an American author or from an American press, has ever yet appeared. Believing such a book desirable, he sent those youthful veterans of travel, Frank Bassett and Fred Bronson, over the route indicated on the title page, with instructions to make careful note of what they saw and learned. Under the guidance of their mentor and our old friend Dr. Bronson, they carried out their instructions to the letter, and the results of their observations will be found in the following pages. Trusting that the book will meet the favour that has been accorded to previous volumes of the Boy Traveller series, they offer their present work as their contribution to the Australian centennial, and hope that the boys and girls of their native land will find pleasure and profit in its perusal. The method followed in the preparation of previous volumes of the series has been observed in the present book as far as it was possible to do so. The author's personal knowledge of the countries and people of Australasia has been supplemented by information drawn from many sources, from books, newspapers, maps and other publications, and from numerous Australian gentlemen whom he has known or with whom he has been in correspondence. During the progress of the work, he has kept a watchful eye on the current news from the Antipodes and sought to bring the account of the condition of the railways, telegraphs and other constantly changing enterprises down to the latest dates. Many of the books consulted in the preparation of the boy travellers in Australasia are named in the text, but circumstances made it inconvenient to refer to all. Among the volumes used are the following. Wallace's Australasia, Forrest's Explorations in Australia, Warburton's Journey Across the Western Interior of Australia, Alexander's Bushfighting in the Maori War, Smythe's Aborigines of Victoria, Bodham Wetham's Pearls of the Pacific, Murray's Forty Years of Mission Work in Polynesia, Cummings' is At Home in Fiji, Markham's Cruise of the Rosario, Palmer's Kidnapping in the South Seas, Buller's Forty Years in New Zealand, Australian Pictures, Harkis's South Australia, Eden's Australia's Heroes, Trollope's Australia and New Zealand, and Nordhoff's Northern California, Oregon and the Sandwich Islands. The publishers have kindly allowed the use of illustrations that have appeared in Harper's Magazine and other of their publications, and these illustrations have admirably supplemented those that were specially prepared for the book. The maps on the front and rear covers were specially drawn from the best authorities and are intended to embody the most recent explorations 
and the latest developments of the railway systems of the Australian colonies. TWK, New York, July 1888. End of preface. Chapter 1 of The Boy Travellers in Australasia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by a fine voice. The Boy Travellers in Australasia by Thomas W. Knox. Chapter 1 Land ho from the masthead, where away from the bridge? Dead ahead, sir, was the reply, but it was almost drowned by the buzz of excitement which the announcement produced. The passengers who had been strolling about the decks, or listlessly lounging in their chairs, rushed hastily forward, in their eagerness to catch a glimpse of the land which had been reported, dead ahead. This happened on board the steamship Alameda, early one pleasant afternoon as she was nearing the Sandwich Islands, on a voyage from San Francisco. There were three passengers who did not join in the scramble towards the bow of the ship, but remained quietly seated in their chairs. They had been through the experience of sighting land from a steamer at sea too many times to regard it as a novelty. They were our old friends Dr. Bronson and his nephews Frank Bassett and Fred Bronson, whose experiences and adventures in various parts of the world are familiar to many American youths. Not content with what they had seen in Asia, Africa and Europe, they were now bound on a voyage to the Antipodes with the intention of adding another volume to the series in which their wanderings are recorded. It was on the eighth day of a voyage over the lovely azure waters of the broad Pacific that the Alameda neared the land, and many of her passengers half regretted that they were about to separate. The weather had been delightful, the breezes were light, the sky was nearly always clear, and the temperature high enough to make thick clothing uncomfortably warm, and an awning over the deck desirable. Since the second day out from San Francisco, not a sail had been seen, as the sailing ships take another track, in order to obtain stronger and more favouring winds. Four or five whales had shown themselves, and a few schools of porpoises played around the vessel from time to time, as though they wished to make the acquaintance of the strange monster. Flying fish were numerous, and so were those curious denizens of the deep popularly known as Portuguese men of war. One of the latter was caught by means of a bucket. A verdant passenger who admired its beautiful colours took it in his hand for a careful examination, but on feeling a stinging sensation he dropped it immediately. Dr. Bronson consoled him with the information that the scientific name of the Portuguese man of war is Fisalis pelagica, and its power of stinging enables it to benumb its prey. It consists principally of an air sac which floats it upon the water and has long tentacles hanging down at various lengths. These tentacles are armed with stings. They paralyse any small fish that comes within their reach and then act as fingers to sweep up the prize. It is a favourite trick of sailors to induce a novice to pick up a captured Fisalia so that they may enjoy his haste in dropping it. As the Alameda continued her course, the outline of the land grew more and more distinct, revealing the rugged volcanic cliffs of Oahu and reminding the passengers of the burning mountains for which the Sandwich Islands are famous. The course of the vessel lay through the Molokai Channel, leaving Molokai Island on the left and hugging closely against the surf-beaten shores of Oahu, on which the capital Honolulu is situated. Near the water there were occasional groves of coconut trees, but on the whole the shore was less tropical in appearance than our young friends had expected to find it. Every eye was straining to catch a view of Honolulu, but when its position was pointed out, most of the passengers were unable to discover any marked indications of the presence of a town. After a time, the steamer made a sharp turn to the starboard and passed through the narrow channel which leads into the pretty harbour of Honolulu. Then the town appeared rather suddenly in view, its houses surrounded by groves of palms and tamarind trees, interspersed with other tropical growths in rich profusion. 
The harbour is a deep basin in a coral reef, and so perfectly landlocked that it is ordinarily as smooth as a mill pond and is safe in all winds that blow. There is good anchorage for ships, and when the Alameda entered, there was a fleet of sufficient size in the port to give it a very prosperous appearance. Numerous small boats were darting about, and almost before the engines were stopped, the little craft swarmed in great force about the steamer. Back of Honolulu rises a series of volcanic mountains, three or four thousand feet high, and from the town itself to the foot of these mountains, the ground rises in a gentle slope, so that the view from the harbour is an excellent one. Dr. Bronson called the attention of the youths to a valley opening through the mountains, and to the contrast between the cliffs and slopes, and the bright waters immediately around them. All agreed that the place was very prettily situated, and the view was a great relief after the monotonous voyage from San Francisco. As soon as possible the party left the steamer and proceeded to the hotel, and, without waiting to see the rooms assigned to them, started out for a sightseeing stroll. They desired to make the most of their time, as they expected to continue their journey in a week or ten days at farthest. The Alameda was to return to San Francisco as soon as she could land her cargo and receive another. The regular mail steamer for Australia would touch at Honolulu at the time indicated, and it was by this steamer they were to proceed southward. As they walked along the streets, accompanied by a guide whom they had engaged at the hotel, Dr. Bronson gave the youths a brief history of the Sandwich Islands, which Fred afterwards committed to paper, lest it might escape his memory. Substantially, it was as follows. The famous navigator Captain Cook has the credit of discovering these islands in 1778, but they were known to the Spaniards more than a century before that time. The death of Captain Cook served to bring the islands into prominence. He named them after Lord Sandwich, who was then First Lord of the Admiralty. But they are known here as the Hawaiian Islands, Hawaii being the largest of the group. That is the island where Captain Cook was killed, is it not? inquired one of the youths. Yes, was the reply. It was at Kialakiakua Bay, in sight of the great volcano of Mauna Loa. The famous navigator did not get along well with the natives, who, like nearly all savages, were addicted to thieving. One of his boats having been stolen, he determined to seize the king and hold him a prisoner until the boat was returned. For this purpose he landed with a lieutenant and nine men. The natives suspected his intentions, and a fight ensued, which resulted in his death. And they devoured him, it is said, Frank remarked. As to that, replied the doctor, there has been much dispute. Captain King, the successor of Cook, and historian of the expedition after the latter's death, positively declares that the body of Cook was eaten, along with the bodies of the sailors and marines who were killed at the same time. On the other hand, the islanders declare with equal positiveness that cannibalism did not exist here at that time, and though great indignities might have been perpetrated, the horrible accusation is untrue. At this distance of time it is impossible to say what happened, and we will dismiss the subject, but it is generally conceded that the great navigator owed his death to his severity in dealing with the natives, and his imprudence in venturing on shore with the small force which accompanied him. But we'll leave the famous captain at rest, continued the doctor, while we give our attention to more modern things. Great changes have taken place in the hundred years or so that have elapsed since Captain Cook's death. Then the people were savages and idolaters. Now they are civilised and Christianized, and may be considered a harmless and kindly disposed race. Education is universal among them, hardly a native of Hawaii being unable to read and write. Every child is obliged to attend the public schools, and there is a special school tax of two dollars on every voter. In addition to a general tax for educational purposes, schools are in every part of the islands where there is any population, and the teachers are paid out of the taxes I have mentioned. I suppose the missionaries are to be credited with the spread of education here, are they not? one of the youths asked. Yes, was the reply, and there have been no more earnest and energetic missionaries anywhere in this world than those that came to the Hawaiian Islands. 
The first missionaries arrived here in 1820, and for 33 years the mission enterprise was supported by contributions in the United States and elsewhere. In that time the donations of Christian people in the United States for the conversion of the inhabitants of the Hawaiian Islands amounted to more than $900,000. What was done at the end of that time? Fred asked. In 1853, the missionaries reported that the people of the Hawaiian Islands had been converted to Christianity and that idolatry no longer existed among them. Then it was voted by the American Board of Missions that the Sandwich Islands, having been Christianized, shall no longer receive aid from this board. From that time, the churches have been practically self-supporting, though they have received some aid from America. At present, the Hawaiian Islands have a missionary society of their own, which is sending missionaries and teachers into other islands of the Pacific. And they have a printing office, where Bibles are printed in several Polynesian languages, just as Bibles were formerly printed in New York for the use of the Sandwich Islanders. Here the guide interrupted them to point out Kawaiho Church, which he said was the first native church in Honolulu, a substantial and well-built edifice, that reminded the strangers of many churches they had seen in the New England states. In reply to Frank's remark to this effect, Dr. Bronson said that the most of the early missionaries came from Boston and its vicinity, and it was therefore to be expected that the churches would be of the New England pattern. Fred asked if the church they were passing was the first ever built in the islands. The guide explained that it was the first native church, but not the first American one. That honour belongs to the Seamen's, or Bethel, church, which was sent from Boston in a whale ship around Cape Horn. It was brought in pieces and set up soon after the ship arrived here. Honolulu has been for a long time a great resort for whalemen, and about 1846 special attention was paid to their needs by the establishment of a Bethel church and society. The most famous man in connection with this branch of the missionary enterprise was Reverend Mr. Damon, who obtained the reputation of an earnest friend of the seamen, and was generally called Father Damon, in consequence of his paternal care and his kindness towards all who came within his influence. He established a seamen's home in connection with the church, and it has been of great use in keeping the sailors away from the evil influences that are found in most ocean ports. Go where you will on these islands, said the doctor. You will find churches everywhere, and not far from each church there is a native schoolhouse, where the children are taught to read and write. On Sunday the churches are filled with worshippers, and there is no more devout people anywhere than on these islands. There are now more churches than are needed by the population, for the reason, not that there is any decline in religious seal, but because of the decrease in the number of inhabitants. At the time of Captain Cook's discovery, the islands were estimated to have a population of not far from 200,000. Smallpox, measles and other diseases have made terrible havoc, and at present the native population is little, if any, above 50,000. It has been declining with more or less rapidity ever since the beginning of the century, and the last census showed a considerable falling off since the one that preceded it. Not only are the islanders diminishing in numbers, he continued, but the people of today are said to be smaller in statue than those of a century ago. The missionaries and other old residents say that when they first came here, they used to meet great numbers of natives of high stature and majestic figures, belonging generally to the old families of chiefs and nobles. Occasionally at this time you may see them, but not often. I suppose the chiefs and nobles were of a different race, Frank remarked, otherwise they would all be of the same general height. That was formerly supposed to be the case, was the reply, and even now the theory is sustained by many people. But I believe the general opinion is that all were of the same race, and the superior development of the chiefs and nobles was due to their easier life and better food, which could hardly fail to have an effect through many generations. One of the youths asked if the people received the missionaries kindly, and showed a desire to be instructed and civilised. In a general way they did, was the reply, though that was by no means always the case. 
Some of the chiefs looked suspiciously upon the coming of the strangers, fearing, and not without reason, that their power would be diminished as their subjects became enlightened. The king was favourable to the work of the missionaries, and consequently the hostility of the chiefs could not be exercised with severity. Before the advent of the missionaries, the Hawaiians had no written language. The missionaries reduced the language to writing, prepared school books, a dictionary, a hymn book and a translation of a part of the scriptures, all in the native tongue, and they trained the native teachers who were needed for the management of the schools then and afterwards established. In this way the missionaries gave the Hawaiian people the benefits of civilization, and year by year saw the old superstitions and customs disappearing. Some of them still remain, but not many. Just as in New England you may to this day find people who believe in witchcraft, and all over the United States, persons who have implicit faith in supernatural things. The Hawaiians are by no means perfect in their morals and beliefs, and you can find iniquity in Honolulu, just as you may find it in Boston or Philadelphia. Murder and theft were very common a hundred years ago. Now the former crime is quite as rare as in the United States, and as for the latter, it is even more so. Nearly all the stealing in the islands is done by Chinese or other foreigners, and not by the natives. Our friends passed near the courthouse, which bore a marked resemblance to an American town hall in a prosperous town, and stood at the edge of a well-kept garden. The doctor remarked that courthouses and jails were some of the adjuncts of all civilised lands, and therefore they were needed in Hawaii as well as elsewhere. But, I am told, he continued, that the majority of the inmates of the jail at Honolulu are of other races than the Hawaiian, and that Americans and English form a good proportion. A little way beyond the courthouse our friends met a man, carrying two covered baskets slung at the ends of a short pole which rested on his shoulder. Frank turned to the guide and asked what the man was carrying. He's a poi peddler, was the reply, and I wonder you have not met one before, as there are many of them. He peddles poi, and the people buy it to eat. He then explained that poi is the national dish of the islands, and is made from the taro root, which is the sandwich island form of the potato. He pointed out a taro garden and said that there were many such gardens in and around Honolulu, as the natives did not consider a home complete without one. The taro root is baked in an underground oven and then mashed very fine, so that it would be like flour if the moisture were expelled. After it had been thoroughly mashed, it is mixed with water, and in this condition is ready for eating. It has an agreeable taste when fresh, and most foreigners like it upon the first trial. For native use it is allowed to ferment. When fermented it suggests sour paste to the uneducated palate, and is nauseating to the novice. Natives greatly prefer it in this form, and a good many foreigners cultivate their taste until they too would rather have their poi sour than fresh. Soon after the islands were settled by foreigners, an ingenious Yankee saw a chance for making money by importing machinery for making poi, in place of the old form of hand crushing. Now there are factories in various parts of the island where poi is made in large quantities chiefly for the use of planters and other large consumers. It forms quite an article of export to other islands, where Polynesian labour is employed, and especially to the Guano Islands, where nothing can be cultivated. A former king of Hawaii established a poi factory at Honolulu, and by so doing became very unpopular with his subjects, just as has been the case with other kings who have introduced labour-saving machinery into their dominions. At dinner that evening, Frank and Fred asked for poi and were promptly supplied. It was explained to them that the native way of eating it was to insert the forefinger in the dish, twirl it around until it was well coated with the sticky substance, and then draw the finger through the mouth. Both the youth concluded that they would allow the natives to monopolise that form of eating, which was hardly to be reconciled with civilised customs. They contented themselves with spoons, which answered their purpose completely. Poi, fish and pork are the principal articles of food among the Hawaiians, but at a feast several articles are added that do not come into the daily bill of fare. 
The guide took Frank and Fred to a native Luaru, or festival, and pointed out the following dishes, poi, fish and pork, as already mentioned. Baked Thai root, which bore a striking resemblance to molasses cake, of which New Englanders are fond, and the resemblance included both appearance and taste, raw shrimps and limu, which is a sea moss, smelling and tasting very disagreeably to the novice. Kulau, which is an agreeable compound of coconut and taro root, palolo, a combination of coconut and sweet potato of a sweetish taste, and two or three additional mixtures of the same sort. Then there were cuttlefish, raw and cooked, roasted dog, and a small quantity of pickled salmon, liberally dosed with red pepper. Fred suggested that as the salmon was imported, and therefore expensive, the red pepper was freely added, in order that the article would be sparingly eaten. The guide, who was a native, explained that the feast was for the purpose of enabling the giver to build a new house, and each guest was expected to pay fifty cents for his entertainment. He pointed out a calabash bowl lying on the ground as a receptacle of the money, as it was a matter of etiquette for the master not to receive the cash directly from the hands of his guests. The affair had been arranged some time beforehand, and the price of the feast was mentioned in the invitation. Everybody was in new clothes, it being one of the Hawaiian customs that every garment worn at a feast must be quite new, and a native would rather be absent from the entertainment than violate this point of etiquette. Five or six men who served as stewards were dressed exactly alike, each of them wearing a green shirt and red trousers made for the occasion. In addition to this, they had green wreaths on their heads, and most of the persons present had their heads decked with flowers or leaves. The diners sat on the ground, and as they took their places, their portions of roast pig, neatly wrapped in Thai leaves, were distributed to them. They were expected to be satisfied with their allowance, and etiquette forbade their asking for more of this article, though they could help themselves freely to anything else. When the feast was over, each one carried away whatever of his roast pork was unconsumed. The guide said it would be very impolite to leave any portion of it, and even the bones were carried away. The feeding was not done in a hurry. A native feast lasts for several hours, the guests pausing two or three times to get up a fresh touch of appetite, and occasionally walking about, singing, dancing, talking or laughing, in order to increase the capacity of their stomachs. Our young friends tasted some of the dishes, and each dropped a half dollar in the calabash bowl that was designated as the receptacle of the contributions of the guests. They carried away their portions of roast pig, and gave the packages to some urchins whom they encountered, a short distance from the scene of the feast. The latter immediately sat down to enjoy the toothsome delicacy, and no doubt imagined themselves to be for the time the most favoured beings in the land. Their appearance indicated that roast pig did not often enter into their bill of fare, and the rapidity with which they attacked the contents of the packages showed that they had not dined. Frank thought it must have been a great change for the people of the islands, when they abandoned their old customs of going without clothing and adopted the dress of civilization, When it is remembered that a hundred years ago the islanders were naked savages, the remark of the youth is not to be wondered at. The missionaries say that in the early days the attempts of the natives to adopt European dress were decidedly ludicrous. They could not understand the necessity of three or more garments, but thought a single one sufficient to begin with. A hat, a shirt and a pair of trousers were considered enough for three, and some of them used to argue that these garments were altogether too numerous for one individual, when there were so many others without anything. Fred made a sketch of a group of women, and afterwards procured several photographs, showing how the feminine natives of the islands are ordinarily clad. On the back of the sketch he wrote as follows, the dress of the women can hardly be called picturesque, but after being seen a few times its oddity is not as apparent as at first. Most of the women go bareheaded, or with wreaths of leaves and flowers in their hair. Their dress hangs from the shoulders, without being gathered in at the waist, and quite closely resembles the morning wrapper of civilised lands. 
though it is not so ornamental. Black, dark and pink are the usual colours of the dress, but on festive occasions something gayer can be frequently seen. You would be surprised to see the grace and dignity with which the older women carry themselves, and I think much of it is due to the loosely flowing dress. The climate is so mild that heavy clothing is not needed. The heat is of course greater in the lowlands than among the mountains, whose highest peaks are covered with snow for a considerable part of the year. Honolulu is said to be the hottest place in the kingdom, and thin clothing, but not the thinnest, is worn there the entire year. White is worn a great deal, but it is so easily soiled that a good many prefer to wear garments of blue serge, or blue or grey flannel. Flannel is desirable for the winter months, but the islands are so near the equator that the difference between winter and summer is not very great. In December and January, the temperature sometimes falls to 62 degrees Fahrenheit in the early morning, but by noon or 2 p.m. it generally reaches 75 degrees or 76 degrees and remains between that point and 70 degrees until midnight. In July, the highest point reached is 86 degrees and on a few occasions, 87 degrees. The extreme range of the thermometer is not more than 26 degrees or 28 degrees, which makes it a very comfortable climate to live in. It is said to be an excellent one for persons suffering from pulmonary complaints, though it is somewhat debilitating for healthy men and women accustomed to the rigorous climate of the northern states of America. Residents of the island say there are regions among the mountains where the nights are invariably cool enough for a fire all the year round, while the days are never hot. Even in Honolulu, the air is not as sultry as that of New York or Philadelphia in July and August, and the greatest heat experienced is almost always tempered by a breeze. There is more rain in winter than in summer, but there is no really dry season. It is a circumstance that strikes the stranger curiously that there is much more rain on the windward side of the islands than on the leeward. Sometimes the former will have a great deal of rain, while the latter gets little or hardly any. The trade wind controls the rainfall, and by ascertaining where it strikes, a newcomer may have much or little rain accordingly as he selects his place of residence. The guide told the youth that they could sit on the veranda of the hotel at Honolulu and see the rain fall every day, but without getting a drop within the limits of the city. You may be here all day in the sunshine, said he, but if you are going to the windward side of the island, you must take your rubber overcoats. The showers that you see from the hotels are from the clouds that have been blown over the mountains, and as soon as you cross the range, you will be in the midst of them. Dr. Bronson said that the decrease in the population of the islands had been, by some people, attributed to the adoption of clothing by the natives. It is argued, said he, that the people are very careless and have not learned the sanitary laws which govern the use of clothing. A native thinks nothing of lying down with his wet clothes upon him when he has been soaked by a rain or dipped in the surf. It is hard to make him understand that such a practice is dangerous and many of the inhabitants have died of the severe colds contracted in this way. In the outskirts of the city, our friends came to our house, which the guide said was a good specimen of the native dwelling, and they obtained permission to enter and examine it. It had a door, but no windows. It was a single story in height, and its sides were made of upright sticks interwoven with palm leaves, while the roof was thatched with grass. The floor was of solid earth covered with mats, and at one end there was a sort of platform raised a foot higher than the rest. This platform was the sleeping place of the inmates and was elevated in order to ensure its freedom from dampness in case of a heavy rain. In front of the house was a bench where one might sit in the shade during the afternoon and where, no doubt, the owner idled away a considerable part of his time. The islanders are not fond of hard work and in fact they have no occasion to labour as industriously as do the inhabitants of more rigorous regions. Around Honolulu, the expense of living is greater than it is away from the port, owing to the increased price of the products of the fields. 
In the country it may be said that a man who works two days in the week can support his family comfortably, especially if he is near the sea coast, whence he can obtain a supply of fish at any time he chooses to go for them. Fishing, taro planting and making poi are his chief occupations, and to these he generally adds mat weaving, which is neither difficult nor laborious. His wants are few and easily supplied, and it is no wonder that the islander displays an unwillingness to wear himself out in constant toil. The conditions of life do not require him to do so, and he lacks the ambition to accumulate a fortune solely for the sake of accumulating it. After dinner, the guide proposed that the strangers should witness a hula-hula, or native dance. It was quite unlike the dancing of European countries, consisting principally of more or less active movements of the limbs, while the body of the dancer swayed from side to side. The dancers were girls dressed in short frocks, like those worn by American schoolgirls. They had wreaths in their hair and around their ankles, and their dresses were loosely gathered in at the waist, where they were held by cords. The music was supplied by two men who struck their hands upon large calabashes and sang or chanted a low, monotonous air. A very little of the dance satisfied the curiosity of the visitors, and they returned to the hotel at an early hour. The Hawaiians have another dance which can be seen at their festivals. It is performed by men and women, usually elderly people, and is accompanied by singing, in which all may join. Then there are dances for the younger people, but they are not generally practised, owing to the opposition of the missionaries and possibly to the unwillingness of the people to indulge in active exercise, unless they are paid for it. All the dances have descended from the days before the advent of the foreigners, and therefore have an interest for anyone who desires to learn whatever he can about the history of the islanders. End of chapter 1Chapter 2 of The Boy Travellers in Australasia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by a fine voice The Boy Travellers in Australasia by Thomas W. Knox Chapter 2 The next day was devoted to excursions in the immediate vicinity of Honolulu. A carriage drive through the principal streets of the town, a visit to the palace and other government buildings, and two or three calls to present letters of introduction. The visit to the palace included an introduction to the king, Kalakua, who received his visitors politely and devoted a short time to their entertainment. The conversation referred mainly to the United States and barely touched upon matters connected with the islands. In their drive about the city, Frank and Fred found that Honolulu is a well-built town with narrow streets. The houses are mostly of wood, dropped down rather carelessly in many places, with little attempt at uniformity, and not much decoration. The amount of tropical verdure, which almost concealed many of the villas and detached residences in the side streets and outskirts of the place, recalled Ceylon and other regions near the equator, which they had visited in their former travels. Frank thought he could readily imagine himself in the suburbs of Colombo, while Fred was inclined to close his eyes for a moment and think he had been transported on the enchanted carpet of the Arabian Nights to Batavia or Buitenzorg in Java. In many of the courtyards fountains were playing, the drops of water sparkling in the bright sunshine and adding materially to the beauty of the scene. There are some fine residences in Honolulu, but none that would be considered of much consequence in a wealthy capital of Europe. The best buildings are the public ones, and in the list we must include the Hawaiian Hotel as it was built by the government at an expense that was considered a heavy one for the country to bear. Near the hotel is the theatre, which is also a government affair and brings very little revenue to its owners. It is in use occasionally whenever a strolling company on a voyage between Australia and America happens along and gives a few performances. Honolulu is hardly able to support a theatre through the entire year, as the portion of the population able and willing to patronise it is very small. 
Frank and Fred were amused at the equestrian performances of the natives, and particularly at the dash and energy with which the laughing girls pushed their horses at full speed. They rode man-fashion, bestriding the horse instead of sitting on a side-saddle, and few of them seemed contented with any but the most rapid pace. The horses of the Hawaiian Islands are small but strong, and capable of great endurance. In fact, if they were otherwise, it is evident they would not live long, when the habits of the natives are remembered. In travelling in the Hawaiian Islands, it is necessary to carry your saddle, as carriage roads are not numerous, and a good many places that one wishes to visit cannot be reached by wheeled vehicles. Of course, it is possible to hire saddles when hiring horses, but this is by no means universally the case. The afternoon drive was extended to the Pali, a mountain pass six miles out of the town, and one of the chief attractions to visitors who could only make a brief stay at Honolulu. Outside of the business portion of the place, our friends entered upon a straight and very dusty road, which for the first two miles and more led among the villas belonging to the merchants and other well-to-do people who make Honolulu their home. Each villa stands in a garden by itself, and the houses are often rendered invisible by the masses of foliage that surround them, and the creeping and climbing plants that rise to their very tops. The road steadily rises, and consequently the occupants of the houses have fine views of the bay and town, while the mountains rise behind them to form a background. Fred was so charmed with the beauty of the scene that he wished to sketch some of the villas, but the recollection of their limited time prevented his carrying the desire into execution. Beyond this region of villas, the carriage entered the foothills, where the road wound with a steep grade among taro fields, in which men were at work up to their knees in water, tending the plants which yield to the Hawaiians the staff of life. The water which irrigates the taro fields is brought by innumerable streams from the sides of the mountains, to which it is supplied by the clouds borne by the trade winds. Honolulu received its water from the mountains, and there is certainly an abundance of it. Beyond the taro fields there is good grazing for cattle and sheep, of which there are numerous herds and flocks. Frank called attention to a waterfall some distance away, which made a pretty contrast with the dark sides of the mountain, and was evidently nearly, if not quite, two hundred feet in height. At one of the turns of the road the carriage came in contact with a cart which was descending the slope too swiftly for safety. The damage was trifling, but for a few moments things wore a serious aspect, as there was a good chance of being tossed over the side of the almost precipitous slope. There were not many travellers along the road, the most picturesque being groups of girls on horseback and the herders who were driving cattle to market, or for a change of pasture. The girls were generally in bright-coloured robes, which were gathered in at the waist with brighter sashes that streamed behind them as they dashed along the road. Most of them wore straw hats on their heads, and generally the hats were adorned with flowers in wreaths and festoons, which were most liberally bestowed. Now and then Frank's attention was drawn to a pretty face, which surmounted a neck adorned with a string of blossoms of gaudy colours. The necklace formed an admirable setting for the complexion, for sometimes the blossoms were not chosen with due regard to the contrast of colours. The Hawaiian cowboys, or cattle drivers, were not unlike their American prototypes, as they wore broad-brimmed hats and bright-coloured scarfs. They were mounted on tough little horses and sat in saddles of the American cowboy pattern, the pommel rising high and the stirrups made of wood. Then there were strings of pack mules and horses coming down from the points in the mountains, inaccessible to wheeled vehicles, and now and then our friends met a Chinese gardener, taking the produce of his little patch to market on the back of a pack animal, and in some instances on a wheelbarrow. A few groups of men and women on foot were encountered, but the number was so small that Frank and Fred concluded that the Hawaiians were a home-loving people, and did not wander about much. Near the Pali, the road passed through thickets of how trees which resembled the growths of manzanita on the slopes of the Californian foothills. These thickets are so dense that it is impossible for man or horse to pass through them. In fact, they are impenetrable to any but the smallest animals. 
Frank thought he would like to cut a cane as a souvenir, but refrained from doing so when reminded by Fred that he could probably buy all the canes he wanted in Honolulu. Suddenly, from the other side of the narrow pass, a wonderful panorama was presented. Around on each side were the rugged cliffs of the mountain range, while in front they looked from a height of eight or nine hundred feet above the sea level upon a picture which included every variety of scenery. In the distance was the blue Pacific, washing the sandy shores and curving reefs of coral, and between the ocean and the point where our friends were standing were grassed and wooded foothills, and long stretches of lowlands, dotted with coffee and sugar plantations, taro fields and other evidences of careful cultivation, together with villages and clusters of huts that marked the dwelling places of the men engaged in this tropical agriculture. We could almost say that we had the colours of the rainbow in this bit of landscape, said Fred afterwards, while describing the scene. The blue sky and sea were tinged with purple. The distant mountains varied in shades of blue and grey. The foothills and plains gave us every verdant tinge that you can name, from the bright green of the mountain grass to the dark foliage of the vegetation that surrounded the villages. And as for yellow, you had it in every variety, from the reddish tint of the sinuous roads to the bright and almost white belt of sand that separated land from sea. We recalled several similar views in different parts of the world, but could give none of them preference over this. It was the view from the Badar Gate in the Crimea, combined with Wakwala near Pointe de Galle, and a bit of the scene from the right Colm in Switzerland. Whoever goes to the Hawaiian Islands will consider his visit incomplete unless he includes the island of Hawaii and the great volcano of Kilauea in his tour. Dr. Bronson desired that the party should proceed thither at the earliest moment and found an inquiry that a steamer was to leave for Hilo on the second morning after their arrival at Honolulu. Prepare for wet weather, said the informant, as it rains all the time at Hilo. They say they have seventeen feet of rain there annually, and sometimes there are days and days together when it rains without letting up a minute. Gum coats and waterproofs are in order, and the more you have of them, the better. Continuing, the narrator said that a Hilo man once made an experiment by knocking out the heads of an oil cask, and it rained in at the bunghole faster than the water could run out at the ends. Frank asked for the documents in the case, the affidavits before the Justice of the Peace and the certificate of the resident clergyman, but they were not forthcoming. Another story was that the fishes frequently swam up into the air a distance of three or four hundred yards before discovering they were not in the bay, the showers being so dense that it was impossible for them to distinguish the one from the other. Fred declared himself sceptical on this subject, as the showers consisted of fresh water while the bay was salt, and a saltwater fish does not usually show a willingness to swim up a freshwater stream, except in the spawning season. The run to Hilo was made in about forty hours, the steamer making several stops on the way. It rained cats and dogs when the party landed, but as all the baggage had been wrapped in waterproof coverings, nothing was damaged. Arrangements were speedily made for departure on the following morning, without regard to the weather, Horses and guides were engaged, the best animals being selected for the saddles and others for packing purposes, and a substantial lunch was made ready for the midday meal. Dr. Bronson insisted that the horses should all be freshly shod before starting, and an extra supply of shoes and nails carried along. The road goes over the lava beds for nearly the whole distance, and if a horse loses a shoe, he will go lame in a very few minutes. So rough and cutting is the lava. Fortunately, the morning was fine, and the Bay of Hilo presented a pretty appearance. Groves of palm and other tropical trees lined the shore. The surf broke in regular pulsations upon the curving stretch of beach and was made animate by dozens of men and boys at play in the waves. For the first time, our friends saw some of the sport in the water for which the islanders are famous, though less so at present, than in the days that are gone. Fred thus described it. Each man had a surfboard, which was a thick plank twelve or fifteen feet long, and perhaps thirty inches wide, 
and said to be made from the trunk of a breadfruit tree. There were five or six of the natives to whom we had promised half a dollar each for the performance. They pushed out with their planks to the first line of breakers and managed to dip under it and swim along by the help of the undertow. They passed the second line in the same way and finally got beyond the entire stretch of surf into comparatively smooth water. Then they tossed up and down for a while, waiting for their chance. What they wanted was an unusually high swell and they tried to find a place in front of it so that it would sweep them towards the shore, just where it broke into a coma. They tried several times but failed and we began to get out of patience. At last they got what they had waited for, while some were kneeling on their planks and others lying extended with their faces downward, and just ahead of the great coma they swept on at a speed of little, if any less, than forty miles an hour. There they were just ahead of the breaker, and apparently sliding downhill. One of them was swamped by it, but he dived and came up behind the wave and made ready for the next. The others kept on and were flung high and dry by the surf, and as soon as they could rise from their planks, they ran towards us to receive their pay. One of the fellows stood erect on his plank while in the surf, just as the Nubians at the first cataract of the Nile stand up while descending through the foaming water. Meanwhile, the guides were busy, getting the cavalcade in readiness, and a little before eight o'clock, the party was under way for the great volcano. From Hilo to the volcano house is a distance of thirty miles. The horses go for the most of the time at a walk, and though the ride has been accomplished in six hours, it is better to allow not less than ten for it, and take things easily. This will give time for a rest of an hour for lunch at the halfway house, the lunch being the one which we have already prepared. Frank wanted to try the effect of a gallop, but to guard against accidents, Dr. Bronson suggested that gallops would be out of order for the day. The path over the lava is full of holes, and very rough and broken in many places. The natives trot and gallop along the road, but the novice should refrain from so doing. At a walking pace there is little discomfort, and practically no danger, and parties of ladies and children can make the journey without excessive fatigue. Ci va piano va sano, as the Italians say. The youths found the ride from Hilo to the volcano full of interest. They amused themselves by comparing the lava fields with those of the volcanoes they had visited in other parts of the world, and they studied the ferns, of which there were many varieties, the largest of them having stalks three or four feet in diameter, and a height of fifteen or twenty feet. Other ferns were very small, and between the small and large there were all shades of colours and all possible sizes. One of the guides showed that the ferns were not altogether ornamental plants, as he plucked from one of them a woolly substance he called pulu, and said it was used for stuffing beds and pillows. Many tons of pulu are exported every year to America and other countries. At the halfway house, everybody was hungry, and the lunch was speedily disposed of. A little after six o'clock in the evening, the volcano house was reached, and here the party spent the night. A good supper was prepared and eaten, and the incidents of the day and plans of the morrow were discussed. Then the youths joined Dr. Bronson, at the suggestion of the latter, in a sulphur vapour bath of nature's own preparation, and after it all retired to sleep. The accommodations were limited, but everybody was weary enough to be willing to put up with the most primitive style of lodging, provided nothing better could be obtained. Here is what Frank wrote concerning the visit of our friends to the centre of the volcano. We took a hearty breakfast and left the house about half past eight o'clock in the morning to make acquaintance with the crater. We put on our strongest shoes but did not encumber ourselves with heavy clothing. As the guide said, we should not need it. The house is quite near the crater, almost on its edge. And so we didn't have far to go to begin sightseeing. In fact, we had begun it on the previous evening. And all through the night, as the light of the volcano was almost constantly in our eyes. Two or three times during the night we saw the lava spurting up like a fountain, above the edge of one of the small craters, and altogether the scene was an exciting one. It is fully three miles from one side of the crater, of Kilawa, to the other, but you do not walk in a straight course across it, 
for the simple reason that you can't. The crater is a great pit, varying from 800 to 1500 feet in depth. Its floor consists of lava, ashes and broken rocks, the lava predominating. It is rough and uneven, and in several places there are small craters, sending up jets of flame, smoke and steam, and there are numerous cracks from which smoke and steam issue constantly. In many places the lava lies in great rolls and ridges that are not easy to walk over, and some of them are quite impassable. Consequently, the path winds about a good deal, and you may be said to walk two miles to get ahead one. The floor of the crater is hardly the same from week to week, and if I should make a map of it and describe the place very carefully, you might not know it if you come here a year from now. In many places it is so hot that you cannot walk on it. Lava cools very slowly, and the thicker the bed of it, the longer the time it requires for cooling. The Hawaiians say that the volcano is under the control of the goddess Pele. She is a capricious deity, and you never know for any great length of time beforehand what she will do. Whenever the mood strikes her, she orders an eruption, and straightway the fires are lighted, the mountain trembles, and the earth all around is violently shaken. Flames burst forth from the crater and shoot high in air, and sometimes the floor of the whole area is lifted and tossed like the waves of the sea. Kilaua may be said to be constantly active, as the fires never cease, but there are periods of great activity, followed by seasons of comparative quiet. Over the floor of the great crater, we picked our way for nearly three miles to the burning lakes. And what do you suppose these lakes are? Their name describes them as they are literally burning lakes, lakes of fire so hot that if you should be foolish enough to try to bathe in them, or so unfortunate as to fall into their waves, you would be burned up in less than a minute. We had to climb up a steep bank of lava to get in sight of them, and then what a spectacle was presented. There were two little lakes or ponds, five or six hundred feet in diameter, and separated by a narrow embankment, which the guide said was occasionally overflowed, and either covered entirely or broken down for a while. These lakes are on the top of a hill, formed by the cooling of the lava, and at the same time we saw them their surface was perhaps one hundred feet below the point where we stood, on the outer edge or rim. The wind blew from us over the lakes, and carried away the greater part of the smoke and the fumes of sulphur. But in spite of the favouring breeze, we were almost choked by the noxious gases that rose from the burning lava and the numerous crevices in the solid banks where we stood. I said the bank was formed by the cooling of the lava, I should rather say by its hardening, as it was far from cool. It was so hot that it burned our feet through the soles of our thick shoes, and we stood first on one foot and then on the other, as turkeys are said to stand on a hot plate. Fred sat down to rest, but he stood up again in less than half a minute, as it was like sitting on a hot stove. We had brought a canteen of water, which the guide placed on the ground near us. When I went to pick it up for a drink, the air and exertion having made me very thirsty, it was so hot that I burned my fingers in trying to hold it. The water in the canteen was like a cup of tea, as good housewives like to pour it steaming from the kettle. Our faces were blistering with the heat that rose from the surface of the lakes, and then we scorched our hands in trying to protect our faces. We were blinded and suffocated. We coughed and spluttered and found it difficult to speak and in a little while concluded we had had quite enough of the lakes. We used our eyes rapidly, as there was a great deal to look at, and the whole scene was such as does not often come into one's opportunities. The molten lather seethed, bubbled, boiled and rolled below us, its surface covered with a greyish and thin crust, out of which rose irregular circles and patches of fire that seemed to sweep and follow one another, from the circumference to the centre of the lake. Every minute or so the lava in the centre of the lake bulged up and broke into an enormous bubble or wave which sometimes rose twenty or thirty feet into the air and then broke and scattered just as you see a bubble breaking in a kettle of boiling paste or oatmeal porridge. I know the comparison is a homely one but I can't think of anything that will better describe what we saw. The bank of the lake down near where the lava came against it was red hot 
and so you may imagine if you can a mass of liquid fire rolling and surging against a solid one. One of the lakes was much more agitated than the other, and the liquid lava seemed to break upon its sides very much like a sea upon a rocky shore. Owing to the half-plastic condition of the lava, it could not break into surf and spray like the waves of the ocean, but it made a dull roar, something like that of the Pacific on the beach near San Francisco, just after the subsidence of a storm. The surface of the lava changes its height from time to time. The guide said it occasionally rose until it overflowed the sides of the basin enclosing the lakes and formed streams that spread out over the level area of the great crater. Sometimes it sank so that it was fully 400 feet from the edge of the rim down to the lava, but whether it was high or low, there was never a time when it was wholly inactive. The guide called our attention to cones which had formed on the rim of the lake. They were caused by the cooling of the lava around vent holes, and as successive jets of lava were thrown up and cooled, they had formed cones 15 or 20 feet high, and some of them as much as 30 feet. When the height became so great that the lava sought an outlet elsewhere, it generally left a hole in the top of the cone. We looked down some of these holes and saw the seething mass of lava, threatening each moment to rise and destroy the very frail foundation where we were standing. The guide said there was little real danger, as the lava had receded since the cones were formed. I observed that the crust where we stood was not more than a foot or so in thickness, and as the lava is very brittle, the spot was certainly not a safe one. Besides, the fumes that rose from the vent holes were absolutely stifling, and though the sight was a fascinating one, it was impossible to remain there long, owing to the difficulty of breathing. We have visited volcanoes in other parts of the world, but none that equalled this, and never have we seen anything to compare with the burning lakes of Kilauea. What a magnificent sight it must be to see an eruption of Kilauea or Mauna Loa, especially the latter, as it is much the larger of the two. Just now it is quiet, but when it does break out, it is, I believe, the greatest volcano in the world. Let me give you a few figures. Mauna Loa has had eight great eruptions in 40 years, an average of one eruption every five years. It is 13,700 feet high, and in several of its eruptions it has sent streams of lava 50 miles in length to the sea. The flow of these streams is slow, usually requiring eight or ten days, and sometimes longer to cover the distance from the mountain to the sea. In one eruption, it was estimated that 38,000 million cubic feet of lava were poured out, and in another, 17,000 million. Kilauea is probably a spur of Mauna Loa, and less than 4,000 feet high, but nevertheless it is the largest constantly active volcano in the world. When the lava from Mauna Loa reaches the sea, there is an immense cloud of steam rising from the point where the molten mass enters the water. The ocean is heated for miles around, and fishes by millions perish from the heat. The ground all over the island is devastated, earthquakes are frequent, and altogether Hawaii must be an unpleasant place of residence at that time. We got back to the hotel about five o'clock in the afternoon, thoroughly tied out with the day's excursion, which had given us so many curious and terrible sights. It has been an experience which we shall long remember. Our friends wanted to visit the great crater of Haleakala on the island of Maui in order to be able to compare an extinct volcano with a live one, but time did not permit. They talked with a gentleman who had been there, and that, said Fred, was the next best thing to seeing with their own eyes. Here is the substance of what they learned concerning Haleakala. You have a ride of about 12 miles to reach the summit, and you ought to go up so as to sleep at the top and get the view at sunrise. There is no house there, but of this there is no need, as there are several caves in the lava. They are really broken lava bubbles, which are each large enough to shelter half a dozen persons comfortably. Of course you must have a guide, and must carry plenty of blankets, or you will suffer from the cold. Water and wood can be found near the top of the mountain. The crater of Haleakala is 30 miles in circumference, or 10 miles across, and it is 2,000 feet from the edge of the rim that surrounds it 
to the floor of the crater. Over this floor are spread ten or twelve smaller craters and cones, some of them large enough to be good-sized mountains by themselves, as they are nearly, if not quite, a thousand feet high. You can descend into the great crater if you wish, and there is a path by which you can traverse it, but it is very necessary that you should not turn from the path, as the lava is so sharp that it would endanger your horse's feet to go even a few yards over it. Stick to the route and implicitly obey your guide. Fed obtained a map of Haleakala, which we give on the following page. It shows the shape of the crater and the openings at either end, where the lava is supposed to have made an outlet for itself. These openings are called Kulo Gap and Kaupo Gap, the former being something more than two miles across and the latter a trifle less. Before leaving Hilo, Dr. Bronson arranged for a schooner to meet the party at a point on the Puna coast, which was easily reached in a day's ride from the crater of Kilauea. Before sunset they had paid the guide for the hire of the horses and his own wages, and the evening saw them dashing through the waters on the way to Honolulu. The trade wind bore them swiftly along. Hawaii is to windward of Oahu, and while it takes a schooner or other sailing vessel four or five days to beat from Honolulu to Hilo, the return journey can be made in from 24 to 30 hours. The second morning from Puna saw the schooner anchored in the harbour of the capital, and our friends had the satisfaction of breakfasting at the spacious and comfortable Hawaiian hotel. Through the courtesy of a gentleman engaged in the sugar culture, our friends made a visit to a sugar plantation, the culture of the saccharin product being the principal industry of the Hawaiian islands. We have not space for an account of all they saw and heard, but we'll give a summary from Fred's notebook. Sugar is grown on all the four large islands of the group, but the principal seat of the industry is on Maui, which seems particularly favourable to it. We were told that the yield was sometimes between five and six tonnes to the acre. Four tonnes was not an unusual amount, and it would be considered a poor plantation that did not give two or two and a half tonnes. The volcanic soil seems to be just what the sugar cane loves. The seasons are such that planting can be done in many places at any time of the year, and there is not the least danger of frost, as in the sugar area of the United States. The common custom is to raise two crops, and then let the ground lie idle for two seasons, so that taking a series of years together, allowances must be made for the idle time in estimating the yield of sugar. In some localities, especially those where the ground is artificially irrigated, this plan is not always followed, as it does not appear to be necessary. To show the growth of the industry, let me say that the export of sugar in 1860 was 1,414,271 pounds, while in 1871, 11 years later, it was 21,760,773 pounds. Last year it was in the neighbourhood of 50 million pounds. In the early years of the sugar culture, the work was performed by the natives, but in course of time it grew to such an extent that the local supply of labour was not sufficient. A great number of Chinese and Portuguese were introduced, and labourers have been brought from other islands of the Pacific Ocean, so that the population of the country is now a mixed one. By the census of 1878, the population was 57,986. 44,088 of these were natives, 5,916 Chinese, 4,561 whites, and 3,420 half-castes. In 1882, the population was estimated at 66,895, including 12,804 Chinese. In the two years ending March 31st, 1884, there was an immigration of 6,166 Portuguese from the Azores Islands. Among the whites, the Americans are most numerous, but the Germans are steadily increasing in numbers, a large part of the sugar interest and the commerce dependent upon it being in their hands. The commercial king of the islands is Klaus Spreckels, who is of German origin and practically controls the sugar culture. He owns a steamship line between Honolulu and San Francisco and the local steamers plying to the various islands 
are mostly in his hands. Rice and coffee are also products of the islands, but they occupy a low position when compared to that of sugar. Hides, tallow, wool and salt are also exported, but the quantity is not great. The value of the exports of the islands is from 8 to 10 million dollars annually, and the imports amount to about 2 million less than the exports. The principal imports are textile fabrics, clothing, implements, machinery and provisions. So much for the commercial condition of the Kingdom of Hawaii. Let us now turn to other matters. Our friends took a day, or rather two nights and a day, for a visit to the famous leper hospital on Molokai Island. Leaving Honolulu late one evening, they were landed the next morning on Molokai for their strange excursion. We will let Frank tell the story of the visit. The leper settlement is on a plain, which is surrounded by mountains on three sides, and the sea on the fourth. The mountains are so rugged as to be impassable, except at a few points, which are always carefully guarded. The sea front is also watched, so that escape from the settlement is practically impossible. Any person in the Hawaiian kingdom suspected of leprosy is arrested by the authorities, and if a medical examination shows that he is afflicted with the disease, he is sent to Molokai. The sentence is perpetual, leprosy being considered incurable, except in its earliest stages. A man sent to Molokai is considered dead. His wife may obtain a decree of divorce and marry again if she likes, and his estate is handed over to the courts and administered upon as though he had ceased to exist. Great care is exercised to prevent the banishment of anyone about whose case there is any doubt. There is a hospital near Honolulu where all doubtful cases are sent, and the physician in charge keeps them there until the certainty of the presence or absence of the disease is settled beyond question. The doctor who accompanied us through the settlement assured us that leprosy is neither epidemic nor contagious in the ordinary sense of the latter word. It can only be communicated by an abraded surface coming in contact with a leprous sore, and he said that the practice among the natives of many persons smoking the same pipe had done much to spread the disease. He shook hands freely with the victims of leprosy during our visit and did not take the trouble to wear gloves even when the hands of the others were covered with sores. He told us that the disease first showed itself by a slight swelling under the eyes and in the lobes of the ears. Then the fingers contracted like bird's claws, the face swelled into ridges that were smooth and shiny, and later these ridges broke into festering sores. Sometimes these symptoms on the face do not appear, the attack being principally on the hands and feet. The fingers and toes wither and decay, they seem to dry up and shrink, as we saw several persons whose fingernails were on their knuckles, the fingers having shrunk away and disappeared. It is a curious circumstance that the victims of leprosy rarely suffer pain. The decay of the extremities is gradual, and the shiny ridges on the face may be pinched with the fingers or punctured with a pin without giving any sensation. Among the 900 and odd persons in the leper settlement, we saw very few sad faces. The people were enjoying themselves very much as they would in Honolulu, talking and laughing, walking or lounging about, or riding horses, and in one place they were playing a game that evoked a good deal of shouting and hilarity. Many were at work in the fields and gardens, or making salt along the shore. There is a leper governor for the settlement, and the usual number of subordinates that such a place requires. There is a store where goods are sold at cost, and many of the lepers receive money from their friends and spend it at the store. The government provides the lepers with clothes and lodging and gives them sufficient food for their subsistence. Those who can work are encouraged to do so, and all that they produce is bought by the Board of Health and paid for out of the store. Then they have two churches, one Catholic and the other Protestant. The latter has a native pastor and the former a white priest, who has volunteered to seclude himself among these unfortunate people for their religious good. There are three white men and eight Chinese who have been sent here as lepers. It has been charged that the Chinese brought leprosy to the islands, but the doctors say this is not so, the disease having existed here before the Chinese came. And besides, it is quite unlike the malady of that name in China. There, it principally attacks the skin, 
while the Hawaiian form belongs to the blood. The location of the settlement is an excellent one, as it is on the windward side of the island and constantly swept by the pure breezes from the ocean. For those who are unable to move about, there are large and well-kept hospitals where the patients are waited upon by other lepers that have not reached the disabled stage. Access and escape are alike difficult, and everything seems to have been done to make life as comfortable as possible to the unfortunate victims who are sent here. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Boy Travellers in Australasia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A Fine Voice The Boy Travellers in Australasia by Thomas W. Knox Those who have followed the Boy Travellers in other parts of the world will remember that their plans were often changed by circumstances which could not be foreseen. At Honolulu, one of these changes took place, and this is how it happened. When the Alameda entered the harbour on her arrival from San Francisco, our friends observed at anchor a trim-looking yacht displaying the English flag. They were too busy with the novelties of the place to give her any attention, and her presence was soon forgotten. On the morning of their return from Molokai, Dr. Bronson encountered, in the breakfast room of the hotel, an old friend, Dr. McAllister, of Cambridge, England. Their greetings were cordial, and all the more so as neither had the least idea that the other was in the Hawaiian Islands, or anywhere else in the Pacific Ocean. In almost the same breath each exclaimed, What are you doing here? Dr. Bronson explained briefly how he came to Honolulu and where he was going, to which Dr. McAllister responded, I came here on the yacht Pera. She belongs to Colonel Bush, formerly of Her Britannic Majesty's Army, but for several years in the service of the Turkish government. I am the Colonel's guest, and we came here by way of India, China and Japan. We leave tomorrow for the South Pacific, where we are to cruise about for several months, visiting the most interesting of the island groups. We go first to the Marquesas Islands, and then... Just at this moment, Colonel Bush entered the breakfast room and was introduced to Dr. Bronson. A moment later, Frank and Fred arrived, presentations followed, and before the morning meal was over, the American contingent was fairly well acquainted with the English one. Conversation developed the fact that two gentlemen who had arrived on the Pera had left by the mail steamer for San Francisco, having received letters at Honolulu, which compelled their immediate return to England. Consequently, the pair's party was reduced to Colonel Bush and Dr. McAllister. The party arranged to meet at dinner. Colonel Bush and Dr. McAllister went to the pair, while Dr. Bronson and the youths proceeded to make farewell calls, as the steamer on which they were to continue their journey was due on the morrow, and they wished to be ready for her. Exactly how it came about we are unable to say, but it is evident that Colonel Bush desired further acquaintance with Dr. Bronson and his nephews, and that Dr. McAllister had heartily approved the Colonel's desire. At all events, when the three gentlemen were together after dinner, Frank and Fred, having left the table, the Colonel invited Dr. Bronson, with his nephews, to accompany him in his voyage to the South Seas. "'There is plenty of room on the yacht,' said he, "'and provisions are abundant.' The Pera is almost identical with the Sunbeam, the famous yacht of Sir Thomas Brassey, of which you have read. She relies upon her sails when there is any wind, and her auxiliary steam power to propel her when needed. The northeast trade winds will carry us down to the equatorial belt of calms, and then we'll steam through it to the southeast trades, which will carry us straight to the Marquesas. From the Marquesas we'll go to the Society Islands, then to Samoa, and then to Fiji. There you can, if you like, take the mail steamer to New Zealand and Australia, or continue with the Pera, wherever she goes. Beyond Fiji, I have not formed my plans very definitely, as they will depend somewhat upon the letters I received there, and upon the state of things in the New Hebrides, the Solomon Islands, and other of the groups of the west of Fiji. The heartiness of the invitation, the opportunity, 
the voyage would give for seeing groups of islands not on the regular track of travel, and the fact that he was not pressed for time settled the question with Dr. Bronson, and he accepted at once. He excused himself shortly afterwards to inform the youths of the change in their plans. Of course, they were delighted at the opportunity of making an acquaintance with the islands that were included in the pair's proposed voyage, and earnestly congratulated themselves on their good fortune. The baggage of the party was sent on board in the forenoon of the next day. The travellers followed it, and a little before two o'clock in the afternoon, the pair steamed out of Honolulu and headed southward. When she had made a good offing, her engines were stopped, the fires were put out, and the yacht proceeded at a splendid pace with the strong trade wind on her port beam. Her course was directed to the southeast, so as to enable her to cross the equator about longitude 140 degrees west and take advantage of the southeast trades in making the Marquesas. Frank undertook a journal of the voyage, but like most works of the kind, it abounded in repetitions, and our space will not permit extensive quotations. One day was so much like another that the young gentleman admitted that his narrative would make very tiresome reading, and he doubted if anyone would care to peruse it. Suffice it to say, the time passed agreeably, as there was a good library on board, and each member of the party tried to do his share towards entertaining the rest. Stories of sea and land, of moving accidents by flood and field, and discussions upon scientific, social, and all other imaginable topics served to beguile the hours and shorten the distance between the Hawaiian and the Marquesas groups. The northeast trades carried the para almost to the equator. Then came a period of calm in a torrid temperature that drove everybody to the shelter of the double awning over the deck and made them sigh for cooler latitudes. Heavy clothing was at a discount and the lightest garments were found more than sufficient. Social rules were suspended and pyjamas were worn altogether except at dinner time when light suits of linen took their place. Dinner was served on deck beneath the awning and the ice machine was kept in constant action to supply ice for the use of the sweltering travellers. Happily this state of affairs did not last long. As soon as the pair entered the calm belt, the funnel was hoisted, fires were started, the equator was crossed triumphantly, and the yacht in due time caught the southeast trades and was once more turned into a sailing craft. As they left the equator behind them, the North Star disappeared below the horizon, and the Southern Cross, that magnificent constellation of the Antarctic heavens, came into view. Frank regretted that they could not look at it with a powerful telescope when he learned from the captain of the Pera that there is a brilliant cluster of stars in the centre of the cross, invisible to the unassisted eye and only revealed by a strong glass. Farther south their attention was absorbed by the Magellan clouds, two nebulae of stars so densely packed together and so far away that they resemble light fleecy clouds more than anything else. In a direct line, it is about 2,000 miles from Honolulu to the outermost of the Marquesas group. The log of the Pera showed a run of 2,180 miles, and on the morning of the 16th day of the voyage, the lookout gave the welcome announcement that land was in sight. Colonel Bush had given directions for the yacht to proceed direct to Nukahiva Bay, the best harbour in the Marquesas group, and consequently, the travellers contented themselves with distant views of the outer islands that lay in their course. The islands are evidently of volcanic origin, as they present high peaks rising two or three thousand feet, and in some places their sides are almost precipitous. With a glass, or even with the unaided eye, it was easy to perceive that the sides of the mountains and the valleys enclosed between them were thickly clothed with tropical trees and undergrowth, that extended down close to the water's edge. Frank made the following historical note concerning the islands. They were discovered in 1595 by a Spanish navigator, Mendania de Neira, who named them Las Marquesas de Mendoza in honour of the Marquis de Mendoza, Viceroy of Peru. They are sometimes known as the Mendania Archipelago in honour of their discoverer, 
and they are also called the Washington Islands, having been so named by Captain Ingraham of the American ship Hope, who visited them in 1791. They are generally divided into two groups, the northern and southern, and the island of Nukaiva, where we are going, is in the northern group. Altogether, there are 13 of the islands, with an area of less than 500 square miles and a population of about 10,000. Properly, the name Marquesas belongs to the southern group only, as they alone were visited by Mandania. The northern group was not known until the American captain discovered it, and therefore we shall insist that they are the Washington Islands. For the description of what they saw at Nukahiva, we will rely upon Fred's account. As we neared the island, said the youth in his journal, we got up steam and went proudly into the harbour, which has a very good anchorage. The French flag was flying from a tall staff at the end of the bay, and you must know that the islands are under a French protectorate, and have been so since 1841. Hardly was our anchor down before the yacht was surrounded by a dozen boats or canoes. One of them contained a Frenchman in a greatly faded uniform, who said he was the captain of the port. I very much doubt if he ever held the rank of captain anywhere else. However, he represented the authority of the French government and treated us politely. Evidently the port was not often visited by pleasure craft like our own, as he seemed somewhat surprised when told that we had nothing to sell and did not wish to buy anything except fresh provisions. We bought some yams, breadfruit, bananas and other fruits and vegetables, together with two or three pigs that the natives brought alongside in their boats. The captain of the port promised to send us a man who would supply us with fresh beef and then went on shore, whither we followed as soon as we had lunched. Both in the boats and on the land we had a good opportunity to study the natives, who were said to be the finest type of Polynesians. They belong to the Malay race and are distinguished for their graceful and symmetrical figures. The men are tall and well-proportioned, with skins of a dark copper colour, while the women are considerably lighter in complexion, partly in consequences of their being less exposed to the sun and partly because of certain pigments which they apply to their faces and arms. Tattooing is in fashion here. It prevails among both sexes, though more among the men than the women. It takes a long time to perform it thoroughly. A resident Frenchman, with whom we talked on the subject, said that the operation began at the age of 19 or 20 and was rarely finished until the subject was approaching his 40th year. It is performed with an instrument shaped like a comb or rather like a small chisel with its end fashioned into teeth. The figure is drawn upon the skin and then the artist dips the comb into an ink made of burnt coconut shell and water until the blunt ends of the teeth have taken up some of the colouring matter. Then the comb is placed on the proper spot and with a mallet is driven through the skin, eliciting a howl from the subject unless he is of stoical mood. Only a few square inches can be operated on at a time. The flesh swells and becomes very sore and the performance cannot be repeated until the swelling subsides and the patient has gathered strength and recovered from the fever into which he is generally thrown. We are told that the custom is far less prevalent than when the islands were first discovered and it will probably die out in another generation or two. The marks made by tattooing are permanent and no application has ever been found that will remove them. We have seen several men whose entire bodies were tattooed others whose arms and faces had alone been wrought upon, and others, again, who had kept their faces free from marks, but had their bodies covered. One old fellow consented to stand for his photograph in consideration of being rewarded with a hatchet and some fish hooks, which we willingly gave him. We added a pocket knife, which he received with a grunt of satisfaction, but without deigning to say thank you, or anything like its equivalent. He said his name was Gatanua, and that he was a grandson of a former chief of that name. The faces of the women are not tattooed, except that now and then they have a black line on the upper lip, which is quite suggestive of a budding moustache. One pretty woman was pointed out to us, who was said to be the daughter of a chief. Her hands and arms were tattooed, the tattooing on the arms extending nearly to the elbow. 
At a little distance, she seemed to have on a pair of embroidered gloves, and this fact suggested an idea. Why could not the ladies of civilised lands have their hands tattooed in imitation of gloves, and thus save themselves the trouble and expense of donning a new pair so often? An ingenious artist could do it nicely, and he might even tattoo the buttons in their places, so that the gloves could have no possible chance of slipping off or getting out of shape. There was a chief of one of the interior tribes who presented an excellent specimen of the work of the Polynesian artist on a living canvas. Circles, squares and all sorts of curious figures had been delineated on his skin and then punctured in with the tattoo instrument, and the artist certainly possessed a correct eye as all the drawing was mathematically exact. The chief allowed Frank to make a sketch of him as the photograph did not bring out all the lines with distinctness. Of course he was rewarded for his condescension, and as he received twice as much as he had expected, we had any number of candidates offering themselves when it was known how liberally we paid for services. Dr. Bronson says the custom prevails in many of the islands of Polynesia, though not in all, but is fast dying out through the influence of Christianity and civilization. Tattooing has been practised in almost all parts of the world and in all ages, According to the Bible, it must have existed in the time of Moses, for we find it to be one of the practices prohibited to the Jews. Read what is said in Leviticus, x1x.28. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. It prevailed among the ancient Thracians, and the ancient Britons practised it. It still exists among sailors, and has probably descended through them from the time when it was common in Great Britain, though they may have adopted it from the barbarous countries to which their occupation carries them. Frank says these people are like a French salad, as they are dressed with oil. They use coconut oil for polishing their skins and anointing their hair, and it is applied with great liberality. One of the presents we gave to the chief who stood for his picture was a flat bottle, like a pocket flask, he said through the interpreter that it was just the thing for carrying oil, and he will no doubt use it for that purpose until it goes the way of all bottles and is broken. The effect on the skin is less disagreeable than you might suppose, as it makes it shine like a piece of mahogany and brings out the tattoo marks just as varnishing a picture brings out its strong points more clearly than before. Turmeric and other colouring substances are used with the oil. Turmeric gives a reddish tinge to the natural brown, and when it is applied to the skin of a pretty woman, the effect is like that of the tint of an American belle who has spent a summer at the seaside or on a yachting cruise, and has not been careful of her complexion. Here is a hint for the ladies who pretend to go to the seaside or the mountains in summer, but are really obliged to remain at home. Make a cosmetic of coconut butter and turmeric, and apply it in place of cold cream, night and morning. In this way you can get up a seaside tan at a trifling expense. Before civilization came here, the natives wore very little clothing, and even at the present time they do not spend much money on their wardrobes. The native cloth, tapa, is made by pounding the inner bark of a species of mulberry tree with a mallet after soaking it in water. Tapper enough for an entire dress can be made in a day, and when it is done it will last five or six weeks. For a headdress it is made of a more open texture than for garments to cover the body. The women wrap three or four yards of it around the waist to form a skirt or petticoat, and then cover their shoulders with a mantle of the same material. European cotton goods have partially replaced tapper, and the old industry is dying out. It is a pity too as tapper is prettier than cotton cloth, and the natives look better in it than in more civilised material. In another way, civilization has destroyed the picturesqueness of the Marquesas Islands. The natives formerly wore necklaces made of hogs and whales' teeth, and the men bored their ears, in which they inserted ornaments of bone or teeth. These snow-white necklaces, on the skins of the Marquesas women, had a very pretty effect much prettier than that of the cheap jewellery they wear nowadays, and which comes from French or English manufactories. The chief's daughter, whom I mentioned, had one of these necklaces, but she wore it more as the mark of her rank than because she admired it. 
Above the necklace she had a double string of common beads. She had a funny sort of ear ornament that we tried in vain to buy, as it was one of the insignia to indicate her rank in life. When the French took possession of the islands, they started to make an extensive colony. They sent a fleet of four ships of war with five hundred troops and hoisted the French flag with a great deal of ceremony. Fortifications were built and there were some conflicts with the natives. But of course the islanders, with their rude and primitive weapons, were speedily conquered. The French built docks and jetties in addition to their fortifications, but they have been of little practical use. We found that most of the jetties had rotted away, and in place of the former garrison of 500 men, there are now about 60 soldiers and a few policemen. The governor treated us very kindly, and at our first call upon him, he invited us to dine with him, where we met his amiable wife and the officers of his staff. Colonel Bush invited them to dine on the yacht. As the cabin is limited, we had the governor and his wife on one day, and the officers on another, and I am sure they all enjoyed our visit. Strangers come here so rarely that our advent made an agreeable break in the monotony of their lives. There are some fifty foreigners living here, and they include several nationalities, English, American, Irish, Scotch, French, German, Portuguese, Spanish and Peruvian. Some of them are engaged in business, but there is not a great deal of it, as the colony has not been successful. Cotton is the principal article of cultivation, and there is a small trade in beche de mer, the famous sea cucumber of which the Chinese are fond. It brings a high price in the markets of Canton and Shanghai, sometimes selling as high as $500 a ton. One of the Englishmen, who has a store in the little settlement, said that several of the cotton plantations had been abandoned, owing to the difficulty of getting labourers for them. The natives are disinclined to work, and labourers from other islands cannot be had in sufficient numbers. Several hundred Chinese have been imported, and also some labourers from the Gilbert and Loyalty Islands. The Chinese make very good colonists, and many of them have plantations of their own, which they manage very successfully. The same gentleman showed us a fungus that comes from the valleys between the mountains. It looks very much like a scrap of dried leather, and would not be considered worth much to one who did not know about it. It brings a good price in China, where it is used for making soup. We tried some of it at dinner one day, and found it not at all disagreeable to the taste. In fact, it was so good that our steward bought nearly a barrel of it for future use. There is a road around the head of the bay which was built by the French soon after their arrival, but has been neglected and is not in good repair. Our host took us on a ride along this road, from which the view is delightful. In front is the deep blue water of the bay, while behind us the mountains rose very precipitously and seemed to shut us out altogether from the rest of the island. The bay is nearly in the shape of a horseshoe, ending in two high headlands, and to follow its shores requires a walk or ride of about nine miles. The entrance is less than half a mile wide and is guarded by two small islands, each about 500 feet high. Cooper says, Mountains interposed make enemies of nations who had else, like kindred drops been mingled into one. There is nowhere in the world a better illustration of the truth of this assertion than in the Marquesas. In each island the mountains rise in ridges, like the sections of a starfish. Some of these ridges are quite impassable, and all of them very difficult to traverse. The result has been that there was formerly very little intercourse between the tribes occupying the different valleys, and until the French came here, there was hardly a time when two or more tribes were not at war. Even at present they are not entirely at peace, and though the most of them have abandoned cannibalism, it is occasionally practised. Our host told us that in many of the valleys there are old men who have never been outside the limits of the mountain walls, that enclose their homes, and others whose journeys have been wholly confined to short excursions on the water, a few miles from shore. The ordinary mode of communication is by water, and in many cases it is the only one possible. The gentleman invited us to go into one of the valleys where he has a plantation. 
We made the excursion in a large sailboat manned by six or eight natives, but built after an English model and commanded by an English sailor. Starting early one morning, we made the run in about four hours, spent an afternoon and night in the valley and returned the next day. All these valleys in the Marquesas have a wealth of tropical trees and smaller plants, which is not surpassed anywhere else in the world. The cocoa and several of the varieties of the palm tree abound here, and they have the breadfruit, the banana and taro plants, the sugar cane, and as before mentioned, the cotton plant. Close by the landing place we came to a village of a dozen or twenty huts, built of the yellow bamboo and thatched with palmetto leaves, which the sun had bleached to a whiteness that reminded us of a newly shingled roof in temperate zones. Our guide called our attention to the platform of stones on which each house stood and said it was a protection against dampness. The rain falls frequently and very heavily, and it is the abundant moisture that makes the vegetation so luxuriant. On the mountain ridges, in whatever direction you look, there are streams tumbling down, and the steep cliffs are whitened by numerous cascades. The moisture nourishes a great variety of creeping plants, and in many places they completely cover the precipitous cliffs and give them the appearance of green waterfalls. The natives in one respect resemble the Irish peasantry, their chief wealth being in pigs. These animals were introduced by the Spaniards, who were for a long time venerated as gods in consequence of this inestimable gift to these simple-minded people. Before the visit of the Spaniards, the islands had absolutely no four-footed animals. Hence it is easy to see how Mandania and his companions were regarded as more than human. Now they have some horses and horned cattle, but not many. They have dogs and cats, and unfortunately they have rats, which were brought here in foreign ships, and have multiplied so fast that they have become a great pest. There are only a few varieties of birds on the islands, most of them have beautiful plumage, but none can be properly called songbirds. Near the village is a well-built church of stone. It is in charge of a Catholic priest, and we were told that there is an average of one church to every 200 inhabitants all over the islands. The first missionaries to the Marquesas came in the London mission ship, Duff, near the end of the last century. But after a short residence they became disheartened and abandoned the effort to convert and civilise the people. Several attempts were made in the first quarter of the present century, but with a similar result. In 1833 some American missionaries tried the experiment, and in 1834 the London Mission Society sent a fresh party of missionaries, but all to little purpose. In 1853, an English missionary named Bicknell and four Hawaiian teachers, accompanied by their wives, went to the Marquesas at the request of a Marquesan chief, who had gone to the Sandwich Islands in a whale ship to present the invitation. The French priests opposed the coming of these missionaries, but the chiefs refused to give them up, and so the teachers remained, but they made little progress in converting the natives to Christianity. The Catholic mission supports quite a number of priests and a bishop at the Marquesas. The mission has had very poor success in securing adherence to its faith, but it has done much good in the way of showing the natives the result of industry. Around each mission station there is a well-cultivated garden, and some of the finest cotton fields on the islands may be found there. I have never seen anywhere a prettier cotton field than at the mission we visited. There is a convent at Nukahiva, where the French sisters are educating about sixty Marquesan girls, whose ages vary from four to sixteen years. There is a similar school for boys, which is under the charge of the mission, and the bishop hopes that these boys and girls would be of service in educating and converting their people to the religion and civilization of the foreigner. But from all we can learn, it will be a long time before his hopes are realized. The Queen is a devout Catholic, while the King is a nominal one, and each missionary has a small flock of followers, but the great majority are as much heathen as ever, and cling firmly to their old superstitions. One of the curious customs of the South Sea Islands 
is the taboo, and it prevails much more strongly at the Marquesas at the present time than anywhere else. The word is Polynesian, and singularly resembles in sound and meaning the to-eba of the ancient Hebrews. It has a good and a bad meaning, or rather it may apply to a sacred thing or to a wicked one. A cemetery being consecrated ground would be taboo or sacred, and to fight there would be taboo or wicked. Our English word tabooed, forbidden, comes from the Polynesian one. It would take too long to describe all the operations of taboo as it formerly prevailed through Polynesia and still exists in some of the islands, and especially in the Marquesas. There were two kinds of taboo, one of them permanent, the other temporary. The permanent taboo was a sort of traditional or social rule and applied to everybody. All grounds and buildings dedicated to any idol or god were taboo, and therefore became places of refuge to men fleeing from an enemy. Exactly like the cities of refuge mentioned in the Bible. It was taboo to touch the person of a chief or any article belonging to him, or eat anything he had touched. In the Tonga Islands it was taboo to speak the name of father or mother, or of father-in-law or mother-in-law, to touch them, or to eat in their presence, except with the back turned, when they were constructively supposed to be absent. In the Fiji Islands it was taboo for brother and sister and first cousins to speak together or eat from the same dish. Husband and wife could not eat from the same dish, and a father could not speak to his son if the latter was more than fifteen years old. The taboo was a very convenient police system, as any exposed property could be made safe by being tabooed. The chiefs and priests could taboo anything they chose. When a feast was about to come off, the chief would previously taboo certain articles of food, and thus ensure an abundance on the day of the festival. Violation of certain kinds of taboo was punished with death, other and smaller violations had various penalties affixed, and they generally included sacrifices, or presents to the gods, or the payment of fines to the chiefs. Well, here in the Marquesas, among other prohibitions, it was taboo for a woman to enter a canoe or boat. Men had a monopoly of all paddling and sailing, and the only sea voyage a woman could make was by swimming. I have read about women in the South Seas swimming out to ships anchored a long distance from shore, and never understood till now how it was. It is no wonder that sailors used to mistake these Marquesan nymphs for mermaids as they dashed through the waves, with their long black hair trailing behind them in the water. Fred's account of what they saw in the Marquesas pauses abruptly at this point. Perhaps he was interrupted by just such a scene as he describes in the last sentence, but he could hardly fall into the old era of the sailors. The women of the Marquesas are fine swimmers, but no better, perhaps, than those of the Fiji, Samoan, and other tropical or semi-tropical groups. The pair remained several days at the Marquesas and then proceeded to Tahiti, in the society group. Before they left Nukahiva, one of the officers of the governor's staff pointed out the hill where Commodore Porter hoisted the American flag when he anchored with his prizes in the bay during the War of 1812. That was a long time ago, said the officer. But the incident is vividly preserved in the traditions of the people, and it was that incident that greatly aided the French in getting their foothold here. How was that? Frank inquired. At the time of Commodore Porter's visit, replied the officer, the Nukahevans were at war with a neighbouring tribe. The hostile tribe made an incursion one night and destroyed about 200 breadfruit trees close to Porter's camp. The next day they sent a messenger to tell him he was a coward and they would come soon and attack his camp. Porter thereupon concluded to teach them a lesson and so he sent a small detachment under Lieutenant Downs to aid the Nukahevans to punish their enemies. This was accomplished and the hostile tribe was completely subdued. As soon as he had completed the repairs to his ships, Porter sailed away, but he was long revered in Nukahiva. When the French came here, thirty years afterwards, the natives thought the performance of Porter would be repeated, 
and the Frenchmen would aid the Nukahivans to defeat their enemies. They were received with open arms, and the natives were not undeceived until the French had completed their forts and were fully able to defend themselves. Continuing his reference to the natives, Frank's informant said that great numbers of them were at one time kidnapped and carried away by labour vessels, of which more will be said in a later chapter. In 1863, smallpox was introduced by foreign ships and killed nearly one half of the population. Altogether, the people of the Marquesas have no special occasion to be grateful to the white man. During the Paris voyage to Tahiti, our young friends devoted their time to a study of that part of the Pacific Ocean and the islands it contained. Fred called their attention to Pitcairn Island, which has been long famous as the home of the mutineers of the bounty. Both the youths regretted that they were not to pass in its vicinity, but consoled themselves by reading an account of a visit to it and a description of the inhabitants. One day, while they were busy with their studies of the Pacific, Dr. Bronson called their attention to Easter Island, which he pronounced one of the most remarkable islands in the great ocean. Frank eagerly asked why it was so, and the doctor kindly explained as follows. It is remarkable, said he, on account of the mysterious origin and history of its former inhabitants, and the sculptured rocks and stone images which they have left scattered in great numbers over the island. It has been known since 1722, when the navigator, Rogovine, discovered it on Easter Sunday of that year, and named it Easter Island, in commemoration of the discovery. Some authorities say it was discovered in 1686 by Davis, an English buccaneer, and it was known as Davis Land until Rogovine's visit. Captain Cook visited it about 1772, and it is said he found 20,000 inhabitants there. The island is about 30 miles in circumference and is situated in latitude 27 degrees 10 feet south and 109 degrees 26 feet west longitude. It has a remarkable isolation, being 2,000 miles from the coast of Chile and 1,500 from any other inhabited island except Pitcairn, and that, as you know, is a small island, about two miles long and not more than a mile broad in its widest part. Easter Island is called Rapa Nui by the natives of Tahiti and is of unmistakably volcanic origin. There is a large extinct crater on each end of the island and numerous small ones between, the ground being thickly covered with black volcanic rock and obsidian in the western portion. The largest of these volcanoes is named Rao Kao. It is over 1,300 feet high, enclosing a freshwater lake nearly three miles in circumference, the surface of which is partially covered with vegetable matter, over which a man may walk in places. The second one in size is extremely interesting on account of its being the place where the stone images were made from lava rock, a great number of which still remain, some unfinished and attached to the precipitous cliffs. An enormous number of these images is scattered all over the island, while there are 93 inside and 155 immediately outside of the crater. They are in solid pieces, varying from 5 to 70 feet in height. Some of the figures, lying prostrate, are 27 feet long and measure 8 feet across the breast. Very much like the great statues at Thebes and Karnak in Egypt, said Fred. Yes, replied the doctor, and one of these statues measures 20 feet from the shoulder to the crown of the head. The sculpture is extremely rude, and as works of art, the Eastern Islands statues bear no comparison to the Egyptian ones. The human body is represented terminating at the hips. The head is flat, the top of the forehead cut level, so as to support a crown which was cut from red tufa found in one of the smaller craters. They were transported to villages near the sea and placed upon stone platforms constructed in various heights and different lengths facing the water. One of these platforms supported 13 immense images and all of those examined contained human bones, showing it to be a place of burial. Of these platforms, 113 have been counted. 
On a precipice overlooking the sea is a village of ancient stone huts, where it is said the natives lived only during a portion of the year. Nearby are also sculptured rocks, covered with curious and extremely interesting carvings. The platforms are from two to three hundred feet long and about thirty feet high, built of hewn stones five or six feet long and accurately joined without cement. The platforms are at intervals all around the coast and some of the headlands were levelled off to form similar resting places for the images. All of the principal images have the top of the head cut flat and crowned with a circular mass of red lava, hewn perfectly round. Some of these crowns are 66 inches in diameter and 52 inches thick and were brought 8 miles from the spot where they were quarried. About 30 crowns are lying in the quarries and some of them are fully 10 feet in diameter and of proportionate height. Frank asked if the present inhabitants had any tradition concerning these statues. None whatever was the reply. At present, there are less than 200 people living there. They seem to be the degenerate remains of a race, something like the Maoris of New Zealand, and they speak a language similar to those people. Although undoubtedly a cannibal race, in fact one old man speaks with enthusiasm when asked regarding the custom, they are at present quiet and enlightened, but retain many superstitious ideas which they have received by transmission. They venerate a small seabird, the egg of which is sacred to them, and their season of feast begins in August, when the first eggs of these birds are taken from two barren rocks near the cliffs. Men and youths swim to these rocks, and the one who first secures an egg is held in high esteem. He lords it over the others for twelve months, his food being furnished for him, and he is not permitted to bathe for three months. A recent visitor says the people are so dirty that you could suppose every man, woman and child had performed the successful feat the last feast time. The last king was Kai Makor, who died about 1864, when Peruvian ships visited Rapa Nui and a number of the natives were seized and taken to work the guano on the Chincha Islands, where the greater number died. A few were finally sent back, and they brought with them smallpox, which caused great havoc and nearly depopulated the island. Water is scarce, but the climate is equable, and one of the most delightful in the world, the thermometer seldom registering higher than 75 degrees to 80 degrees during the warmest season. An image and some other curiosities were brought away in 1886 by the United States steamer Mohican, which visited the island in that year. They are now in the Naval Museum at Washington, and it is hoped that someone will be able to decipher the hieroglyphics, which thus far have remained without an interpreter. End of chapter 3「Four of the Boy Travellers in Australasia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by a fine voice. The Boy Travellers in Australasia by Thomas W. Knox. When well clear of the Marquesas, the Pera turned her prow to the southwest in the direction of Tahiti, which lay about 900 miles away. The strong trade wind bore her swiftly on her course, and on the fourth day of the voyage the lofty peaks of Otaheite's Isle rose into view. The summits of the mountains seemed to pierce the sky, so sharp and steep were they, and almost to their very tops they were covered with verdure. Luxuriant forests were everywhere visible, and the shore was fringed with a dense growth of palms that seemed to rise from the water itself. The central peak of Tahiti has an elevation of something more than 7,000 feet, and from this peak there is a series of ridges radiating towards the sea like the spokes of a wheel. Many of these ridges are so steep on their sides that they cannot be ascended, and so narrow that there is not room for an ordinary path. A man standing on one of these ridges could with his right hand throw a stone into one valley and with his left a stone into another whose inhabitants could communicate only by descending to the coast or to the lowland which borders it. 
The valleys are luxuriant, and even the ridges are covered with vines and bushes. As the youths with their glasses eagerly scanned the coast they were approaching, one of them called out that he could see a strip of calm water close to the shore. We are coming to the Great Barrier Reef of Coral, said Dr. Bronson, and the calm water that you see is between the reef and the shore. Tahiti is one of the best examples of an island surrounded by a coral reef, the doctor continued. It extends quite around the island, sometimes only a few yards from it, and sometimes four or five miles distant. There are occasional openings through the reef, some wide and deep enough to permit the passage of large ships, and others practicable only for small boats. Inside the reef, the water is calm, and a vessel once within it has a secure harbour. The boys could see the surf breaking on the reef with great violence and throwing spray high into the air. Outside was the ever restless sea. Inside lay the placid lagoon, which reflected the sunlight as in a mirror. Just think of it, said Frank, that great reef which resists the waves of the ocean and could destroy the largest ship that floats is built up by a tiny worm which we could crush between our fingers with the greatest ease. The patience of the honeybee is nothing compared to that of the coral insect. Fred asked what was the depth of water near the reef, both inside and outside. Dr. Bronson answered that it varied greatly, the inner lagoon being sometimes only a few feet, or perhaps inches in depth, and sometimes two, three or five hundred feet. Outside there is generally a great depth of water, sometimes so much that the sounding lead fails to find bottom at a distance of only a few yards. This constitutes, he added, one of the dangers of navigation, as a ship may be close upon a reef without being aware of it until too late. The coral insect, he continued, does not work at a greater depth than 200 feet, and he ceases operations when he reaches the surface. When these reefs are more than 200 feet deep, it is supposed that the bottom has slowly receded and carried the reef with it. As the recession went on, the coral insect continued his work of building. It reminds me of what happens sometimes to a railway in a swampy region. The embankment for the track sinks from time to time and a new one is built above it. After a while, sufficient earth has been thrown in to make a solid foundation and then the sinking ceases. The atoll is another curious form of the work of the coral insect, said the doctor, continuing. It is circular or oval in shape the island forming a rim that encloses a lake or lagoon. There is always an opening from the sea to the lagoon, and it is generally on the leeward side. Sometimes there are two or even three or more openings, but this is unusual. The island rises only a few feet above the water and is the work of the coral insect upon what was once the crater of a volcano. At least that's the general belief. The atoll is not a desirable place for residents as the ocean during severe storms is liable to break across the narrow strip of land and sweep away whatever may be standing there. Many atolls are uninhabited and none of them has a large population. Cocoa palms, breadfruit and other tropical trees are generally found on the inhabited atolls and partially or wholly supply the natives with food. In some instances, the people support themselves by fishing either in the lagoon or in the ocean outside. The lagoon forms a fairly good harbour for ships and canoes, but sometimes the water in it is too deep for anchoring. As the minutes rolled on, the outlines of the mountains and ridges, the valleys and forests, grew more and more distinct. Frank and Fred strained their eyes to discover an opening in the reef, but for some time their earnest gaze was unrewarded. At length, however, Frank saw a spot where the long line of spray appeared to be broken. Gradually it enlarged, and revealed a passage into the great encircling moat of Tahiti. It was the entrance to the harbour of Papeti, the capital of the French possessions in this part of the Pacific. The yacht glided safely through the channel and anchored in front of Papeti, or Papayette, as some writers have it. Two French warships were lying there, and several schooners and other sailing craft engaged in trade among the islands. Then there were some half-dozen ships and barks from various parts of the world, bringing cargoes of miscellaneous goods for the Tahitian market and carrying away the produce of the islands. Frank looked in vain for an ocean-going merchant steamer and found on inquiry that the Society Islands 
are not visited by any of the steamships engaged in the navigation of the Pacific. The Society Islands are a group, consisting of two clusters about 70 miles apart. Some geographers apply the name to the northwestern cluster only, while the other is known as the Tahiti or Georgian group. The latter is the larger and more populous, and is a French colony, while the former is independent. The Spaniards claim to have discovered Tahiti in 1606, and it was visited in 1767 by Captain Wallace, who named it King George's Island. Two years later, Captain Cook discovered the northwestern cluster, called the whole group the Society Islands in honour of the Royal Geographical Society, and restored to Tahiti its native name. Why is Tahiti sometimes called Otaheite? And why is Hawaii in the Sandwich Islands sometimes called Auihi? Fred inquired. Thereby hangs a tale, replied the doctor, or rather a great deal of conjecture. Some ethnographers think the islands of Polynesia were peopled from the Malay Peninsula and archipelago, while others think they were peopled from Japan. Advocates of either theory have a great number of arguments in its support. We haven't time to go over a list, and even if we did, we should not be able to settle the question. The theory that the inhabitants of the Sandwich and Society Islands came originally from Japan is supported by the use in their languages of the prefix O, signifying honourable, exactly as it is used in Japan. As the Japanese say, Oyama, honourable mountain, so the Hawaiians say, O Waihi, and the Tahitians, O Tahete. Many Japanese sports, such as archery, wrestling, boxing, spear throwing, and slinging stones, were in vogue in some of the islands at the time of their discovery. They are rapidly passing away as the people become civilised, and in another generation or two will hardly be heard of. In their language they are nearer like the Malay than the Japanese. That they are of Malay origin is very clearly proven, but exactly how they came here it is not likely we shall ever know. While this conversation was going on, the yacht was visited by a custom house official, who took the declaration of the captain as to her nationality and name, and her object in visiting Tahiti, and then returned to shore. Our friends followed him, and in a very short time were pressing their feet against the solid earth of Papete. For an account of what they saw, we will again refer to Fred's journal. You cannot see much of Papete from anywhere, said Fred, because of the great numbers of trees that grow in and around the place. Here they are, breadfruit, hibiscus, cocoa palms, and half a dozen other varieties, so that nearly every house is hid from view until you are close upon it. The row of shops and cafes near the water is an exception to the rule. They are like the same kind of establishments everywhere in a French colony, and reveal the nationality of the place at a glance. There are mountains in every direction, excepting towards the sea, and through a gorge at the back of the town a particularly fine mountain is visible. Most of the houses are only one storey in height, especially in the outskirts, where the well-to-do residents have their villas. In the town there are a few two- or three-storied buildings, belonging to the foreign merchants or used for government purposes, but these are exceptions to the general aversion to stairways. Land is so cheap here that everybody ought to have plenty of room. The names of the streets make us think of Paris, the principal one is the Rue de Rivoli, and there we find the hotels, shops and cafes, or rather the most of them. On the Rue de Commerce are the warehouses, where goods and provisions are stored, and the Rue de Pologne, which is the widest and best shaded of all, is mainly given up to the Chinese for shops and tea houses. The Chinaman has taken root here, and flourishes. Every year the Chinese hold upon business increases, and some of the French residents advocate the expulsion of the Mongolians through fear that they will soon have a monopoly of the commerce of the islands. In the resident part of the town, nearly every house stands in its own garden, and the most of these gardens are prettily laid out. There are good roads in and around the place, and we have had some charming drives, sometimes in carriages, which we hired at one of the hotels, and sometimes by invitation of the residents. We have had a most hospitable reception, and everybody from the Governor down has tried to make us enjoy our visit. The English consul invited us to dine at his country residence, and afterwards treated us to a moonlight excursion on the water. It was very pretty, as the lagoon was as calm as a mirror, and there were many boats out at the same time. 
The natives seem to be a careless, fun-loving people. Wherever there is a group of them, there is always more or less laughter going on, and they seem to be constantly playing harmless little jokes on one another. The evenings here are delightful, and it is the custom to go out after dinner. The favourite resort is the lawn near the government house. A band from one of the ships of war plays there every evening, and always has a large audience. The natives are very fond of music, and when it is lively they fall to dancing on the green turf. The population of the two clusters that form the society group is said to be a little less than 20,000, three-fourths of them belonging to the Tahitian cluster, and one-fourth to the northwestern. The native population of this island is about 8,000. There are about 1,000 Chinese on the islands, 800 French, 250 British subjects, and 150 Americans, and perhaps 100 of other nationalities. They tell us that we can drive in a carriage all the way around Tahiti, a distance of 160 miles, and that we can hardly go a mile of this distance without coming to a stream of clear water, rolling or rippling down from the mountains. Most of these streams are simply rivulets or brooks, but some of them are rivers too large and deep to be forded. Some of these rivers have been bridged, but where this has not been done, they must be crossed by ferry boats. Villages are scattered at intervals of a few miles, and anyone who undertakes the journey can be comfortably lodged every night, especially if he sends a courier in advance to arrange matters for him. Colonel Bush had an idea of making the journey, but concluded it would be tiresome long before the circuit was completed, and so the scheme was abandoned. One of the early missionaries brought some orange trees here, and they were found admirably adapted to the soil and climate of Tahiti. You see orange groves or orange trees everywhere, and we have never found finer oranges in any part of the world. It is a curious fact that the best trees are those which have grown from seed scattered carelessly about without any thought of planting. In nearly every case they are finer and more productive than those which have been carefully cultivated and transplanted. The French have a jardin d'essai, or experimental garden, where trees and plants from all parts of the world are cultivated with a view to finding those best adapted to Tahiti. As a result of this garden and other importations, the Tahitians now have mangoes, limes, shaddocks, citrons, guavas, custard apples, tamarinds, peaches, figs, crepes, pineapples, watermelons, cucumbers, cabbages and other fruits and vegetables, of whose existence the people were entirely ignorant a hundred years ago. The French government has a garrison of about 400 soldiers in Tahiti, with a large staff of officials of various kinds, naval, military and civil. The governor is a personage of great local importance, as he has very liberal powers and can do pretty much as he likes. We found him a very pleasant gentleman. He invited all our party to a reception at the government house, and the officers of his staff showed us many attentions. The French took possession of a Tahiti in 1842. They had been waiting for an opportunity, and it came in that year. Three Catholic missionaries had been expelled by Queen Pomare at the instigation, so the French say, of the English missionaries. A French fleet came to Papeti and threatened to bombard the town unless Her Majesty should pay immediately a large indemnity, and consent to the return of the expelled missionaries. The Queen was quite unable to raise the money, and the French took possession and established their protectorate. The protectorate continued till 1880, when the King, Pomari V, was persuaded to cede the nominal sovereignty in consideration of a life pension of $12,000 annually. The annexations of Tahiti as a French colony was formally proclaimed in Papeete, March 24, 1881. The first missionaries that came here were sent by the London Mission Society in 1797, but they made little progress in the conversion of the natives, and after a time were driven away in consequence of inter-tribal wars among the people. In 1812, the king invited them to return. They did so, and in the following year a church was established. The king was converted to Christianity, together with several of his priests and subordinate chiefs, and from that time on, the work of the missionaries progressed rapidly. 
Long before the French took possession, the entire population were nominally Christians and had burned their idols and destroyed their heathen temples. There is no evidence that they ever practised cannibalism, but they were cruel in war. Prisoners were slaughtered in cold blood or offered as sacrifices to the gods. Human sacrifices were common, and there were certain tribes and families from whom, in times of peace, the victims for sacrifice were taken. In olden times, these tribes and families were selected, and it is said there was a third of the population whose lives might be taken at any moment. When a victim was called for, resistance was useless, as the whole population, even including a man's nearest neighbours, united to carry him to the marae, or altar of sacrifice. In the early days of Christianity, the victims for sacrifice were taken from among the converts, and sometimes the heathen tribes combined to hunt down the Christians in order to offer them to the gods. It was the story over again of the persecution of the early Christians in Rome and elsewhere in Europe. When the French took possession of the islands, they oppressed the English missionaries in various ways, and had it not been for the persistence of the natives in adhering to the men who converted them, the representatives of the London mission would have been driven out altogether. The trouble was finally compromised by allowing the English missionaries to remain under certain restrictions and establishing a French Protestant mission to work in harmony with the French Catholic one. The great bulk of the people are Protestants as they adhere to the faith to which they were originally converted. The Society Islands as a whole now contains three English missionaries, 16 native ordained ministers and more than 200 other preachers and teachers. There are 4,300 church members, 50 schools and more than 2,000 scholars attending them. The French do not make much interference except on the island of Tahiti where only one English missionary is allowed to reside. He is not, however, recognised as a missionary to the natives, but as pastor of the Bethel Church at Papeti. That will do for statistics on that subject, said Frank. While you've been looking up these points in the history of the islands, I've been finding out what they produce. I was getting round to that, replied Fred, but if you've found it, I'm glad. What is it? From all I can learn, said Frank, the colony isn't a very prosperous one for the French. The exports amount to about a million dollars annually, and the imports to seven hundred thousand dollars. There are no import duties except on firearms and spirits, but I am told it is proposed to place a duty on nearly everything consumed here, so as to make the colony self-supporting. The people have quite abandoned the manufacture of tapa, or native cloth, and dress entirely in goods of European make. They have learned how to distill intoxicating liquor from the orange, and this delicious fruit threatens to be a curse to them instead of a blessing. They have given up tattooing, which was never practised to so great an extent as in the Marquesas. There would be no use for tattooing now, as they have all taken to wearing clothes, just as in the Sandwich Islands. As to the products of the islands, continued Frank, they consist principally of coconut oil and copra. The cotton cultivation has not been profitable. The dried substance of the coconut, from which oil is extracted after its arrival in Europe, arrowroot, cotton, sugar and mother-of-pearl shells. The cotton cultivation has not been profitable, and as to the trade in sugar, it has not been anywhere nearly so successful as in the Sandwich Islands. You have omitted one thing from your list of products, said Dr. Bronson, as Frank paused. You have made no mention of Beche de Mer. That's so, was the reply, but the fact is, I wanted to learn more about it than I know now. I thought so, said the doctor, smiling, and so I've arranged that we will go to the reef tomorrow morning to see how Beche de Mer is taken. We must make an early start, so as to be there at daylight. Further talk about the Society Islands was indefinitely postponed, and the party adjourned to bed. All were up in ample season on the morrow for the excursion to the reef. The best time for visiting the reef is at low tide. The tides in the Society Islands differ from those in most parts of the world by never varying from one day to another throughout the year. At noon and at midnight is the height of the flood, and at six o'clock morning and evening is the lowest of the ebb. Ordinarily the rise is about two feet, Periodically, twice a year, there comes a tidal wave that breaks over the reef with great violence, 
and sweeps across the lagoon to the shore. Frank and Fred sought an explanation of this tidal peculiarity, but were unable to obtain a satisfactory one. A resident of Papeti said the tides were so certain in their movements that many people were able to tell the time of day very nearly by a glance at the reef. To the student of marine life, a coral reef is full of interest, and that of Tahiti is one of the finest in the world. Here are some of the curious things that were described by our friends. We saw, said Frank, some enormous starfish with 15 arms covered with sharp spines of a grey and orange colour. These spines were on the top of the arms. The bottom had an array of yellow feelers, like fingers, with suckers at the end. The boatman cautioned us not to touch these creatures, but their caution was not needed, as we all kept our hands at a respectful distance. There were thousands and thousands of sea urchins, some of them with spikes as large as your fingers and stiff as a nail, down to little fellows the size of a pigeon's egg and armed with long needles like the quills of a porcupine. It is no joke to step on one of these things when you are bathing in the sea and have your feet unprotected. Somebody has likened them to thistles and says they more or less resemble hedgehogs and porcupines. Urchin, according to the dictionary, means hedgehog and therefore the name is not inappropriate. There are sea anemones as large as a cheese and of all the colours you can imagine. An amusing thing about them was that a lot of little fishes, not more than two inches long, were playing hide and seek, swimming around among the spines of these huge polyps. The water is very clear, and as you look over the side of the boat into the garden of coral, with its great variety of colours and its numerous inhabitants, finny, shelly and otherwise, it is like a glimpse of fairyland. It made our flesh creep just a little to see the water snakes coiling around the branches of coral and gliding about all unconscious of being gazed at. Then there are goldfish, bluefish, not the bluefish of America, but a little fellow of the brightest sky blue you ever saw, fish of a pale green, and so on through all the scale of colours. As they swarm among the corals, they reminded us of butterflies in a garden. Fred saw a shell travelling along in a most unexpected way, which he could not understand until he ascertained that it was occupied by a hermit crab. Then there were large crabs in their own shells, and also lobsters, which kept a sharp eye out for danger, and retired to places of security when the boat approached. The youths had hoped to be able to walk on the reef, but the surf was so high that it was unsafe to venture there. Besides, the walking, even when the reef is comparatively dry, is not of the best, as the surface is rough, and there are many holes in the coral in which the novice may get a dangerous fall. Many fishing boats were about, as the time of low tide is the best for fishing, and the water furnishes an important part of the food of the people. Several fishermen, nearly naked and armed with spears, were in the foaming waters at the outer edge of the reef, waiting, with their weapons poised, ready to strike anything that came within their reach. A dozen or more large fish were taken in this way, while our friends were looking on, not once did the spearmen miss hitting their mark, and Frank and Fred both wanted to applaud them for their accuracy of aim. Inside the lagoon, other fishermen were pursuing their prey in boats, the spearmen standing ready in the bow to embrace every opportunity of striking. Men and women were fishing after the ordinary manner of civilization, and with civilized hooks and lines. Formerly they used hooks of pearl shell and bone, and also hooks of the roots of the ironwood tree. But in these modern days, the ordinary hooks of commerce are almost the only ones ever seen in Tahiti. Then there were net fishers in great number, and with many varieties of net. Seine, purse nets, casting nets, dip nets, all were there, and all handled with the dexterity which is only attained by long practice. The guide explained that some of the fishes, which were excellent eating at one time of the year, were poisonous at another. The poisonous condition is caused by their crunching the coral at the time it is said to be in blossom, and by eating sea centipedes, which resembled a yard or two of black string with the smallest imaginable legs. All the land crabs of Tahiti are edible, but several sea crabs are not, and there is one variety so poisonous that it is only eaten when the eater wishes to commit suicide. Beautiful shells are brought up from the depths of the waters, but they must be touched with great care as the spines of many of them are poisonous. 
one of them scientifically known as Conus textilis, a beautiful shell of cone-like shape, has been known to cause death in a few hours, the symptoms being much like those produced by the bite of a rattlesnake. Some of the jellyfishes of England and America have the same poisonous character, but in a much smaller degree. The guide hailed a boat, which was filled with sea slugs, sea cucumbers, tripang or beche de mer, as this article of commerce is variously known, and the youths had an opportunity of examining the curious marine product. They were cautioned not to touch them, as these apparently helpless creatures, which resembled sausages or bags of India rubber, filled with sea water, were not as harmless as they appeared. The guide said they ejected this water when touched, and if it fell on a wound or scratch or into the eye, it caused intense pain and sometimes resulted in temporary or even permanent blindness. The sea slugs were of all colours, black, red, grey, and two or three varieties of green. The most dangerous is an olive green one, marked with orange spots, and hence called the leopard. When it is disturbed, it throws up long filaments like threads or strings, which adhere very tenaciously, and wherever they touch the skin, they raise a burning blister. Most of the sea slugs are caught in still water by divers, who use forks with long prongs, with which they secure their prey. There is one variety, the red one, which is taken in the surf, but all the others prefer quiet nooks. When a canoe has been filled with these repulsive-looking objects, it proceeds to the drying establishment on shore. There the creatures are thrown into a kettle of boiling water sufficiently long to kill them. Then they are cleaned and stewed for half an hour and then placed on racks of sticks for smoking and drying. The smoking must be kept up for three days and longer if the weather is damp, and then the leathery substance is ready for packing in palm leaf baskets for transportation to China. Great care must be taken to have it thoroughly dried, as the least remaining moisture will spoil it during its long voyage in the hold of a ship. Sometimes fishes are found inside the sea slug, and it seems to be well established that they live together in this contracted seawater tank. When taken out and placed in clear salt water, they soon die, in spite of every precaution. While looking over the side of the boat, Fred saw a large clam and immediately coveted it. The guide engaged a diver who was nearby. And for a small reward, the man went below for the prize. The clam was lying with his mouth open and evidently enjoying his morning bath of seawater. The diver inserted a sharply pointed stick into the flesh of the mollusk, and the shell closed upon it instantly. Then he severed the filaments which attached the clam to the rock, and with one hand below the shell, and another holding the stick, made his way to the surface. Most of the diving for clams is done by the women, said the guide, while Fred was gazing at the huge shell, nearly two feet long, which lay before him. Many a woman and many a man too, continued the guide, has been nipped by the shell and drowned there, totally unable to escape. In all parts of the South Pacific you will hear horrible stories of death in this way. These clams grow to a great size, as you see. Half a shell often serves as a bathtub for a child, and in the Catholic churches of Polynesia it is used for holy water. Some years ago a native in the Pormatan Islands was diving for pearl oysters and while feeling around for them, accidentally thrust his hand inside a gaping clam shell, which closed on him instantly. The shell was in a hole in the coral, so that he could not reach the back to detach it. The only thing he could do was to sever his fingers with the knife in his free hand. He thus saved himself from being drowned, but was maimed for life. The guide called the attention of the youth to some large eels, which were coiled up in the coral. He said they were very voracious and many natives had been deprived of fingers by these uncanny creatures. They sometimes reach a length of eight or ten feet and one poor fellow had the whole calf of a leg bitten off by one of them. Then there are a great many cuttlefish and sometimes the girls and women are caught and overpowered by them. The danger from these creatures is so well known that the natives rarely go out alone to dive for them or for clams. Some of the cuttlefish measure six feet across they lie in holes in the coral and throw out their long arms to grasp anything that comes in their reach. They cling around the body of a diver or wrap themselves about his head, and unless speedily relieved by his companions, his death is inevitable. Are there any more dangers among the reefs, said Frank, when all these had been recounted? Yes, was the reply. 
there are great numbers of sharks, some of them harmless and others dangerous. The worst is a white shark, 30 feet long, and he is so bold that he has been known to attack canoes, either by overturning them and throwing their occupants into the water, or by seizing an arm or leg which happened to be outstretched and dragging its owner overboard. There is a smaller shark, six or eight feet long, which lives in caves in the coral and comes out in search of food. Its flesh is good to eat and one of these sharks is quite a prize. In some of the groups of islands, the fishermen dive into the shark caverns while the monster is asleep and pass a noose around his tail. Then the man rises instantly to the surface and his companions haul up the ugly creature tail first, stunning him with a club or hammer as he comes over the side of the boat. But suppose, said one of the youths, that after the diver has entered the cave, the shark should change his position and get across the doorway. In that case, replied the guide, his only mode of escape will be to tickle the shark so as to induce him to move aside. He can only do this when its tail is towards him. If he has turned the other way, the man's fate is practically sealed. Fred concluded that he would never indulge in diving for sharks as a means of livelihood, and Frank fully agreed with him. Then the guide told him of the stingaree, or stingray, which is not unknown in American waters, but grows to a much greater size here than on the coast of the United States. Its tail has a sharp barbed point, which generally breaks off when struck into the flesh. The point is serrated on both sides, the teeth pointing backward, and so it works its way inward like the quill of a porcupine. Other dangers of the water were described, but it is time to return from the reef, and so we will leave them there. On their return to Papeiti, our friends visited the market, going first to the section where fish were offered for sale. Here is Frank's note upon what they saw there. There were fishes of all sizes and kinds, bonito, rockfish, eels, clams, oysters, mussels, turtle, salmon from the rivers, prawns, crabs, and a great many varieties of finny and scaly things that have no name in English. The natives are fond of raw fish, and we saw them swallowing little fishes whole, and slices of big ones, just as we would dispose of a basket of strawberries. One of the first persons we saw in the market was a pretty girl of eighteen or twenty, who was crunching live shrimps, or letting them wriggle down her throat as readily as she would swallow so many sugar plums. Some European residents have acquired the taste for raw fish, and they say it is delicious. We have not ventured upon it, though we take clams and oysters raw according to the practice of our own country. The tropical bivalves are not so good as those of temperate regions, and I believe this is the general testimony of travellers. The market is well supplied with chickens, turkeys, pigeons and ducks, which are nearly always sold alive, as the heat of the climate prevents their being kept more than a few hours after slaughtering. Pigs are sold alive, and they are carried about suspended by their hind legs from a pole. It is painful to hear them squeal, and there ought to be a Tahitian branch of the society for the prevention of cruelty to animals to put a stop to this barbarity. Most of the market people were natives, but I observed a good many Chinese there, especially in the section devoted to vegetables and fruits. These people take very naturally to vegetable gardens, and their patient industry is well rewarded by the fertile soil of Tahiti. On reaching the hotel, our friends found an invitation to a feast, which one of the merchants was to give the next day at his country residence, in native style. They immediately sent acceptances, and were ready at the time appointed for the carriage, which was provided by their thoughtful host. When we reached the house, said Fred, each of us was provided with a new bathing dress and towels, and proceeded to the river close by, where numbers of guests were already enjoying a bath in the clear water. The party straggled back in twos and threes, and as fast as we returned, every one of us was crowned with a wreath of flowers, after the Tahitian custom. There was a great deal of fun and laughter about this part of the entertainment, but everybody enjoyed it, and entered heartily into the sport of the occasion. The guests included all our party from the yacht, the officers from the ships of war, every stranger of consequence in Perpeti, and pretty nearly every respectable resident. By the time everybody had returned from the bath and received his crown, the feast was announced and we went in procession to the dining hall. This proved to be a temporary building, made of a slight framework of bamboos and banana trees, 
covered with a thatch of palm leaves and decorated with festoons of leaves and vines. The building was erected over a fine piece of lawn and the table was spread on the grass. Instead of a table as we understand it, fresh banana leaves were spread on the grass and on these the good things of the feast were laid. On the grass at the edge of this novel tablecloth, mats made of cocoa fibre were spread and on these mats we sat down, native fashion. It was rather awkward getting down to the floor, but of course the awkwardness added to the fun of the occasion. The substantial part of the feast consisted of turkeys, chickens and young pigs, roasted and served cold, and then there were all kinds of fin and shellfish, both raw and cooked. All the fruits of the island were there, and all the vegetables, including yams, sweet potatoes, cucumbers and the like, European wines took the place of the native drink, kava, which is rapidly going out of use. Instead of plates, each of us had a pile of breadfruit leaves, which served as plates, and in front of each guest there were four half-coconut shells. One was full of drinking water, the second full of milk, the third contained chopped coconut, and the fourth sea water. The sea water was emptied into the chopped coconut to form a sauce, like the Chinese soy, into which the various articles of food were dipped before conveyed to the mouth, and then the shell was filled with fresh water and used as a finger glass. We enjoyed the feast very much, though all of us confessed afterwards to a backache from the novelty of our positions. After the feast there was dancing in the spacious parlour of our host, and the festivities were kept up until late in the evening. An excursion was made the next day to Point Venus, which has a historic interest as it is the promontory where Captain Cook made the astronomical observations by which he determined the correct position of the Society Islands. The name of the place commemorates his observation of the transit of Venus, which he and his scientific party made here in 1769. It was a delightful ride along the Broom Road, as it is called, shaded by palm and breadfruit trees, and through groves of oranges, citrons, guavas, bananas and other tropical productions. Our friends inspected the lighthouse, which is maintained here, to direct the mariner approaching Papeti, and Frank made a sketch of the tamarind tree, planted by Captain Cook, near the spot where he made the famous observations. End of chapter 4、Chapter-Five-The-Boy-Travellers-in-Australasia-This-is-a-Librivox-Recording-All-Librivox-Recordings-are-in-the-Public-Domain-For-More-Information-or-To-Volunteer-Please-Visit-Librivox.org-Recording
But this circumstance does not justify the denunciation that has been heaped upon the entire body. Frank asked why it was that so many men engaged in commerce were opposed to the missionaries. Principally for the reason, was the reply, that the missionaries defend the natives against the dishonesty of certain classes of traders, and thus reduce their profits. There are honest men and dishonest ones engaged in commerce in Polynesia, just as there are elsewhere. When you hear a Polynesian merchant denouncing the missionaries in vehement terms, you may fairly conclude that the missionaries have stood in his way when he was endeavouring to defraud the natives. He is a man not to be trusted. At least that is a fair inference. Though in this, as in everything else, he may be an exception. Let me give you an illustration of this, continued the doctor. Some years ago, I heard a retired sea captain in New York denouncing the missionaries and declaring that they had ruined the trade of the South Pacific. It was at a dinner party, and before the end of the evening, the old captain became quite communicative about the ways of commerce with Polynesia and the Malay archipelago. Among other things, he told how they traded with the natives in his younger days. We used, said he, to take our old-fashioned balance scales on shore with our 56 pound and smaller weights with handles to them. We set up the scales, and then the natives brought forward some bags whose exact weight they knew. These bags were used for testing our weights, to see that they were correct. Of course, they were all right. The testing and setting up of the scales took the best part of the afternoon, and then we knocked off for the day. We left the scales on shore where they'd been set up, but took the weights back to the ship for safety. They were hollow, and the handles were screwed in. During the night, we unscrewed the handles, filled the hollow space with lead, and then screwed the handles back again so neatly that nobody would ever discover anything. In this way, we managed to get the cargo to average 160 to 170 pounds of pickle, 133 pounds. And in those days, a supercargo or captain who couldn't make a cargo come up to at least 150 pounds of pickle wasn't wanted another voyage by the owners. Trade went on that way until the missionaries found out all about this and other tricks and told the natives. They never would have suspected anything if it hadn't been for the missionaries. This man, continued the doctor, was no worse than many others in the same line of business. And if all stories are true, he was no worse than many of our forefathers who made money by their dealings with the savages in the early days of American colonisation. The belief that it is no sin to cheat the infidel and heathen is not by any means confined to the followers of Muhammad. It is easy to understand why he was opposed to the missionary labours in the South Seas, as they certainly tended, in his estimation, to the ruin of commerce. One of the youths asked if this opposition to the Christianising of the heathen was prevalent among the large mercantile houses, as well as among the small and independent traders. It is impossible to answer this question with plain yes or no, was the reply. But it is safe to say that a very large section of the commercial community of every nation is unfavourable, or at all events indifferent, to missionary enterprises. Even national power is sometimes invoked in the interest of commerce without regard to the effect upon the heathen. British artillery forced the Chinese to open their markets to the opium of India and the power of British, French, German and other arms on the coast of Africa for purposes of trade is well known. Even America is not without sin in this respect. American diplomacy, backed by American ships of war, opened the ports of Japan, and the history of our dealings with our own Indians reveals many instances of bloodshed or repression in the interests of post-traders and other speculators. Until its failure a few years ago, the German house of Godefroy & Sons was by far the largest firm or association doing business in the Pacific. It had large fleets of ships, it had branch houses in many parts of the world, in numerous islands of the Pacific its agents were established, and it owned lands and buildings of immense value. In the harbour of Apia, Samoa, they had a shipyard, where they not only repaired old ships but built new ones, and they owned several excellent harbours in other parts of Polynesia. There was not a single group of islands of any consequence where they were not established, and they had a great influence with the German government. 
Now, do you suppose this great house was friendly to the missionaries, the men who came here and opened the way for commerce? Not a bit of it. Here is an extract from their general orders to their agents everywhere. Never assist missionaries by word or deed, but wheresoever you may find them, use your best influence to obstruct and exclude them. The effect of these instructions is illustrated in the experience of the American missionary ship Morning Star. Several years ago, in a visit to the King's Mill group of islands near the equator, a pilot came out to meet the ship and made her anchor three miles from shore to wait the permission of the king before anyone could land. When the king learned that it was a missionary ship, he sent word that he would supply any needed provisions, but on no account could anyone come on shore. The traders had told him that if any missionaries were allowed to land, they would bewitch him and his people, and he had determined to protect himself from harm. Numerous instances of the demoralising effects of commerce, when controlled by bad men, can be given. The missionaries were the first to occupy Polynesia, when traders could not venture there. Some of these good men lost their lives, but the work of taming the savages went on until commerce could follow in their footsteps. You might naturally expect that commerce would be grateful, but such is far from being the case. Then the conversation turned upon the history of missionary efforts in the South Pacific, from the opening enterprise of the London Mission near the end of the last century. Frank and Fred made copious notes on the subject from the books within their reach and the information supplied by the doctor, and from these notes they subsequently condensed the following interesting story. The London Missionary Society was formed in 1795 by zealous men of different denominations. The call for the first meeting was signed by 18 independent clergymen, seven Presbyterian, three Wesleyan, Methodist, and three Episcopal, and the assemblage was held September 22nd of that year. The islands of the Pacific were then attracting attention in consequence of the mutiny of the bounty and the death of Captain Cook, and they were selected as the first field of operations. Many young men offered themselves as missionaries, and of all the number of applicants, 29 were selected. The first delegation landed on Tahiti March 4th, 1797, and formed the first mission of the society. From that beginning, the South Seas have been gradually covered with missions, and the society has pushed its work into other fields, which we need not consider here. It still adheres to its original plan of avoiding denominational differences of doctrine and church government, and zealously pursues its work. Nearly all of the denominations of Protestants have since organised separate missions of their own, both in Great Britain and America, for spreading the gospel in the South Seas. In our account of the Sandwich and Society Islands, the work of the missionaries has been described. We have seen how whole populations have renounced heathenism and its practices, have been provided with written languages, and with schools and churches, and have been changed from savages to civilised men and women, and all this is due to the work of the missionary, who laboured for the good of his fellow man. More than 300 islands of the Pacific have abandoned their heathenism, and nearly half a million of Polynesian savages have been virtually Christianised. Their communicants who have been gathered into the churches number fully 60,000, not including the inhabitants of the Sandwich Islands, who are now supporting missions of their own. One reason of the success of the mission work is the common sense that prevailed at the outset in dividing the field among the different denominations, so that the minds of the natives should not be confused as to the character of the teachings they were receiving. This was done through a friendly agreement between the London Missionary Society and the Wesleyan Mission, the former having exclusive charge of the work in the Samoan Islands, and the Wesleyans taking possession of the Fiji and Tonga groups. Other groups were disposed of in the same way as time went on, and the arrangements were found entirely satisfactory. Catholic missions have been established in some of the islands where the Protestant missions were already settled. They have made poor progress, as the natives showed an unwillingness to abandon the faith they had adopted for another. The London Missionary Society has missions in the society. Tuamotu, Hervey or Cook, Austral, Samoa, Tokelau, Ellis, Gilbert and Loyalty Groups, on Nyu and several other isolated islands and in New Guinea. It owns two vessels, the John Williams 
and the Ellen Gowan. The Australian Wesleyan Conference supports missions in Tonga, Fiji, Samoa, Rotomua and New Britain. The Presbyterian Churches of Australia have a mission in the New Hebrides and possess a mission vessel called the Dayspring. The Melanesian Episcopal Mission is maintained in the Bankses, Santa Cruz and Solomon Islands and has a mission vessel called the Southern Cross. The Catholics have missions on all the islands controlled by the French and on most of the others but they did not make their appearance until long after the work had been well underway in the hands of the Protestant organisations. A considerable portion of the early missionaries were murdered by the natives, whose good they sought, and others died of disease, privation and the effects of the climate. But the ranks were steadily filled up, and the work went on. The native converts and teachers were fully as zealous as the white men who had taught them the new religion, and much of the work of instruction was performed by them. Whenever native teachers were murdered by the savages among whom they had taken their residences, others volunteered to fill their places. The following incident is recorded in the history of mission work in Polynesia. In 1822, the mission ship of the Reverend John Williams anchored off an island which proved to be Mangaea of the Hervey group. Three Tahitian teachers Two of them accompanied by their wives volunteered to land and establish a mission. No sooner were they on shore than they were attacked and plundered of everything they possessed, and they only escaped with their lives by swimming back through the surf to the ship. A few months later the mission ship went there again, and two unmarried teachers, Davida and Thierry, sprang into the sea and swam to the shore, carrying nothing but the clothing they wore and a portion of the New Testament in Tahitian which was wrapped in cloth and tied on their heads. A great crowd assembled at the landing, and as they stepped on shore, several warriors levelled spears at them. The king took the swimmers under his protection, treated them kindly, took them to the temple and pronounced them taboo or sacred, so that the natives should not harm them. Within two years, Thierry died, but the work of conversion went on so well that one day the king and his chiefs Determined to give up idolatry, they carried the thirteen idols which they had hitherto worshipped to the house of Davida and announced that for the future they would worship the god of the white man. These thirteen idols are now preserved in the museum of the London Missionary Society. In 1821, Mr Williams decided to send a mission from Reatea to the Hervey Islands, of which very little was known beyond the bare existence of such a group and that it was inhabited by fierce cannibals. Several native converts from Reatasia were landed on the island of Aitutaqui. They were well received by the chief and his people, but Mr Williams had great fears for their safety, owing to the bad character of the cannibal inhabitants. In the following year, when the mission ship went there again, great was the joy of Mr Williams to learn that all the inhabitants had abandoned idolatry, burned their temples, and decided to be Christians, they had built a large church, kept the Sabbath religiously, and on the day following the arrival of the mission ship, 2,000 of them assembled on the beach in solemn prayer, which was led by the delighted missionary. After the service, they brought their idols and carried them on board the mission ship, so that the people of the other islands might see for themselves that they had discarded altogether the worship of the worthless images. The story of the conversion of the inhabitants of the island of Rarotonga, of the Hervey group, sounds like romance. So little was known of this island that Mr Williams had great trouble in finding it, as its latitude and longitude had not been established. Among the converts on another island were six natives of Rarotonga. One of these men told Mr Williams that if he would sail to a given point on the island of Aitutaki, he could take bearings that would carry him where he wished to go. So, taking the six Rarotongans on board, he steered for the point indicated, and by following the directions of the man, the island that they sought was reached. The young king came on board and agreed to take the six natives ashore, and also a Tahitian teacher who had volunteered to remain. The king, Matea, a handsome fellow six feet high and with every inch of his skin elaborately tattooed, was one of the first converts. Within a year the whole population had become Christian and there was not a house on the island where the family did not assemble morning and evening for divine worship. 
Mr Williams and another missionary went there with their families in 1827 and were met at the shore by several thousand of natives who shook hands with them so vigorously that their arms ached for hours afterwards. A few days after their arrival, the people came in procession, bringing fourteen enormous idols, for which they had no further use, the smallest of them being fifteen feet high. A new church was erected, capable of containing three thousand people. Some of the idols were used as pillars of this building, and the rest were burned. The railing of the pulpit stairs of this church was made of spears which the chiefs contributed, and all the heathen temples and even their foundations were completely broken up. The Hervey Islands are now a centre of missionary work in the South Pacific. The islanders have a theological college which has sent out nearly 200 trained teachers and preachers of their own and about half this number are scattered among the Isles of the Pacific where the inhabitants have not yet renounced heathenism or their cannibal practices. In 1881, four of these missionaries, with their wives and children, twelve persons in all, were murdered by the natives of New Guinea, and several others narrowly escaped with their lives. Shortly after settling in the Hervey Islands, Mr Williams determined to carry the gospel to the navigators, or Samoan group. Having no ship, he built a boat, sixty feet long and eighteen feet wide, with the aid of the Rarotonga natives. He wanted a blacksmith's bellows to shape the ironwork, and in order to make it, he killed three of his four goats to obtain their skins. In a single night his bellows was devoured by the rats, the only quadrupeds indigenous to the islands, and he then invented a pump by which air could be forced. His boat took fifteen weeks for its construction. Its sails were of native matting, the cordage was of the bark of the hibiscus, the oakum for calculating the seams was made from banana stumps and coconut husks, and the sheaves were of iron wood. To obtain planks, trees were split with wedges and then cut up with hatchets. One anchor was of stone and another of iron wood, and the provisions consisted of pigs, coconuts, bananas, and other tropical products. In this vessel, he sailed during the next four years to many islands of the Pacific, distributing teachers among them and doing everything in his power for the good of the people. In 1834 he visited England and returned in the missionary ship Camden, which had been purchased by the London Missionary Society. Mr Williams continued his work until 1839, when he, with a companion missionary, James Harris, was murdered by the natives of the New Hebrides Islands, whither he had gone to plant a mission. The stories of the conversion of the people of the Tonga, Samoan and Fiji groups is only scarcely less romantic than what has just been narrated of the Hervey Isles. In all these islands, as well as in the Sandwich and Society groups, it is probable that the proportion of the inhabitants who observe the Sabbath, attend divine service and gather in their families for morning and evening worship is greater than among the people of Great Britain or the United States. In their intertribal wars, which sometimes occur in these days, though far less frequently than before the advent of the missionaries, all parties abstain from fighting on Sunday, and men may safely circulate from one hostile camp to another. And all this has been accomplished through the self-abnegation of the men who obeyed the divine injunction, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Volumes could be written, as volumes have been written, but even then the whole story of the work and sufferings of the missionaries in the South Seas would remain untold. Referring to the opposition of the traders to the missionaries, Dr. Bronson said that the death of Mr. Williams was due to the conduct of the seamen, though it was not directly instigated by them. One of the products of the Pacific Islands, said the doctor, is sandalwood, which brings a high price in the Chinese market, and so much has it been sought in the last 50 or 60 years that on many of the islands it has entirely disappeared. The sandalwood traders committed many outrages on the islands that they visited, and these outrages naturally led to reprisals. When Mr Williams and his friend landed on Aromango in the New Hebrides, a party of warriors rushed upon them from a thicket where they had been lying concealed. In an instant the missionaries were clubbed, and their bodies were afterwards roasted and eaten by the savages, whom the devoted men sought to reclaim. Investigation showed that a sandalwood ship had visited the island a few weeks before 
and her crew had killed several of the natives who opposed the plunder of their plantations and the destruction of their trees. Of course, the natives were ready to revenge themselves on the first foreign ship that came there, and this happened to be the one carrying the missionaries. In 1871, continued the doctor, the death of Bishop Patterson occurred on the island of Nukapu in much the same way. The bishop was widely known and esteemed for his devotion to missionary work in Polynesia and was greatly beloved by the natives on all the islands he had visited. Shortly before his visit to Nukapu, a labour vessel had been there and carried off many of the natives against their will. While the natives were thirsting for revenge, the bishop arrived, and not knowing him they put him to death, as the natives of Aramanga had killed Mr Williams more than thirty years before. Please tell us something about the labour vessels and the labour trade, said Frank. I have read about them, and we heard them mentioned in Tahiti and Honolulu, and would like to know more about them. It is quite a long story, was the reply, but I'll try to give it to you briefly. You remember that in the Hawaiian and Society Islands, it was necessary to import foreign labour for the plantations, the natives being too indolent or not sufficiently numerous for the wants of the planters. Well, the same state of affairs prevailed, and still prevails in the Samoa, Fiji, Tonga and other groups, where cotton and sugar plantations have been established, and also in Queensland in Australia. Well, the demand naturally led to an effort to supply the want. Labour vessels went among the islands and groups farther to the west, especially among the Solomon and New Hebrides islands, to hire men to work on the plantations where they were needed. Nearly all of these vessels were English, either from the ports of Australia or hailing from Fiji, Samoa or Tahiti. Occasionally an American captain went into the labour traffic and there was now and then a French or German vessel engaged in it. The theory of the business was that men were hired on regular contracts to work for a period of years, from three to five years, on designated plantations for certain stipulated wages and at the end of the contract they were to be returned to their homes free of expense to themselves. Every man was to understand perfectly what was required of him and nobody was to be taken except of his own free will. This was the theory and the practice at the outset, but very soon the practice became far otherwise. Some men were hired on the above plan, more were hired from their chiefs without being consulted as to their own willingness in the matter and a still greater number were kidnapped and sold into slavery. Sold into slavery? Yes, exactly that. They were decoyed on board the labour ships, and when a sufficient number were there, they were bound hand and foot, flung into the hold, and the ship sailed away with them. They were delivered over to the planters at so much ahead, and very few of them ever found their way back again to their homes. Why, that's just like what we used to read about the African slave trade, said Fred, who had been listening with open-eyed astonishment. Quite so, the doctor answered. It was the revival of the African slave trade and was carried on under the British flag, and many of the men were taken into slavery on British soil as they were turned over to the planters of Queensland, a British colony. The matter became so notorious that the attention of the British government was called to it, and measures were taken to put an end to the outrages. Ships of war were sent to the South Pacific to suppress the illegal trade, and stringent laws were passed to prevent further outrages. At present, every labour vessel must be licensed for her business, and carry an official who superintends the making of contracts, and make sure that every labourer signs the agreement with his own free will, and with a full understanding of the terms of the document. Care is taken with regard to the food and treatment of the men while on shipboard, and also when at work on the plantations. Frank asked, what were the means resorted to to obtain men before the government took these precautions? As to that was the reply, the tricks and devices were various. The usual plan was for a ship to anchor near an island, and of course she was soon surrounded by the natives in their canoes, ready to barter coconuts and other produce for what the white men had to sell. The men were enticed on board and when a sufficient number was on the deck, a signal was given by the captain, and the sailors would knock the victims down as rapidly as possible. Some escaped by jumping overboard, but the rest were secured, and the ship then proceeded to another island to repeat the process 
until her cargo was complete. Then, with her hold packed like that of an African slave ship 50 years ago, she steered for Fiji or for Queensland, and the captain and crew made a handsome profit for their work. After a time, the natives became too wary to be enticed on board in the ordinary way, and then other plans were tried. The Southern Cross, the mission ship used by Bishop Patterson, was painted white, and the natives were familiar with its appearance. Accordingly, the slavers adopted the following plan to obtain their living cargoes. About the time the bishop was making his rounds, a white vessel appeared and anchored near an island. A boat put off for the shore, and in its stern sat a black-coated individual with a white necktie, green glasses, a book under his arm, which would readily pass for a Bible, and an umbrella over his head. The cry went around that the bishop had come, and the natives flocked to the beach to welcome him. Instead of the bishop, it was a strange missionary who spoke enough of the language to make himself understood. He told them that the bishop had had a fall the day before and broke his leg, and therefore could not come on shore. He must hurry away to Sydney to see a doctor, and could only stay a little while at the island. But he wanted to see his friends on board and would like some yams and fruit. In the course of an hour or so, fifty or more canoes are flying over the water, laden with presents for the good bishop. The fruit is passed on board, the men follow, and are admitted two or three at a time to descend into the bishop's cabin. At the foot of the cabin stairs they are met by half a dozen sailors who put pistols to their heads, threaten to kill them if they make the least outcry, tie their hands and pass them along into the hold through a hole which has been cut from the cabin for that purpose. When a batch has been thus disposed of, another is allowed to descend, and in a little while the hold is full. Fifty or more natives have been made prisoners, and meantime the strange missionary has returned from shore. The canoes are cut adrift or sunk by dropping pieces of iron into them, and the pretended missionary ship sails away with a cargo of slaves for the Queensland or Fiji market. And was this really done by Englishmen? One of the youths asked. Yes, not only once, but several times, the doctor answered. And of the men thus stolen from their homes, very few have ever found their way back again. If you wish more information on this point, read Kidnapping in the South Seas by Captain Palmer and The Cruise of the Rosario by Captain Markham, both of the Royal Navy. These gentlemen were sent to cruise in Polynesian waters to suppress the slave trade, and though they made several captures, they did not find themselves supported by the colonial courts. In two glaring instances, says Captain Markham, when slavers were seized and sent to Sydney for adjudication, they were acquitted, and their captors were themselves condemned in heavy damages for detention and injury done to those vessels. A notorious case, continued the doctor, was that of the slaver Carl, which has figured prominently in the newspapers and official documents. The vessel left Melbourne in June 1871 for a cruise among the South Sea Islands with the object of procuring labourers. Dr James Patrick Murray was on board as a passenger and part owner of the vessel, which was commanded by Joseph Armstrong. They tried to obtain labourers at the New Hebrides Islands by legitimate methods, but failed and then they resorted unsuccessfully to the missionary trick. After this, the party captured the natives by upsetting or destroying their canoes. According to Dr Murray's account, given on the trial of Armstrong and one of the crew, the captain and crew used to smash the canoes by dropping pig iron or stones into them, and the passengers in their own boat picked the natives out of the water, sometimes stunning them with clubs or slung shot if they were troublesome. In this way they collected about 80 natives, keeping them in the hold at night and allowing them to come on deck during the day. One night there was a disturbance in the hold and the natives tore down the bunks or sleeping places and with the materials thus obtained they attacked the main hatchway. An attempt was made to pacify them but it failed and then the crew began firing down the hatchway. The firing lasted about eight hours, being kept up during the night one of the men occasionally throwing lights into the hold in order to enable the others to direct their aim. At daylight all appeared to be quiet and so the hatches were opened and those who were alive were invited to come up. About five came up without help. There were eight or nine seriously wounded, sixteen badly wounded 
and about 50 dead. The dead and the 16 badly wounded were immediately thrown overboard. The ship was out of sight of land at the time and therefore it was impossible that any of the wounded could have reached the shore. The blood was removed from the hold, all traces of the affair were effaced and when the car was overhauled by the Rosario shortly afterwards, there was nothing suspicious in her appearance and she was allowed to proceed on her voyage. The captain and one of the crew were condemned to death, but the sentence was afterwards commuted to imprisonment. Murray was allowed to be one of the witnesses for the prosecution and so escaped punishment. Others of the party on board said Murray was the ringleader in the whole business and that he sang marching through Georgia while firing at the poor natives in the hold. They further said that he selected those who were the least wounded when the remainder were thrown overboard and he used to read prayers to the crew and then give the order to go and smash the canoes of the natives. And all this happened in 1871, said Frank, and was done by Englishmen and under the English flag. Yes, replied the doctor, and until the outrages became so notorious that the attention of the civilised world was drawn towards them, many official Englishmen in the British colonies were very lukewarm on the subject and evidently did not wish to impede the progress of the cotton and sugar industries by interfering with the business of procuring labourers. Let me give an instance of this. Captain Palmer, the predecessor of Captain Markham, in command of the Rosario, seized the schooner Daphne, a 48 tons burden, fitted up exactly like an African slaver, and with 100 natives on board. They were entirely naked, had not even mats to sleep on, and the hold of the schooner resembled a pig pen more than anything else. The Daphne had a licence to carry 50 native passengers, but it made no mention of Fiji, where she was seized and whither she had taken her cargo for sale. The natives were landed at Levuka, Fiji, and placed under the care of the British consul, and the Daphne was sent to Sydney for adjudication. The Chief Justice of New South Wales, Sir Alfred Stephen, decided in the Daphne's favour, in the following words which I will read from Captain Palmer's book, Kidnapping in the South Seas. It will not be enough to show that artifice has been used, or even falsehood told, to induce the natives to enter into the agreements or contracts mentioned, if they really did enter into the contracts. The morality of the proceeding cannot be taken into consideration in determining the question raised here. The captor will have substantially to prove that the natives were going to be passed into a state of real slavery by those who had taken them on board the Daphne, or were to be put into a state really amounting to slavery, and in violation of the agreement, and against their will. The Daphne was released, and Captain Palmer was compelled to pay the expense of the trial, amounting to nearly $900. This money was afterwards refunded to him by Her Majesty's Government, which approved his action in seizing the schooner, and placed his name on the list for promotion. How do the colonies obtain their labourers at present? Fred asked. They get them from the islands in legitimate ways, as I before told you, and they also import Chinese and Indian coolies. The supply of Polynesian labour is not equal to the demand, and in the last few years, especially in Fiji, there has been a large importation of coolies from India. We will learn something about them when we visit the Fiji Islands. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Boy Travellers in Australasia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Boy Travellers in Australasia by Thomas W. Knox The Pera reached the Samoan Islands without mishap, and anchored in the harbour of Apia. The Samoan group is also known on charts and maps as the Navigator's Islands. The former name is the native one, while the latter was bestowed by Bougainville in 1768, who called the group... Archipel des Navigateurs, in consequence of the skill displayed by the natives in managing their canoes. There are nine inhabited islands in the group, with an area of about 1,125 square miles, and a population of something less than 40,000. In general effect, our friends found the scenery of Samoa not unlike that of Tahiti, though the detail was materially different. The harbour of Apia is an excellent one affording secure anchorage and safety from all winds. 
The captain of the yacht told Frank that there was a finer harbour at Pango Pango, in another island, but Apia was the most important commercially. The trading company that succeeded the German house of Godefroy and Sons after the latter's failure has a large establishment at Apia and controls a great part of the business of the islands. The shipyard of the company was pointed out and it needed only a glance to show that it was extensive and well equipped. Apia consists of a long and rather straggling village stretched along the shore of a crescent-shaped bay. Like most of these South Sea Island ports, it is concealed by the cocoa palms and other trees peculiar to the tropics and many of the houses are so well covered by the verdure that the visitor cannot make out their position until he is close upon them. Back of the town, which contains two or three hundred stores and residences, the horizon is filled with richly green hills which rise one upon the other to a height of nearly 5,000 feet. Streams come trickling down from these hills and there is one waterfall visible from the harbour large enough to make a well-defined stipple of white against the rich green of the mountains that surround it. Frank and Fred immediately suggested a walk to the waterfall, but their enthusiasm was checked by Dr. Bronson, who thought there would be enough in Apia to amuse them, at least for that day. Hardly was the anchor fixed in the mud before a boat was lowered, and the pair's party went on shore. Dr. Bronson and the youths proceeded to the American consulate, while Colonel Bush and Dr. McAllister went to call upon the representative of their country. After the official formalities were over, they strolled about the town, and in a short time Frank and Fred had familiarised themselves with a considerable amount of the history of Samoa, as we have ascertained by a perusal of their journals. Apia isn't much of a place, said Frank, but what it lacks in numbers, it makes up in variety. Among the residents there are Americans, Englishmen, Germans, French and several other nationalities, the Germans being most numerous and controlling the best of the trade. Then there is a fair sprinkling of men whose nationality is open to question and whom any respectable country would not be anxious to claim. Samoa is at present the favourite resort of the beachcomber. Perhaps you don't know what a beachcomber is. All through the islands of the Pacific there are men whose history is shrouded in obscurity and who are unwilling to tell the truth about themselves for the simple reason that the truth would be inconvenient. They are deserters from ships, runaways from home, perhaps in consequence of crimes for which the law would like to lay hands on them, outcasts from decent society, or society of any kind, and not at all particular as to how they make a living. They were more numerous fifty years ago than at present, but there is still a sufficient number of them for all practical wants of the country. In the days when England sent its criminal classes to Australia, the South Sea Islands were filled with escaped convicts and ticket-of-leave men, but that source of supply no longer abounds, and thereby hangs a tale which may as well be told here as anywhere else. The first white settlers of the Fiji Islands was a band of 27 convicts who escaped from imprisonment in New South Wales in 1804 on a small schooner which they had captured. They landed in Fiji with a few muskets and in their encounters with the natives. Their weapons made them all powerful. The natives regarded the muskets as something supernatural and if the white men had conducted themselves with intelligence, they could have obtained mastery over the whole population with very little trouble. The natives were ready to acknowledge them as rulers, and did in fact exalt several of them to the position of chiefs. But the fellows quarrelled with the natives and among themselves, and when Commodore Wilkes touched at the Fijis in 1840, only two of them were alive. These Wandering or stationary vagabonds are the men who are called beachcombers in the parlance of the South Pacific. They are not fond of law and order, and whenever an island group goes under the control of any European power, the beachcombers are very likely to leave and take up their abode on islands where the natives are still independent. When the French occupied Tahiti, many beachcombers there fled to Fiji, and when Fiji became an English colony, they departed for Samoa. Samoa is still under the rule of its own kings, or rather, under their misrule. But the probabilities are that it will soon be in the hands of the Germans. When this happens, you may expect an emigration of beachcombers to the islands, if any remain, where there will be no legal restraints. The stories of many of these fellows is full of the most startling incidents, even after making a very liberal deduction for what their imaginations have added to the facts as they occurred. 
One of them tells how, when he landed in Fiji, he was condemned to be baked and served up at a feast. The oven was being heated for his reception, when the chief concluded to keep his prize a while longer, until he could be fattened. The man was released, but he ate sparingly of the food that was given him, and at the same time ingratiated himself with the natives, particularly with the chief, by showing him how to make war successfully upon his enemies. The result was he was saved from baking, became a man of importance, had fifty wives, and a goodly number of slaves. Another beachcomber named Charlie Savage became a man of great importance, and received the honours that were given to the most exalted chiefs. He assisted his tribe in making war, and was nearly always successful. One day, however, his fortune deserted him, as he was killed in a fight, and his body fell into the hands of his enemies. They cooked and devoured him, and made his bones into sail needles, which were distributed among the people in token of the event, and as a remembrance of the victory in which he was slain. It must not be supposed from this reference to cannibalism that the Samoans practised it. They seem never to have been addicted to devouring their enemies or anybody else, and in other respects were superior to their neighbours. Like nearly all these island groups, Samoa has been, from time immemorial, the scene of almost constant warfare between the tribes inhabiting the different islands. There are generally two or three claimants to the loan of Samoa, and the foreign consuls are kept pretty busy adjusting difficulties growing out of the local wars and involving the destruction of foreign property. On two occasions, the protectorate of the islands has been offered to the United States, but it has been declined with thanks. It has also been offered to England, but thus far has not been accepted, and the indications at the time of this writing are that Samoa will be a German colony before many months. The Samoans have been divided into two great factions, and it has never been possible for them to come to an agreement that could be kept for any length of time. Their quarrels have been aided by the scoundrelly white men just mentioned, and our consul says that if all these bad fellows could be driven out, there might be a chance for peace. It was these beachcombers that in the early days of the labours of the missionaries greatly hindered their work, and in several instances directly caused their deaths. As an illustration, I may mention the death of the first three English missionaries who went to the Tonga Islands. There was an escaped English convict living there who persuaded the king that these men were wizards, and that an epidemic which was then raging had been caused by them. The king accordingly murdered the good men at the bidding of the scoundrel. When the first missionaries settled in Pango Pango in Samoa, some twelve or fifteen of these beachcombers were living there. These rascals were so bitterly opposed to the missionaries that they tried to drive them away, and failing in this laid a plot to poison them. The story is thus told by Reverend Mr. Murray in his book Forty Years of Mission Work in Polynesia. The plot was well nigh carried into execution. The opportunity was to be embraced when the tea kettle was on the fire. Cooking and boiling of water are carried on in open sheds on the islands. The time fixed upon for carrying the plan into effect was service afternoon. The lad who attended to the boiling of the water was accustomed to fill the kettle and put it upon the fire before going to the service. Hence there was afforded the opportunity which our enemies sought. We had all gone to the service, and there was no human eye to watch their movements. The appointed afternoon happened to be windy, and while the man who had undertaken to carry the plot into effect was in the act of doing the deed, another who had been smitten with remorse struck his arm and scattered the poison. They had no means of obtaining more, and so the attempt failed. The man, who was instrumental in saving our lives, remained on the island several years, acting as pilot to vessels entering Pango Pango Harbour, and in 1841 he left in our missionary brig, Camden. It was not from himself that we learned our obligations, but from another white man who lived on the island at the time of the plot, and knew of it, though he had no hand in it. The occurrence led to the breaking up and scattering of the party of would-be murderers, as they feared the arrival of a man of war, and they could no longer trust one another. The Samoans are a handsome people, continued Frank in his journal, of a deep bronze or copper colour, and graceful figures. Some of them have adopted foreign garments, but a good proportion adhere to the native dress, which consists of fine mats or thick handsome tapper, made from the fibre of the mulberry or breadfruit tree. Their tapper is thicker than that of the Marquesas, but unfortunately the manufacture of it is diminishing year by year. 
and in a little while no more will be made. Foreign calicos are taking its place, just as in Tahiti and the Marquesas. Of course, the foreigners wish a market for the goods they have to sell, and therefore they encourage the wearing of garments or materials of European make. The most lightly clad Samoans were those that came out in boats when we lay at anchor and wanted to dive for money. They are excellent swimmers and divers, and when a piece of silver is thrown into the water, they are after it instantly and catch it before it reaches the bottom. The best of the divers was a girl who appeared to be about 15 years old. When she caught a coin, she held it between her teeth till she rose to the surface, and after taking breath for half a minute or so, was ready for another dive. The performance was exactly like what we saw at Singapore, Malta, and other ports, where there are always plenty of natives ready to dive for the coins that passengers throw over for them. The water is perfectly clear, and though it is fully a hundred feet deep, every object on the bottom can be seen. The girls are taught in all the branches customary in schools of this sort in other parts of the world. Sewing and other home duties are not neglected, and when the pupils leave the school, they are in a position to do a great deal of good among their less accomplished sisters. There is a similar school for boys. In our stroll about Apia, we pass the convent where four French sisters and as many Samoan ones have charge of the education of some sixty or more native girls, many of them the daughters of chiefs or belonging to the high caste families. As we passed the convent, the girls were singing very sweetly, and we paused to listen. It was easy to imagine that we were passing a school in Rouen or Dijon, so much was the singing like what one hears in France. The French sisters are said to be very much devoted to their work, and as the Samoans are fond of music, they readily receive instruction in singing. The girls are taught in all the branches customary in schools of this sort in other parts of the world. Sewing and other home duties are not neglected, and when the pupils leave the school, they are in a position to do a great deal of good among their less accomplished sisters. There is a similar school for boys, under the charge of French priests. There are Protestant schools in every village. The Catholics have made greater progress here than in any other of the island groups. They have between three and four thousand adherents, and among their converts are some of the most influential men of the islands. The representatives of the London Missionary Society claim about 25,000 followers, and the Methodists something more than 5,000, the latter having come into the field much later than did the London Society. Nearly all the adult population can read and write, and there is scarcely a child ten years old that cannot read its own language. There are groves of coconut trees everywhere, and we were not surprised to learn that the principal product of the islands is from the cocoa tree. 10,000 tonnes of copper are shipped every year to the markets of Europe, where the oil is extracted, and there is besides a large production of coconut oil in Samoa, which some have estimated as high as 2,000 tonnes. The Germans have extensive cotton plantations, and there are smaller plantations belonging to English and American companies and individuals. Coffee and sugar are cultivated, but the culture of these articles has not thus far been very extensive. As at Tahiti and in the other islands, it has been necessary to import labourers from elsewhere to work the plantations, as the Samoans are not fond of exerting themselves any more than are those of the society group. Thus far, most of the labourers have been imported by the Germans, and they come from all the islands where the German vessels trade. The Polynesian Land Company and the American Land Company have also made some importations of the same sort, but up to the present time, they have not equalled the Germans. While walking in the outskirts of the town, we were thirsty, and asked the native boy who accompanied us where we could find some water to drink. He immediately suggested coconut milk, and on our acquiescing he hailed a boy who was lounging under a coconut tree close by, and said something to him in Samoan. Immediately the second boy took a small piece of rope, which had been twisted out of cocoa fibre, and prepared to ascend one of the trees. By means of this rope and his hands and feet, he went up about as quickly as we could have ascended a staircase of the same height, and threw down several nuts, with which we quenched our thirst. Anyone who has been in the tropics knows how refreshing is the milk of the green coconut when he is weary and thirsty. We saw some crabs feeding on coconuts, 
which are about the last thing in the world you would suppose a crab could eat. Perhaps you'll laugh and be incredulous, but they really do eat coconuts and get the meat out without any assistance. Coconuts are their principal food, but they do not refuse other fruits, such as figs, candle nuts and nutmegs. This is the way they do it. The crab climbs a tree and pushes down a ripe coconut, which is easily detached, and he shows a great deal of sagacity in selecting only the ripe nuts. Then he comes down to the ground and tears the husk from the nut, and he always begins at the end where the eye holes are. If the tree is a sloping one, and there are rocks underneath, he climbs up again, carrying the nut with him, and drops it on a rock, where it will be broken. If the situation is not favourable for this performance, he digs into the eye holes until he makes an entrance sufficiently large to admit his pincers, with which he withdraws the meat. These land crabs are excellent eating, though they are rather too oily for a delicate stomach. They live in large holes which they dig themselves and line with the fibre torn from the coconut shell. They grow to a great size and sometimes a single crab will yield a quart of oil. They are distinctively land crabs and the natives say they only use the sea to bathe in. We asked our guide if all crabs in Samoa are good to eat and he answered that all land crabs were but the sea ones were doubtful, some of them being poisonous at certain seasons of the year. We went into some of the native houses and found them neat and clean. The roofs of the houses are very high and supported on low posts. Fred said there was a great deal of roof and very little wall, and this exactly describes a Samoan house. The roof is thatched with palm leaves, and when well and properly laid, will exclude the heaviest rains. The houses have no doors, mats being suspended at the entrance. The result is, the dogs and chickens may walk in when they choose, though in many houses... The chickens are not allowed to enter. It is the custom to place screens of plaited palm leaves around the houses at night, but they are always removed at daylight. In the interior of the houses, screens of cloth are suspended from the roof to divide the space into rooms where the inmates sleep. The couches are piles of fine mats of cocoa fibre, and the pillows are simply sticks of bamboo or other wood on which the neck, not the head, is rested. It is about as uncomfortable as the Japanese pillow, which it closely resembles, and is no doubt the cause of the early rising habits of the natives. All the cooking is done out of doors, and there is very little inside the houses that can be called furniture. In one house we found a group of young people playing a game which was something like our game of forfeits. They sat in a circle and spun a coconut around on its sharp end. When it fell, the person towards whom the three black eyes pointed was adjudged the loser. When they are to decide which of them is to do anything, leaving the others free, the lottery of the coconut is used to determine the matter. Warfare being more prevalent here in later years than in the society group, we found the games of the young men much more vigorous than at Tahiti. We saw a party of boys playing at Tatoga, or reed throwing. They had reeds five or six feet long with points of hard wood, and the skill of the game consisted in making the reeds skim as far as possible along the grass. In another spot, some young men were throwing spears at the stumps of trees, and in this game, the skill consisted in a youth's ability to force out the spear of someone else, while fixing his own in the stump. They have several games in which spears and clubs are used, and sometimes they are accompanied by a good deal of risk. Spears are thrown so as to hit the ground and then glide upward to the mark, and sometimes a man stands up armed with only a club, and allows half a dozen others to throw their spears at him in rapid succession. By a dexterous handling of his club he turns the spears aside, but it is evident that the slightest mistake may have serious consequences. When we come back to the landing place we thought we would take a ride in a native boat, instead of calling away the boat of the yacht, so we hired an outrigger canoe and were quickly paddled to the side of the Pera. These boats are not by any means new to us as we have seen them in Ceylon, the Malay archipelago and other parts of the world. The Samoans handle them with a great deal of skill, and I do not wonder that Bougainville recognised their ability by calling this group the Navigator's Islands. I forgot to say, added Frank, that we saw several cases of elephantiasis, which the natives called fei-fei, and is said to be quite common in all the islands of the group. The arms and legs of the victims are swollen to a great size, but happily for them, the disease is not attended with pain. The cause of fei-fei is as unknown 
as is that of Goita in Switzerland. Apia is on the north side of Upulu Island, which is the most important and the most populous of the group. It has an area of about 335 square miles and a population of not far from 15,000, or more than one-third the entire number of inhabitants of Samoa. In the middle of the island is a chain of broken hills sloping towards the sea, and these hills, up to their very tops, are green with verdure. The harbour of Apia is sheltered by a natural breakwater, but, though the principal seat of commerce, it is not considered as fine as that of Pango Pango, onto Twila Island, whither our friends proceeded when their inspection of Apulu was completed. The day after their arrival at Apia, they made an excursion to Malawa, about twelve miles distant, to see the college of the London Mission, which is located at that point. Of this journey, Fred wrote as follows. We hired a boat with six strong natives to row it, but they didn't have much to do, as the wind favoured us both ways, and the greater part of the distance we were under sail. The journey seemed a very short one, as we were busy studying the scenery, which is very pretty and changed every few minutes as the valleys opened to our gaze and revealed their wonderful richness of tropical productions. We kept a sharp watch for the college buildings, but didn't see them until we were quite close to the village. The fact is, the college is not a huge edifice, such as you find in Europe or America, but a collection of fifty or sixty one-storey cottages, which are built around a large square, with a hall or classroom at one side. In another respect, it is unlike a college in civilised countries, as each student is generally accompanied by his wife and family. We were told that married men were preferred to single ones, as the wife and children could be educated at the same time that the student pursued his studies, and they are useful afterwards in instructing the women and children in the places to which they are assigned. Every cottage has a garden attached to it, which the student is required to cultivate sufficiently to support his family. Any surplus stock he raises is sold and placed to his credit, and nearly all the students feed and clothe their families out of the proceeds of the garden. The college was founded in 1844 by Dr. G. A. Turner. It has educated more than 2,000 teachers and preachers, and in consequence of the system I have just mentioned is almost self-supporting. There are several thousand coconut, breadfruit and other life-supporting trees on the grounds, while the gardens are devoted to taro, yams, bananas and similar plants. Here, as elsewhere in the South Pacific, the banana plant is very productive and requires comparatively little labour to take care of it. The rules of the institution are very strict, and any student who repeatedly disobeys them is requested to make way for someone who will not. The bell rings at daylight for morning prayers, after which the students go to work in their gardens or at their trades, or fish in the lagoon in front of the settlement. At eight o'clock the bell rings again for bath and breakfast, and at nine it summons the classes for recitation and instruction, which continue until four in the afternoon. Then more work till sunset, when the bell calls to family prayer. After this, the students study by themselves till nine o'clock, when the bell tells them to extinguish their lights and go to bed. The majority of the students are Samoans. The rest are from all the islands of the South Pacific, whence they have been sent by the local missionaries. They study arithmetic, geography and, of course, learn to read and write. And besides these ordinary branches of education, they devote considerable time to the scriptures and to theology. Every Saturday evening there is a prayer meeting at which the students make short exhortations. On Sunday there are three services, morning, afternoon and evening, and there are Sunday schools for the children and Bible classes for the older folks. On the first Sunday of each month there is a communion service after the manner of churches in England and other civilised lands. We have not seen anywhere in the Pacific a finer assemblage of native men and women than the class at this college. They had bright, intelligent faces, and we were told that they were all so anxious to progress in their studies that they rarely infringed any of the rules of the institution, the one most frequently violated being that which required them to stop studying at nine o'clock and go to bed. It was getting quite dark when we returned to Apia and found our old quarters on the yacht, they wanted us to stay all night at the mission school, but there were so many of us that we thought it best to come back to Apia lest we might incommode our hosts 
by thrusting such a large number of visitors on them at once. You may be sure we slept soundly in our cabins, as we were all thoroughly tired out with the long but very interesting excursion. After a few days at Apia, the yacht proceeded to Pango Pango, into Twila Island, a distance of about 80 miles. Under her steam power she made the journey in a single day. Had she relied on her sails, it would have been far different as to Twila lies dead to windward of Upolu, and there are several currents, which add their force to make a passage difficult. Sailing vessels are often five or six days making this trip, which can be covered in a few hours by steam. Our young friends thought they had never seen anywhere a more beautiful harbour than this. Frank sat down to describe it, and after writing a few lines, said he would abandon the attempt, and fall back upon the account of Admiral Wilkes, who visited it in 1839. Accordingly, he copied the following from the history of the famous expedition. The harbour of Pango Pango is one of the most singular in all the Polynesian Isles. It is the last point at which one would look for a shelter. The coast near it is peculiarly rugged and has no appearance of indentations, and the entrance being narrow is not easily observed. Its shape has been compared to a variety of articles. That which it most nearly resembles is a retort. It is surrounded on all sides by inaccessible mural precipices, from 800 to 1,000 feet in height. The lower part of these rocks is bare, but they are clothed above with luxuriant vegetation. So impassable did the rocky barrier appear in all but two places, that the harbour was likened to the valley of Rosellus, changed to a lake. The harbour is of easy access, and its entrance, which is about a third of a mile in width, is marked by the Tower Rock and the Devil's Point. He might have added, said Frank, that there is a coral reef on each side of the entrance, with the surf breaking heavily over it, or at any rate it was doing so at the time we entered. Pango Pango is a splendid harbour, and could hold a great many ships. Its principal disadvantage is that the prevailing trade wind blows directly into it, so that while a sailing ship can get in without much trouble, she has a hard time to get out unless she has a steam towboat to help her. Dr. Bronson told the youths, that at one time the King of Samoa proposed to present the harbour of Pango Pango and an area of land surrounding it to the United States government for a coaling and naval station. But as the acceptance of the proposal would involve political relations that might be troublesome in future, the offer was practically declined. The commerce of Pango Pango is not as important as that of Apia, for the very simple reason that the island of Tatuila contains only 4,000 inhabitants, and their productive energies are not great. Copra and coconut oil are the principal articles of export. There are some small plantations devoted to cotton, sugar or coffee, but the lack of native labourers and the high cost of imported ones has kept these industries in a backward state. The first European vessel to enter this harbour was the Elizabeth, an English whaler commanded by Captain Cuthbert. He gave it the name of Cuthbert Harbour, but the appellation never adhered to it. Pango Pango is its native name, and this will probably be maintained long after Cuthbert is quite forgotten. The settlement of Pango Pango was so much like the one at Apia that we will not risk wearying the reader with a description. Suffice it to say the yacht remained two or three days there, and then proceeded on her voyage in the direction of the Fiji Islands. Before their departure they were invited to attend a Fa Samoa party, and the invitation was promptly accepted. Frank asked what a Fa Samoa party was. You might put it in French, said the American consul, by whom the invitation was given, and say a la Samoa, or to come to plain English, you may render it Samoan fashion. Fa Samoa, Fa Fiji, or Fa Tonga mean after the manner of Samoa, Fiji, or Tonga. It is a convenient feature of the language, and I can assure you the party will be an enjoyable one. The consul was right, said Frank, in telling their experience, as the party was a jolly one. It reminded us of the dinner at Tahiti after the native style, but was more like a picnic than anything else we have at home. In fact, it was a good deal of a picnic, as each person who was invited contributed something to the supply of eatables for the table, so that those who did not fancy the native dishes need not go hungry. The picnic ground was just outside the town, on a pretty bit of lawn, 
shaded by grand old breadfruit and coconut trees, and in the midst of a grove of bananas, which extended on three sides of the lawn and served as a sort of hedge. Banana leaves were spread thickly on the grass, and on this lowly table the edible things were spread, and what do you suppose we had to eat? We had sucking pigs roasted very much as they are roasted at home, or folded in taro leaves and baked in hot ashes. The steam from the green leaves cooks them thoroughly, so that the joints fall apart at the merest touch of the knife, or a slight strain of the fingers. They gave us pigeons cooked the same way, and I remark, by the way, that there are pigeons in the Samoan Islands, and it is one of the native pastimes to catch them. We had several kinds of scale fish, some cooked and others raw, and we had crawfish and prawns and Samoan oysters. But I'm bound to say I didn't think much of the oysters when I remembered those of my native land. They give us a salad made of the young and tender shoots of the cocoa tree, and very nice it was, and everywhere we turned there were bananas, oranges, pineapples and other tropical fruits. The dishes that most attracted our attention were the puddings made of bananas, breadfruit, taro and similar things. The consul told us that each of the ingredients was beaten fine and baked separately, and then they were all worked in together and covered with the thick cream from a ripe coconut. Coconut cream is wonderfully rich. When taken by itself, it is apt to cloy the stomach and disturb digestion, but used as a sauce for the puddings, it is delicious, but you must touch it sparingly, as it is full of oil. We sat on the ground to partake of the feast, and had a backache afterwards, just as we did in Tahiti. Drink, we each had a freshly opened coconut shell, and we took the cocoa milk as we would take tea or any other beverage in civilised lands. There were some cakes made of putrid breadfruit, but we did not touch them any more than we did the equally vile-smelling Limburger cheese, which one of our entertainers had brought along. The breadfruit is in season for about half the year. The natives store the fruit in pits lined with banana leaves, and thus stored, the stuff ferments, and soon smells so badly that any person with a sensitive nose cannot bear to come within odoriferous distance. When walking where there are any of these breadfruit pits, we always try to keep to windward. Taste and habit are everything. The Germans are nauseated by putrid breadfruit, while the Samoans are equally intolerant of Limburger. They are horrified when told how long game is kept in England and America before being cooked and eaten, and the merest taste of Worcestershire sauce would spoil their appetites for a whole day at least. The course of the yacht carried her near Massacre Bay, and Fred naturally inquired why the spot was so called. It was so named, replied Dr. Bronson, because of the massacre of several of the crew, together with the captain of the Astrolabe, one of the ships of La Perouse, the ill-fated navigator, whose death was so long a mystery. What were the circumstances of the affair was the inquiry which followed this explanation. The ships of La Perouse, the Boussole, Compass and Astrolabe quadrant, were off the island, and Captain Delange, who commanded the Astrolabe, sent four boats on shore to procure water. They carried sixty soldiers and sailors and were commanded by Delange in person. The boats made their way through the reef and reached the beach without opposition. While the work of watering was going on, the natives appeared friendly enough, until suddenly they gave a loud shout and attacked the Frenchmen with stones and clubs. Captain Delange was killed and with him eleven of his men. The rest escaped to the ships, leaving one of their boats aground. La Perouse endeavoured to get inside the reef to punish the natives, but after several days he gave up the attempt and proceeded to Botany Bay, whence he sent an account of the affair to his government. And that was the last heard of him for a long time. Yes, he sailed from Botany Bay with the Boussole and Astrolabe in March 1788, and for 38 years nothing was known of him or his ships or what became of them. Did the French government try to find out anything about their fate? Oh, certainly. They sent an expedition to the South Seas, but it returned without the least information. Then they sent a circular to ambassadors, consuls and other officials at the courts of all the powers of the world, and to scientific societies and commercial associations, asking them in the name of humanity to search for any trace of the missing expedition and offering to reward anyone who rendered assistance to survivors or gave any information 
about the fate of La Perouse and his companions, and it took thirty-eight years to get the desired information. Yes, all inquiries of navigators and others came to nothing, and gradually the fate of La Perouse was considered a problem impossible of solution. On the 13th of May, 1826, an English trading ship from Calcutta, the St. Patrick, Captain Peter Dillon, touched at the island of Tukopia in latitude 12 degrees 21 feet south, longitude 168 degrees 33 feet east. Find its position on the map, and then I'll tell what Captain Dillon discovered there. Frank and Fred eagerly scanned the map, and by following the lines of latitude and longitude, they speedily located Tukopia. It is between the Solomon and New Hebrides groups, and lies nearly due northwest from the Fijis, and a little north of west from Samoa. Captain Dillon, continued the doctor, found there a Frenchman named Martin Bouquet, whom he had known at the Fijis thirteen years before, and also a Alaska sailor who had landed at Tukopia with Boucher. The meeting of Dillon and Boucher was an interesting one, and so much was Dillon absorbed by it that he did not at first notice a silver sword hilt which the Alaska wore suspended by a string around his neck. While he was talking with Boucher, the Lasker sold the sword hilt to the ship's armourer for a few fish hooks. The natives that swarmed around the ship had many articles of European manufacture, and questions concerning them led to a remark about the sword hilt, which was speedily obtained again from the armourer. Captain Dillon learned that the things were brought from an island called Vanikoro, about two days' sail to leeward of Tukopia, and that the natives there had many articles of European manufacture which were obtained from two ships that had been wrecked there long before. Captain Dillon thought of La Perouse, and of the reward which the French government offered. Then he bought all the European articles which the natives of Tokopia possessed, and as soon as this was done, he made sail for Vanikoro. When his ship was under way, he carefully examined the sword hilt with a magnifying glass. There was a monogram, so badly worn that the letters were indistinct, but he finally made it out, J.F.G.P., the initials of the name Jean-Francois Gallo de la Perouse. He had found the hilt of the great navigator's sword, and what did he find at Vanicaro? said one of the youths eagerly. Owing to contrary winds, the doctor replied, he was unable to visit the island at that time, and returned to Calcutta without doing so. He reported his discovery and exhibited the sword hilt and other relics. The East India Company fitted out a ship and placed it under his command and he proceeded to Vanikoro, where he obtained a great many relics, including anchors, cannon, chains, and other heavy things, and learned from the natives the story of the wreck of the Boussole and Astrolabe. What was it? The ships were ashore in a severe gale. On one of them, every one of the crew was drowned in the surf or killed by the natives. On the other, supposed to be the one commanded by La Perouse in person, friendly terms were established with the people, and the crew were unharmed. They built a small vessel from the wreck of the larger one, and a part of them sailed away. They were never heard of afterwards. Those who remained on the island died one after another, and it is supposed that the last survivor perished only a few months before the sword hilt was found at Tukopia. And what became of Captain Dillon? The French government kept its promise, it created him a chevalier of the Legion of Honour, gave him a life pension of 4,000 francs, and appointed him consul to Tahiti where he remained until the establishment of the Protectorate over the Society Islands. Then he returned to England and lived on his pension until his death in 1846. Chapter 7 of The Boy Travellers in Australasia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A Fine Voice The Boy Travellers in Australasia by Thomas W. Knox Chapter 7 During the voyage to the Fijis, Frank and Fred informed themselves concerning that famous group of islands, which formerly had a dark reputation for being the scene of the grossest forms of cannibalism. What they learned was substantially as follows. There is really no such group of islands as the Fijis. 
The word Fiji comes from Viti or Viti, Viti Levu being the largest island of the group, which consists of something more than 200 islands and islets. The number is variously placed at from 200 to 250, and of these about 140 are inhabited. Viti Levu measures about 97 miles from east to west and 64 from north to south, and its area is computed at 4,112 square miles. Vanua Levu, with an area of nearly 2,500 miles, is the next largest, and then come Taviuni and Kandavu, the former of 217 square miles and the latter of 124. None of the other islands have areas equaling 100 square miles, and it would be tedious to name them all. Altogether, the Fiji group has an area estimated at 7,400 square miles, or about 400 square miles less than that of the state of Massachusetts. Its population is estimated at... Fred was about to write 200,000, taking the figures from a book before him when he was interrupted by Dr. Bronson. Wait a moment, said the doctor, and I'll tell you something on that subject. Twenty or twenty-five years ago, he continued, the population was estimated at fully that figure, and some authorities put it as high as 250,000. Of course, there's never been a careful census, and in the interior of the larger islands, it is not easy to get even a close approximation of the number of inhabitants. Since the occupation of the islands by the whites, the population has followed the general law of all Polynesia and diminished with more or less steadiness. In 1874 it was estimated that it had been reduced to 180,000 and in the following year fully one-third of this number died from the scourge of measles. Measles? exclaimed Frank and Fred in astonishment. I didn't know, Frank added, that this disease was a deadly one. It is not usually so considered in civilised lands, the doctor answered. Nor would it have been so here, but for the ignorance of the people and their persistence in doing exactly what they should not have done. In the latter part of 1874, Thakambau, king of Fiji, and his sons went to Sydney in an English man of war, to pay their respects to the governor of New South Wales. At Sydney, the two youngest boys took measles, but the disease showed itself in such a mild form that nothing was thought of it. On the return voyage in January, the king had a slight attack, but it was considered of no consequence, and on his arrival at Lavuka he went ashore at once. His relatives and subjects came to pay their respects, and according to custom smelt of his hands or his face, and thus took in the poison of the disease. A few days after his arrival, there was a meeting of chiefs and other high dignitaries from all the tribes of the group, and the same ceremonies were gone through. In this way, the disease was spread through the group, and when it developed, it caused the death of nearly every chief who had attended the ceremonial. All through the Fijis, people died by the thousand. In some instances, whole villages were struck down, and there were not enough well people to care for the sick or bury the dead. Medical directions were published and sent abroad as soon as possible, but the superstitious people had been told by some of the beachcombers and other scoundrels infesting the islands that the disease had been imported in order to kill them off and get their lands, and that the medicines of the white men were intended to spread rather than check it. The medical directions were ignored, some tribes who had become Christian renounced the new religion and drove out their teachers. In one instance, where a teacher died of measles, his Christian disciples concluded that it was best to follow the old custom and bury his wife and children with him, in order to propitiate the demon of the scourge. Why was the disease so fatal here when it is not so in our own country? One of the youths inquired. You are aware, I presume, the doctor answered, that care should be exercised in measles against taking cold and thus driving the disease to the lungs. These people are continually bathing and it was the most natural thing in the world for them to rush to the cooling streams as soon as the fever came on them. In this way, thousands doomed themselves to death. And besides, there came an unusual rainfall that converted great areas of country into swamps 
and rendered it impossible for the people to keep dry, even if they had tried to do so. As an illustration of the effect of bathing, I may mention the case of the native police at Levuka. A hundred and fifty men were seized with measles, and the officer in charge, an Englishman, immediately established a hospital and ordered those who were least affected to care for the rest. They were forbidden to bathe or allow anyone else to do so. All the patients recovered, except ten, and of these every man was found to have disobeyed orders and indulged in a bath in the tempting sea, which was close by. An English resident says that whole villages were swept away by the scourge. The dead were buried in their own houses, and to this day many of the platforms on which the Fijian houses are built are simply family tombs. The coast towns suffered more than those of the interior, probably in consequence of their being in more swampy ground, and thus more affected by the dampness. The measles were afterwards carried to other groups, where the effect was severe, but not so fatal in proportion to the population as in the Fijis. With this explanation, Frank put down the number of native inhabitants of the Fijis at 120,000. Afterwards he obtained at Suva the figures of the census of 1884, which were as follows. European residents, 3,513. Native Fijians, 115,635. Polynesian labourers, 5,634. Asiatics, about 5,000. And Rotomua men, about 2,600. What is a Rotomua man? said Fred, when the above figures were obtained and read aloud by Frank. Rotomua, said the doctor, is a small island lying in mid-ocean about 400 miles north of Fiji and recently made a British possession. The natives are a kindly race. The women are prettier than most other Polynesians and the men strong and of good size. They make excellent sailors and you find them in ships all over the South Pacific and even in other parts of the world. A gentleman who visited Rotomua told me it was no uncommon thing to find natives who had been in New York, London, Liverpool or Hamburg and they could discuss the relative merits of sailing and steam vessels with an intelligence not always found among white sailors. Though living in an island where nature is kindly and the wants of man are few, the Rotomua men are not unwilling to work. They are consequently sought as labourers in the Samoan, Tahitian and other groups and especially in Fiji. So many men have been taken from the island that the supply has been practically exhausted and the planters are compelled to look elsewhere. Some of the labourers were kidnapped in the manner described in our discussion of the labour trade, but the most of those who emigrated were fairly and honestly obtained. The outlying islets of the Fiji group were first sighted by our friends on the yacht, and in due time the peaks of the larger islands came into view. The Fijian archipelago is situated between the 15th and 22nd parallels of south latitude and the meridians of 177 degrees west and 175 degrees east longitude and scattered over an area of ocean some 200 miles from north to south and 300 from east to west. Its exact extent is not known as there has been no complete survey of the islands one is now in progress under the direction of the colonial government, but it will take some time for its completion. Surveying in Fiji is slow and difficult work, owing to the dense tropical vegetation that is found everywhere. The first island of importance, which was sighted by our friends, was Kandavu, the fourth largest of the group and containing something like 10,000 inhabitants. As they expected to see it later, they did not stop there, and the youths contented themselves by studying its well-wooded slopes and fertile valleys, and the towering head of Mount Washington, 3,000 feet high on its western side. The captain told them that Candavu was the stopping place of the mail steamers, on their way between San Francisco and Australia, as it was more convenient and less dangerous for them than either Suva or Levuka. He added that it abounded in fine timber, and was a favourite resort for whalers, in search of supplies and water. Steam was made as soon as Candavu was sighted, 
and in a few hours the pharaoh was at anchor in the harbour of Suva, the capital of the British colony of Fiji. It was selected in 1880 by a commission appointed to secure a site for a future capital, the former one, Levuka, having been found disadvantageous in some respects. Levuka is more centrally situated in the archipelago than Suva, but its harbour is not so easy of access, and a ship approaching or leaving it has more dangerous navigation. Levuka is on the small island of Ovalu, while Suva is on the south side of Viti Levu, which is, as before stated, the largest and most populous of the group. On shore, our friends found a prosperous-looking place when its age was taken into consideration, and Frank said it reminded him of a town in California or Colorado. There were half a dozen hotels, several churches, which represented the Catholic, Episcopalian, Presbyterian and Methodist faiths, a great number of shops and stores and many well-built warehouses, cottages and other dwellings. They went to the principal hotel before proceeding to call upon their consuls or make any acquaintances, and the proprietor immediately offered to show them the sights of Suva. He pointed out the governor's residence, the jail, hospital, custom house and lunatic asylum, together with other public edifices. Dr. Bronson suggested that there was every indication of a fixed community when so young a place could boast of a jail and a lunatic asylum, not to speak of the custom house and the hospital. We needed a jail here before anything else, was the reply to his remark. All the riffraff of the South Seas seemed to be collected in Fiji before the annexation, and there was nothing but the powerful arm of law with jails and other paraphernalia that could preserve order. They had been gathering here for a long time, I presume, said the doctor, and were most numerous just before the annexation. There had been a fair sprinkling of beachcombers and idlers, was the reply, ever since the islands were first occupied by white men. After them came men who wished to engage in planting cotton, sugar and other things, for which the islands were supposed to be favourable. There were some adventurers among them, but on the whole they were a good class of citizens, as they were nearly all of birth and education, and most of them brought some capital with which to go into business. But in the latter part of the sixties we were inundated with a different lot of adventurers. A few came with the design of planting cotton or engaging in some other honest employment, but the great majority were penniless fellows with no fondness for decent occupations. Many of them had left the Australian colonies to avoid arrest for swindling or other crimes, and there was a fair share of men for whom the prisons yawned for offences of the most serious character. Down to that time San Francisco had been the haven to which these fellows emigrated, but it was easier to go to Fiji than to America, and therefore Fiji got the benefit. I think I heard something about it at the time, the doctor remarked. Quite likely, responded his informant. About 1870-71, Fiji was a word of contempt in Australia. Gone to Fiji had the same meaning in Sydney and Melbourne that gone to Texas had in the United States 40 or 50 years ago. But now, under colonial rule, it is an orderly land, and life and property are as safe as in Australia or California. In the conversation that followed, Frank and Fred learned that the late King Thakombau, who died in 1883, offered the sovereignty of the islands to the Queen of England, under certain conditions. But the offer was declined. Another offer was made in March 1874, which was also declined. But in October of the same year, a deed of cession gave the sovereignty of the islands to Great Britain. A charter was shortly after issued, making Fiji a colony of Great Britain, and the first governor, Sir Arthur Gordon, arrived in June 1875 and assumed authority. The colony has been on the whole a prosperous one, though there have been periods of depression. Year by year the capabilities of the islands are becoming better known, and it would seem that there is every known kind of productive soil in Fiji. Its swamps will produce rice in abundance, and the other lands are adapted to sugar, cotton, coffee, sweet potatoes, yams and all other tropical productions, while in many localities peas, beans, cabbages, apples and other fruits and vegetables of the temperate zones are successfully grown. 
Frank asked about the coconut and breadfruit trees, and was told that the former was indigenous, and the latter had been grown there so long that it was practically so. The coconut tree was an important article of cultivation, and thousands of acres have been planted with it. For a long time the chief article of export was copra, but latterly it has been exceeded by sugar. In 1875 the export of copra was 3,871 tonnes. In 1884 it was 6,682 tonnes, or nearly double the amount of nine years before. As the young trees come into bearing, the exportation of copra will be greatly increased. The growth of the sugar trade, said his informant, has been very rapid, as you will see by the figures. In 1875 the export of sugar was 96 tonnes, and in 1876 it was 265 tonnes. In 1884 it was nearly 9,000 tonnes, and in 1885 10,586 tonnes. Molasses shows about the same increase as its first cousin, sugar, though the product of later years is not as valuable as some that preceded it, owing to the diminished price of the article. Cotton has not been a profitable crop on the whole, he continued, and the production has fallen off from 386 tonnes in 1879 to 150 tonnes in 1884, and only 45 tonnes in 1885. Many cotton bushes have been destroyed to make place for the cultivation of sugar. Coffee has been little, if any, more profitable than cotton, and many of the coffee plantations are now devoted to bananas, which are an important article of export. In 1875, less than $500 worth of fruit was sent from the islands, while the exports for the last three years have exceeded $100,000 worth annually. The other exports are beche de mer, tobacco, cocoa fibre, tortoise shell, wool, hides and pearl shell, but none of them amount to a great deal. The industries of the colony are somewhat hampered by restrictions upon the importation of foreign labour. In consequence of former abuses, the government is very severe, and some of us think needlessly so. Frank asked in what particular he thought the authorities ought to be more lenient. The labourers are engaged for three years, was the reply, and under the old regulations, a labourer could be re-engaged for another period of three years, if he was willing to do so. At present, the employers are compelled to return him to his home, even though he is desirous of remaining here for another term. This is the rule as to imported labour. If a planter hires Fijians to work for him, he is obliged to make his engagements from month to month. The probability is that coolie labour from India will in time drive out Polynesian labour. Why so? Fred asked. Because of the lower relative price of it, Polynesians must be fed, clothed and cared for by the employer, and consequently it is not easy to calculate exactly the cost of this kind of labour. The coolies feed and care for themselves, and besides they are better and more steady labourers. A Polynesian labourer costs about $80 a year, a Fijian one $85, and a coolie from India or China $95 to $100. But all things considered, the Asiatic is preferable to the Polynesian. There was further conversation relative to the labour trade, which has already been discussed in this book, and so we will not repeat it. Our friends then took a stroll along the Victoria Parade, a wide and handsome avenue, nearly a mile in length. Frank and Fred were interested in everything they saw, and particularly with the passing kaleidoscope of Englishmen, Germans, Americans, and other white nationalities, together with Chinese, Indian coolies, Fijians... Rotomar men, and natives of half the islands of the Pacific. Of course the Fijians were more numerous than any other race or kind of people that passed before their eyes. The Fijians, said Frank in his account of their visit to Suva, are considerably darker than the Samoans or Tahitians. Dr. Bronson says they belong to the race of Papuans rather than to the Malays, though possessing characteristics of both they are superior to the Papuans in physique and in their degree of civilization, but they have the frizzly hair and beard and the dark skin which indicates their Papuan origin. 
Then, too, they use the bow and arrow for weapons and make pottery, neither of which is characteristic of the true Polynesian. What struck us as odd about them was their immense heads of hair, some of them being fully three feet in diameter. Hairdressing seems to be one of the fine arts in Fiji, and the barber is a most important personage, though less so today than formerly. And how do you suppose they manage to get such enormous mops on their heads? Well, the naturally frizzly hair is improved by the barber. Each particular hair is seized and pulled with tweezers until it stands out straight, helped, of course, by the other hairs which have been served the same way. The hairdressing of a Fijian dandy takes the greater part of the time, and when he wishes to appear in specially fine style, he must be, for a whole day at least, in the hands of his barber. When the hair has been stretched out to the proper degree, it is wrapped with fine tapper, or imported muslin, and in this condition presents a very curious appearance. The office of barber to the king was such a sacred one that the royal barbers were taboo, or forbidden to do anything else. They could not even feed, dress, or undress themselves, or do anything whatever with the hands which were to be used solely on the royal coiffure. And yet there were plenty of men who coveted this honourable occupation, in spite of its manifest inconveniences. They are a polite people, at least we are told so, and certainly have seen nothing to lead us to think otherwise. The hotel keeper says the Fijian boys make excellent table servants, and the native policemen along the streets seem fully equal to any we have ever seen outside of a European or American city. Like all Polynesians, the Fijians are very ceremonious and great sticklers for etiquette. The chiefs and nobles are surrounded with ceremony, and one needs to be as careful in approaching them as in approaching the Queen of England or the Emperor of Russia. Here in Suva most of the people have adopted European dress, or a modification of the native one, but back in the mountains they adhere to their primitive garments. These are strips of cloth around the waist, and owing to this enormous array of hair I have just told about, they sleep on a pillow consisting of a stick like a thick lath, with legs four or five inches long. It is like taking a section of a two-inch plank a foot long and four inches wide, and resting one's neck on the edge. A Fijian pillow is by no means an inconvenient weapon in a fight, and very handy to have in the house. It is said the Fijians look upon lying as an accomplishment, and I have been told that one of the worst stumbling blocks in the way to their conversion to Christianity was to have them understand that it was wrong to tell deliberate falsehoods. They have improved a great deal under missionary teachings, and there is still plenty of opportunity for more improvement in the same direction. When angry, they are sullen rather than noisy. When a chief is offended, he puts a stick in the ground as a mark by which he remembers the cause of his anger. After a while, he may pull up the stick as a sign that his anger is relenting, and he is ready to be propitiated with gifts. We look upon this people with a great deal of curiosity, as we have all our lives associated them with terrible stories of the most horrible forms of cannibalism. Happily, this is a thing of the past, but it is by no means so very long ago. Even now the people among the mountains are said to indulge in it occasionally, but if they do, the extent of the practice is very small by comparison with fifty years ago. How it was adopted no one knows. The Fijians have a tradition that it began in an effort to prevent the incursions of people from other islands, and as a result of battle, which is quite likely to have been the case. In course of time it was not confined to enemies and foreigners, but extended to those who were offered as sacrifices in the temples. Sacrifices increased in number year by year until, as in Tahiti, a considerable part of the population was liable at any time to be offered up at the bidding of the priests or chiefs. In every village there were particular ovens and pots devoted to cooking the flesh of men, and the cooks were as skilled in the cannibal art as are the Parisian chefs in theirs. It was not uncommon to see twenty or thirty human bodies cooked at a time for a great feast, and the chiefs used to sacrifice their wives or their friends to gratify their tastes for this horrible article of food. 
When a chief demanded Bacola, long pig, the customary name for human flesh, his attendants used to rush out and kill the first person they met in order to gratify his wish. The Bacola was not eaten with the fingers, like other kind of food, but with wooden forks with long prongs, and these forks were taboo for any other purpose. Each fork had a special name, like an individual. The fork of one of the cannibal kings was named Undrowndo, a dwarf carrying a burden, and was presented in 1849 to one of the missionaries by Ra Vatu, the son of the king referred to. Ra Vatu talked freely about his father's love for human flesh and showed to the missionary the line of stones which registered the number of bodies he had eaten. One of the native teachers who accompanied the missionary counted the stones and found they numbered 832. Lakambao, the last king, was a cannibal until the latter part of his life, and his father, Tanoa, continued a cannibal till the day of his death. Here is a story that I find in Dr. Seaman's report of his visit to Fiji. A peculiar kind of taro was pointed out as having been eaten with a whole tribe of people, the story sounds strange, but as a number of natives were present when it was told, several of whom corroborated the various statements or corrected the proper names that occurred, its truth appears unimpeachable. In Viti Levu, about three miles north-northeast from Namosi, there dwelt a tribe known as the Kainaloka, who in days of yore gave great offence to the ruling chief of the Namosi district and as a punishment for their misdeeds, the whole tribe was condemned to die. Every year the inmates of one house were baked and eaten. Fire was set to the empty dwelling, and its foundation planted with taro. In the following year, as soon as this taro was ripe, it became the signal for the destruction of the next house, and its inhabitants, and the planting of a fresh field of taro. Thus house after house, and family after family disappeared, until the father of the present chief pardoned the few that remained. In 1860, only one old woman was the sole survivor of the Na Loka people. Picture the feelings of these unfortunate wretches as they watched the growth of the ominous taro. There was no escape, as they would only hasten their doom by fleeing into territories where they were strangers. When the Wesleyan missionaries came here in 1835, they found cannibalism in full sway, and it now seems a wonder that they were not immediately killed and eaten. They partially owed their exemption to the fact that the flesh of white men is considered insipid or tainted with tobacco, and therefore they were not regarded as desirable prey. Their progress in converting the native was at first very slow, but they were patient and determined, and in course of time they were rewarded for their efforts. At present, the great majority of the people are professing Christians. Cannibalism has ceased since 1878. Polygamy is rare, and idol worship is no more. After a time, the Roman Catholics established a mission, and since the annexation, the Church of England has sent its representatives to Fiji. In 1885, the Wesleyans reported that they had 906 churches and 347 other preaching places in the islands. 25,932 church members and 104,806 attendants upon public worship. They had 1,749 day schools and 40,313 scholars in these schools and they had nearly 42,000 children attending Sabbath school. The Roman Catholics have about 8,000 church members and the Church of England has a much smaller number, its adherents being principally Englishmen and other foreigners. So much for what the missionaries have accomplished in this group of Pacific Islands in the short space of 50 years. At present, the Wesleyans say the expenses of maintaining their missions in Fiji is about $25,000 a year and of this amount... $15,000 is contributed here, the balance coming from abroad. Reading, writing and arithmetic are taught in the common schools. There are higher schools in each missionary circuit, where persons are trained for the ministry 
and others can be educated. There is a central college of Navaloa, where a superior education, both native and English, is given to those who are preparing for ordination, and also to others who may desire it. The government has established industrial schools, where the sons of chiefs are taught reading and writing as in the common schools, and also instructed in house carpentering, boat building and other trades. I think I hear you asking how the English manage to govern the islands when they are so few and the natives so numerous. Well, Fiji is a crown colony and its affairs are administered by a governor and executive council. The laws are prepared by a legislative council of 13 members, seven of whom are official and six are nominated by the governor. In legal matters, the imperial laws are followed, except where there has been local legislation. All jury cases are decided by the judge, with two assessors. The system of trial by jury was abolished by the first governor, Sir Arthur Gordon, at the suggestion of Sir John Gorry, who was then Chief Justice. The natives have a system of local self-government, which is recognised by the colonial authorities. There are 12 salaried superior native chiefs exercising executive functions under the government, and also 26 native magistrates. Our friends found enough in and around Suva to interest them for several days. They visited some of the cotton, sugar and coffee plantations in the vicinity, examined some of the sites of the ancient temples of the Fijians, which were the scenes of horrible slaughters in the days of cannibalism and idolatry, went through some of the native villages where they were kindly received by the chiefs and did other things which were very natural for visitors to do. There was nothing specially new about the plantations, with the possible exception of the groups of labourers from the islands of Polynesia and Melanesia, some of whom were of races strange to the eyes of our friends. There were men from Tanna, from the Solomon Islands, from New Guinea and also representatives of other groups of islands, until the whole made quite a formidable list. The owner of the largest plantation that they visited told Frank and Fred that the men from the different islands would not fraternise with one another any more than will Germans, Irish and Negroes in America or England. They do not trust one another and their huts are in different groups in widely separated parts of the plantation. Many of them are cannibals, particularly the men from the Solomon and New Hebrides islands, and occasionally get into open warfare for the purpose of capturing somebody whom they can eat. This very distrust of one another is to the advantage of the planter, who could not easily manage them if they were united and harmonious. Fred thought the Solomon Islanders were the most repulsive looking of the lot, and their employer said they were treacherous and revengeful in addition to being murderous. In times past, before the establishment of the colonial government, they used to make raids on the villages and kill any unfortunate Fijian they met, whom they carried away and devoured. Of late years they have been restrained from this practice, but not without some severe lessons. The Tana men are not much unlike them, their informant continued, but that they are less treacherous and sullen and are better workers. They eat the flesh of men when they can get it, but they are also fond of dogs, cats, lizards, rats and flies. As he spoke, he pointed to a pen containing several puppies which the Tanner men were fattening and would make the basis of a grand feast on their next holiday. From Suva, the party went by a local steamer to Levuka. Colonel Bush, being unwilling to risk the pair among the rocks and reefs, which render navigation far from safe in these waters. They found the harbour of Levuka smaller than that of Suva, but in other respects equal to it, as the anchorage was good and the place well sheltered from gales. The barrier reef which forms the harbour is about a mile from shore and has two passages by which vessels may enter or leave port. Of course the removal of the capital to Suva was a severe blow to Levuka, but the place has a good commerce of its own and being more centrally situated in regard to all the islands of the group, it is in no danger of decay. It contains three or four hotels and several boarding houses, 
and its mercantile establishments are generally of a substantial character. There are Wesleyan, Catholic and Episcopalian churches in Levuka, several branch buildings of the government offices and a well-kept hospital for the use of such European strangers as may need medical attention. The founders of Levuka were not altogether happy in one respect, said one of the residents, who was pointing out its features to our friends. The hills around it are so steep that it was not practicable to extend the town over them. We could build our dwellings there, but it was out of the question to establish stores and shops where people must climb to reach them. So we extended along the base of the hills, and in some cases out into the sea, where we made land by filling in. You see, he continued, that Lavuka consists practically of a single thoroughfare, which we call Beach Street, for the very practical reason that it follows the course of the beach. Outside the town it is prolonged into a road that nearly surrounds the island of Ovalu and will completely encircle it in time. Two or three years ago we started to build a street railway. We made surveys and subscribed for the stock, but the government opposed the project and it was given up. Our friends found accommodations at one of the hotels and were fairly comfortable, or would have been if they could have escaped the flies and mosquitoes. These insects were numerous enough to form a veritable plague and seemed to take special delight in annoying strangers. A planter who was stopping at the hotel declared that the flies had sentinels stationed to give notice of the arrival of a stranger, so that all could pounce on him at once and that whenever the flies grew weary of their work, the mosquitoes came forward to relieve them. Frank made a sketch of a Fiji mosquito, while Fred took the likeness of a native fly. These works of art were laid carefully away where the subjects thereof could not reach them with intents of destruction or mutilation. Dinner was taken at the hotel table and proved, on the whole, a pleasant affair. The youths made several acquaintances among the planters, merchants and others who were stopping there. Frank and Fred added materially to their stock of information relative to the agricultural and other advantages of Fiji, and also to the mode of life among the residents. The dinner consisted of pork, salt and fresh beef, chicken, yams, taro and other vegetables, together with English and American preserves, and potted things that are found wherever Englishmen are settled in the Eastern or Southern Hemisphere. You may not think much of it when compared with a dinner in New York or London, said one of the planters, but if you go and live six months or a year on a plantation, you'll think a dinner here is the very height of luxury. Salt beef and occasional chickens and pigs are our only meats on the plantations, backed up by yams and taro in one unvarying round. Where we can afford it, we have potted and canned things, but they are expensive and very often cannot be had at any price. It has repeatedly happened that men who had been living on the rough face of the plantations came to Levuka after an absence of months and overfed themselves at the hotel table to such an extent as to bring on a fatal illness. After dinner they sat on the veranda of the hotel and enjoyed the land breeze which sets in a little after sunset and is considerably cooler than the day breeze from the sea. It is also free from flies and mosquitoes, which at this time retire to the sleeping rooms of the hotel to make ready for the arrival of the lodgers. On the veranda, the conversation was continued, and many features of Fijian life were touched upon. It's a pity you are not to be here at Balola time, said one of the residents to Fred, when the latter had explained that their visit was to be a very brief one. Fred thought the gentleman said Bacola, and immediately his thoughts ran on the cannibalism of the Fijians in times past. He remarked that he supposed those days were gone forever, but his informant answered to the great astonishment of the youth that they had the festival every year and it was something not to be missed. Then the gentleman went on to explain, and Fred soon ascertained the difference between Bacola and Balola. The Balola, or Balolo, said he, is a sea worm whose scientific name is Palolo iridis. It looks like a string of vermicelli, being little larger than the thread, and varying from an inch or two to a yard in length. It lives somewhere in the sea, no one knows where, 
On two days of the year it comes to the surface, and all the rest of the 365 it keeps carefully out of sight. The natives know exactly when it will come. It first appears in October, the date being fixed by the position of certain stars, and its second appearance is at the full moon, between the 20th and 25th of November. The worms are far more numerous in the November than in the October appearance, and hence the October one is called the Little Balola, while the November coming is the Great Balola. At the Great Festival the sea is covered in some places to the depth of several inches with these worms, which are red, green and brown in colour, and form a writhing and wriggling mass, not altogether pleasant to look at. They come a little past midnight, and when the sun rises they sink down out of sight and remain there until the next year. How curious, exclaimed the youth in astonishment. No one has been able to explain the phenomenon, was the reply, nor tell how and where the worm passes the rest of his time. Why he appears on these occasions and no other, or why he appears at all, nobody has yet found out, and you may be sure the worms won't give up the secret. The natives go out in their boats in great numbers, every native boat that can float is occupied, and the Europeans go along at the same time to see the fun. As long as the worms remain, every native is busy with baskets and ladles, trying to fill his boat with them. There is a great deal of excitement and laughter, as the people steal from one another and have as much fun as they can out of the festival. Then there are shoals and shoals of fish of all sizes and kinds that are feeding on the worms, and seem to understand that they must make the most of their opportunity. As soon as daylight comes and the worms sink out of sight, the people return to the shore, wrap the worms in taro leaves and cook them in ovens after their manner of roasting. The supply is so great that there is enough for everybody for several days, and baskets of balola are sent to friends in the interior, just as you send fruit and game in America. The stuff is not agreeable to European taste, but isn't so bad after all when you can conquer your prejudice against eating worms. To show the force of the religious convictions of the Fijians, said another resident, let me say that when the festival comes on Sunday, not a single canoe of the natives goes out, except those of the Roman Catholic Church members. The Methodists obey the religious requirements so closely that not a canoe will go on the water on Sunday, except to carry a preacher to church. You cannot hire one of these people to climb a coconut tree on Sunday, or do any other work that is not strictly one of necessity. What an immense change, said another, from the days when cannibalism prevailed throughout the islands, and when all public ceremonials were attended with human sacrifices. On the death of a chief, his wives and servants were buried alive with him, in order that he could have their company in the spirit world. When a chief's house was built, a slave stood in each post hole to support the post, and was buried there alive. War canoes were launched or drawn ashore over the bodies of living prisoners who served as rollers and were crushed to death by the weight. Life was held of no consequence, and parents who were ill or felt the weakness of age coming used to ask their children to bury them. A missionary was once invited by a young man to attend the funeral of the latter's mother. She walked cheerfully to the grave and sat down in it to have the earth heaped about her by her children and was much surprised when the missionary interfered to prevent the proceeding. And I have heard, he continued, of a young man who was ill, and feared he would get thin and be laughed at by the girls of his acquaintance. He asked his father to bury him, and the latter consented. When the youth had taken his place in the grave, he asked to be strangled. The father scolded him and told him to sit still and be buried just like other folks, and make no further trouble. Thereupon the youth became quiet, and the burial was completed. Can this really be true? queried the youth. The story is found on page 475 of Erskine's Journal of a Cruise Among the Islands of the Western Pacific, said his informant, and I have no doubt whatever of its truth. The evidence of the former customs of the Fijians is so direct and positive that it cannot be doubted. Fred lay awake for some time that night, his thoughts busy with the changes which had been wrought in the islands of the great ocean through the labours of the missionaries. Afterwards he watched the effect of the moonlight on the waters 
and while watching, fell asleep. End of chapter 7「and the party attended the Episcopal Church in the forenoon, where service was conducted by a clergyman who had recently arrived from London. In the afternoon they strolled to the native village outside the town, where they found some fifty or sixty Fijians squatted on the mat-covered floor of the neat and well-swept church, listening to a preacher of their own race. They were amused to see a tall man armed with a long stick with which he occasionally touched the heads of those who were inattentive, and sometimes his touch was far from light. Frank thought the idea would not be a bad one for churches nearer home, where worshippers had been known to go to sleep during the sermon. The preacher was a tall, fine-looking man of at least fifty years, and he spoke with an eloquence that indicated his earnestness and fervour. Of course his language was unknown to our friends, but they all agreed that the Fijian tongue is capable of much expression. It contains many guttural sounds that do not always strike the American or English ear agreeably, and the orator seemed to speak with more rapidity than is compatible with a clear understanding on the part of his hearers. When the sermon was ended, the preacher offered a prayer, and then a hymn was sung by the whole congregation. The air was a familiar Methodist one, but the words were Fijian. Whether the meaning of the original hymn was preserved, with the air no one of the listeners was able to say, and there was no interpreter present to tell them. As soon as service was over, the strangers were surrounded by a group of natives, and there was an attempt at conversation, but as our friends were totally unlearned in Fijian, and the vocabulary of the natives was principally confined to the word shillin, there was not much interchange of thought. Nearly every Fijian understands shillin well enough to pronounce it. He has a clear idea that it means money, and it is in this sense that it is used. Ask a native what he will sell his house for, and he will answer shillin. Ask him the price of a coconut, and the reply is the same. In the former case he would of course decline the offer, if actually made, and in the latter he would bring you twenty or fifty coconuts for the figure named. In strolling around as the congregation dispersed, Frank and Fred became separated from the rest of the party, but without any misgivings as to their safety or loss of way, as they were accompanied by several natives, one of whom invited the youth to his house. This was an invitation not to be ignored. It was accepted at once, and the man led the way along a path to where he lived. It was a hut of dried reeds lashed to a framework of poles and stood with a dozen similar huts in the shade of a grove of cocoa trees. The thatched roof was high and arched, while the sides were very low and had no windows. There were two doors on opposite sides, but the doorway was so low that it was necessary to stoop almost double in order to enter. In front of the hut was a lot of bones and all manner of refuse, and a couple of pigs were lying across the doorway. They showed no inclination to move as the master of the house approached, but on catching sight and possibly smell of the strangers, they were up and off very quickly. Inside the hut the floor was covered with plaited rushes, and there was a low partition of reeds, dividing it into two nearly equal spaces. One of these was used as kitchen and sitting room, and the other for sleeping, but there was no furniture in either place beyond three or four of the wooden pillows already described. In one corner of the kitchen was a rough hearth with some clay pots in which fish and yams were cooked. Partly by signs and partly by the words want eat, the host invited the youths to stay to dinner. They accepted, more to see how and upon what the native live rather than on account of having an appetite. Fire was lighted on the hearth, or rather it was stirred up from some slumbering coals. Fish and yams were put on to boil 
and in a little while the meal was ready. Frank and Fred made friends with the children, to whom they showed their watches, and made a few presents of silver coin as an indirect compensation for their dinner, and when the meal was ready they proceeded to enjoy it. One of the children had been sent for some banana leaves, which served as plates. On these leaves the fish and yams were dished up, and a piece of rock salt was brought out, together with a shell with which each guest could scrape off as much salt as he liked, and whenever he wanted. The youths made a practical demonstration of the truth of the adage that fingers were made before forks, though not without some inconvenience. To end the repast they had some ripe bananas, and of course the drink that accompanied the meal was the juice of freshly picked coconuts. As soon as Frank and Fred rose from the mats, the youngsters of the family attacked what they had left, and in a very few minutes nothing remained, save the lump of salt and the empty banana leaf plates. Then there was handshaking all around, and the visitors took their leave. The host accompanied them to the road leading back to town, and there left them, but not until he had pocketed a shilling which Frank tendered him. Clouds were forming in the sky, and the youths thought it would be prudent to return to the hotel. They did so and found the rest of the party on the veranda, waiting for the promised shower. In a few minutes the rain came down thick and fast, and the wisdom of returning was no longer in doubt. The shower was soon over, however, and then the sun came out as brightly as ever, though there was no apparent change in the temperature. "'You are in the best season of the year,' said one of their new acquaintances. "'It's fortunate for you that it's not hurricane time now.' "'We have here,' he continued, "'a dry season and a wet one. "'The former is cool and lasts from May to October. "'The latter is hot and lasts from October to May. "'During all the dry season and for a month at each end of the wet one, "'the climate is delightful, "'the temperature varying from 70 to 78 or 79, "'and the heat of the sun being tempered by breezes from the sea.' The mean temperature is about 80 degrees, the extreme ranges thus far recorded being 60 degrees and 122 degrees. From Christmas to March is called the hurricane season. The air is moist and sticky, the temperature averaging 84 degrees, with a humidity so great that one seems to be constantly in a Russian steam bath. This is the unhealthy season, and fevers and other diseases due to the heat and moisture are common. Frank asked if hurricanes were frequent during the season. Not at all, was the reply, but when they do come they are in dead earnest. From 1879 to 1886 we didn't have a really severe hurricane, but this is, I believe, the longest interval known to any of the European residents. One old settler told me there were several years when not a season passed without at least one hurricane. Are they very destructive? Fred inquired. I was on a plantation in which I had bought an interest, and during the whole of the month of March the weather was very calm and sultry. One day, towards the beginning of April, the wind turned to the northwest, which was quite unusual. Squalls and showers followed, and then the breeze freshened into a gale. Heavy clouds covered the sky, thunder sounded loud and long. The barometer fell and the clouds seemed to sweep just above the tops of the trees. Then the rain came in torrents, flooding all the level ground, and turning the brooks into rivers. Our party took shelter in the largest and strongest house in the neighbourhood, one that had stood through several hurricanes, and was thought to be proof against them. For two days the wind blew, and every hour it increased. By the second night it was a fully developed hurricane, whose velocity we had no means of measuring. The rain fell tremendously. The lightning was vivid and almost continuous. The thunder followed the course of the storm, and altogether the noise was so great that we had to shout to one another to be understood. Our house shook like a rickety birdcage, and many times it seemed to be half lifted from the ground. But it stood through the storm, and was the only one that did so. On the following morning, the wind had died down to a moderate gale, and we could venture out. The picture that presented itself cannot possibly be described with anything like vividness. Coconut and breadfruit trees by the thousand had been thrown down or stripped of their leaves.
Banana plants were in the same condition. The grass was levelled and covered with mud and water, and not a house in the neighbourhood remained standing. In the cotton fields, not only were the leaves and bowls stripped from the plants, but in many places the plants had been torn up by the roots and lay in heaps. In Levuka, many houses were blown down, vessels were driven ashore or broken to pieces at their moorings, and the whole windward coast of the island was strewn with wrecks. Many foreign vessels that were known to be in Fiji waters or near the islands were never heard of again, and they doubtless went down on that terrible night. At Makuata on Venoa Levu, the wind lifted a small vessel bodily from the beach and blew it into a native village two or three hundred yards away. The story of the hurricane led to various anecdotes of the South Seas, and in this way the afternoon was passed until dinner time. One man told how a ship on which he once sailed was driven before a hurricane and thrown upon a reef, where the waves dashed her to pieces. He was carried into the comparatively smooth lagoon inside the reef and saved himself by swimming, all his companions being drowned. Fortunately for him, the islanders among whom he landed were not cannibals, or he would have been condemned at once to the oven. The cannibals of the South Pacific have always regarded people shipwrecked on their shores a special gifts or windfalls, just as the inhabitants of certain parts of the coast of the United States are said to have regarded the cargoes of wrecked ships less than a century ago. Of course, he taught the natives many useful things and eventually married the daughter of the chief and became a chief himself when his father-in-law died. Another man who claimed to have visited half the islands of the Pacific endeavoured to prove his assertion by asking our friends to step inside for a few moments, where he removed his clothing and exhibited samples of the tattooing of pretty nearly every group. That clouded pattern on my left leg, said he, was done in the Kingsmill group, while those squares and fancy stripes on the right leg were put on in Samoa. My right arm and shoulder were done in the New Hebrides, while the left side was the work of the best artist of the Marquesas Islands, the fancy embroidery on my breast is of New Zealand, and that down my back was done in Tahiti. Truly, this man was a walking art gallery of the Pacific Islanders, only his hands and face remaining unmarked by the tattoo. When the inspection was completed, and our friends had left the man to resume his dress, Frank suggested that he would be a fine prize for a medical museum, where his skin could be preserved after his death. Dr. Bronson agreed with him, but the suggestion was not offered to the subject of the conversation. The party returned to Suva by the steamer that brought them to Levuka, and there a change of plans occurred. Dr. Bronson, with Frank and Fred, proceeded to New Zealand by the regular mail steamer, while Colonel Bush, with the pair, continued his cruise among the islands of the Pacific. Our friends were sorry to part with their pleasant companions and the splendid hospitality of the yacht but they did not feel justified in protracting their stay among the islands, since there is a general similarity of the groups to each other, although they may differ greatly in detail. Frank and Fred regretted that they could not visit the friendly Otonga Islands, the first destination of the pair, but they consoled themselves by reading what they could find on the subject. They learned that the Tonga group was discovered by Tasman and visited by Cook, who gave the isles the name of Friendly, on account of the apparently amiable disposition of the inhabitants. They have a population of about 25,000 and are further advanced in civilization than their neighbours of Fiji or Samoa. The Wesleyan missionaries have converted them to Christianity. Many of them can speak English and have learned reading, writing, arithmetic and geography and on the whole stand high in the scale of education. The products of the Tonga Islands are similar to those of the Fijis and the group is also subject to hurricanes, which are often very destructive. The principal island is Tongataboo, which is low and level, of coral formation and about 20 miles long by 12 broad. Here the king resides, and here too is the principal mission station. The king being an earnest Christian and a regularly ordained preacher in the pulpit. He wears European clothes, has European furniture in his house, employs an Englishman as his private secretary, and altogether is quite a civilised gentleman. 
He has caused good roads to be made around and across the island, and in other ways has made his little kingdom know the advantage of the lands beyond the seas. Fred was particularly interested in reading about a curious monument of former days that is to be seen in Tonga, and of which the natives have no tradition. It reminded him of the monuments of Easter Island, and he made the following note on the subject. It stands on a grassy lawn in the interior of the island, and is so surrounded by tropical growths that it is concealed from view until the visitor is close upon it. It consists of three huge stones, two of them upright like pillars, and the third resting upon them. This upper stone is 18 feet long, 12 feet wide and 15 feet above the ground. Resting upon it is, or was, an immense bowl of hewn stone, which is supposed to have been connected with some of the religious ceremonies of the people who erected this monument. But how they put the three stones in their places is an unfathomable mystery. Fred also wanted to see a famous cavern in one of the Tonga Islands, which can only be reached by diving into the sea, as the mouth is completely underwater at all times. A young Tongan found it while diving after a turtle, and he afterwards utilised it as the place of concealment of the girl with whom he had fallen in love, and who was the daughter of a chief whose displeasure he had incurred. He persuaded her to flee with him and follow him into the water. These women swim like dolphins, and she dived after him and rose into the cave, which is beautifully lighted by the phosphorescent rays from the water, very much as is the famous Blue Grotto near Naples. Here she remained for months, everybody wondering what had become of her, and also wondering why the young man absented himself so frequently, and always returned with wet hair. He carried her fruit and fish to eat, and a supply of mats for carpeting the stone floor at one side of the cavern. One day his companions followed him, and dived where they had seen him disappear. Thus they found the cave, but what became of its inmates is not clearly recorded in the history of Tonga. It takes an excellent swimmer to make the visit to the cave without danger of death from drowning. The entrance bristles with sharp points of rock, and when a native dives, he turns on his back and uses his hands to keep himself clear of these dangerous obstructions. The captain of an English man-of-war tried to enter the cavern, but was so severely injured against the sharp rocks that he died in consequence. We will leave the Pera to pursue her course among the islands of the Pacific, while we accompany Dr. Bronson and the youths on their voyage to New Zealand and Australia. The mail steamer, Zealandia, carried them swiftly along, and on the morning of the fifth day they were in sight of the shores which were their destination. From Suva to Auckland, the former capital of New Zealand, is a distance of about 1,000 miles, and there is regular communication monthly between the two points. There is also steam communication between Sydney and Fiji, about 1,600 miles, sometimes direct from one port to the other, and sometimes by way of New Caledonia, which lies a short distance out of the direct track. The Zealandia entered Huraki Gulf, passing between the Great Barrier and Little Barrier Islands, and holding her course almost due south. Then, through the Rangitoto Channel, she turned, and the harbour of Auckland was before her. "'Shall we have to wait for the tide?' Frank asked, as they passed Great Barrier Island. "'It often happens that we have to wait several hours for a tide when we're all impatient to get on shore.' We don't have to wait for tides at Auckland, replied an officer of the Zealandia, to whom the query was addressed. We can come in at dead low water and steam to an anchorage, or to the dock if we're ready to go there. The least depth is 36 feet at dead low water of the spring tide, and at the highest tides we have 50 feet. There is hardly a finer seaport anywhere, he added, than Waitamata, as the harbour of Auckland is frequently called by the New Zealanders. It has, as I've told you, plenty of water at all times, and its entrances are superb. Rangitoto Channel is the one generally used. The other is Haye Channel, and would be considered first-rate in many a place I know of. Rangitoto is about two miles wide, 
The section of the harbour between North Head and Cowrie Point is about a mile across and therefore is easily fortified in case we have to defend it against a hostile fleet. I see, said Fred, who had been studying the map, that the island is very narrow here. Yes, was the reply, it is only six miles across, and if you examine carefully, you'll see a good harbour on the other side. That is the harbour of Manakor, and there's a railway connecting it with Waitamata. It reminds me of Corinth in Greece, said Fred, as he continued the contemplation of the map. No doubt it does, said the officer in response. Auckland is called the Corinth of the South Pacific. Corinth is now having a canal made through its isthmus, and we hope to have one for hours in due time. The steamer made her way direct to the wharf, and as soon as she had made fast, and the gangplank was out, our friends stepped on shore in New Zealand. Under the guidance of a fellow passenger, they entered a carriage, and were driven up Queen Street, the principal thoroughfare, to the hotel they had selected for a resting place during their sojourn in Auckland. They were favourably impressed with the activity that prevailed on the streets and the general evidences of business prosperity. A Missourian would call it a right smart place, said Frank, as they were alighting from the carriage at the end of their drive. Yes, responded Fred, and even a New Yorker would treat its beautiful bay with respect, after seeing it as we did. Where did the city get its name? One of the youths asked Dr. Bronson. It was named after Lord Auckland, First Lord of the Admiralty, and afterwards Governor-General of India, by Captain Hobson, who founded the city. Captain Hobson was sent here in 1838 to organise a colony. He saw this was a good site for a city, and accordingly he established the capital here. It remained the capital until 1865, when a royal commission moved the seat of government to Wellington, the latter place being more centrally located. Of course, the Aucklanders were not at all pleased at the change, but their city is so well established commercially that there is no danger of their being ruined by it. From various sources, Frank and Fred found that Auckland had a population of nearly 40,000 within the municipality and 70,000 in the city and suburbs. It has, said Frank in his journal, handsome streets, a great number of well-constructed public buildings, such as post office, custom house, exchange, courts, government offices and the other paraphernalia of a well-established city. And it has also a fine museum, a public library and a park and botanical garden. No city would be complete without a cemetery and Auckland is not behind in this respect as it has a very pretty one and as the French say, it is well peopled. We were much interested in the Queen Street Wharf where we landed. It extends nearly 2,000 feet into the harbour and affords facilities for 30 or 40 vessels to discharge or receive cargoes at once. There are several other wharfs, including a fine one nearly completed at the end of Hobson Street. I have heard often of Hobson's choice and never knew exactly what it was. This city seems to have been Hobson's choice since Captain Hobson founded it. All I can say is that I shall have more respect for the old saw than I ever had before. You can get an idea of the commerce of the place when you know that about 250 sailing vessels are owned here of an aggregate burden of 20,000 tonnes and 65 steamers of 7,000 tonnes altogether. It has regular steam communication with Australian ports by the vessels of the Union Steamship Company, has a monthly line to Fiji and is a port of call for the mail steamers between Australia and California. The Northern Steamship Company of Auckland has a fleet of 13 steamers, principally engaged in coast navigation, so that New Zealand is well served by its boats. Of course, the port has graving or dry docks for the accommodation of the ships that need them. There was one 300 feet long and 42 feet wide, but it was found inadequate after a few years, and now they are completing another 500 feet long and 90 feet wide. This ought to be long and wide enough, but if ships go on increasing in size as they have been, it won't be a great while before another and longer dock will be needed at Auckland, as well as in other ports. While Frank was noting the foregoing points in regard to Auckland, Fred was writing a few paragraphs relative to New Zealand, and first he wondered how it came to be New Zealand instead of New England or New Britain. 
That's easily explained, said Dr. Bronson, by the fact that it was discovered by the Dutch navigator Tasman. The French and Spaniards both lay claim to a previous discovery, but the evidence they offer is very doubtful. Tasman was sent in 1642 by Van Diemen, Governor-General of the Dutch East Indies, to explore the coast of New Holland. He made the exploration and called the country Van Diemen's Land, in honour of the Governor-General, but the name has recently been changed to Tasmania. On this voyage he discovered this country, which he called New Zealand, in honour of the province of his birth. He also discovered the archipelagos of the Fiji and Friendly Isles, and returned to Batavia, having been absent only ten months. Look at the map, continued the doctor, and you will see that New Zealand is divided nearly in the centre by a channel of the sea known as Cook Strait. The two islands thus formed are known as North Island and South Island, the former containing 48,000 square miles and the latter 57,000. Beyond South Island is Stewart Island, which is triangular, and measures about 36 miles on a side. Taken together, the three islands remind you of Italy, and are shaped not unlike a boot, with its toe towards the north. South Island is sometimes called Middle Island, from its position between North and Stewart Islands. Cook Strait commemorates the great navigator who was killed on the Sandwich Islands. He landed here in 1769 and took possession of the country in the name of England. He made five visits altogether to New Zealand and introduced pigs, potatoes, sheep, goats and other animals and vegetables. Hadn't Tasman already taken the country for Holland, said Frank? No, replied the doctor, he did not set foot at all in New Zealand. He anchored in a bay in South Island, next to that in which the town of Nelson now stands, and had an encounter with the natives who opposed his going on shore. He lost four men in the fight, named the place Massacre Bay in memory of the occurrence, and sailed away without landing. How soon after Captain Cook's occupation of the country did the British government establish colonies? Not for some time, replied Dr. Bronson. In the latter part of the last century, in the beginning of this, many American and English whalers visited New Zealand, and year by year the knowledge of the country was increased. Visitors usually got along well enough with the natives, and were kindly treated. Whenever there were encounters with the New Zealanders, they were generally caused by the misconduct of the visitors themselves. Thus, in 1809, the captain of the English ship Boyd flogged and otherwise ill-treated a native chief, and the followers of the latter took a terrible revenge by killing no less than 70 of the crew and passengers. On some parts of the coast, the natives were for a long time hostile, probably in consequence of outrages that had been committed by whalemen and others. Some of their ideas of the white men were curious, the natives paddled their boats with their faces towards the bow, and when they saw the foreign boats coming to the shore, they thought the men had eyes in the back of their heads, because they rowed with their backs in the direction of their course. Some of them thought the ships were great birds, and their boats the birdlets or chicks. As in Polynesia, the missionaries were the pioneers of civilization in New Zealand. They came here in 1814, and previous to that time only one European, a shipwrecked sailor, is known to have lived among the natives. The Church Missionary Society established a mission in that year at the Bay of Islands, now called Russell. The mission party, consisting of Reverend Samuel Marsden, chaplain to the Government of New South Wales, and three other ministers, Kendall Hall and King. They were kindly received by the chiefs and held their first service on Christmas Day 1814. Eight years later, the Wesleyans established missions in New Zealand, and sixteen years after that, in 1838, the Roman Catholics did likewise. Then the missionaries were in advance of all government colonisation, said Fred. The Church Missionary Society, and the Wesleyans certainly were, was the reply, as the government did not send a resident official here till 1833. He had no power beyond that of writing reports of what he saw and heard, and was felicitously styled by somebody a man of war without guns. There had been an attempt to form a colony in 1825, but it was given up. 
and the sixty emigrants who came out from England returned in the ship that brought them. The mission establishment at Coro Rareca in the Bay of Islands became the nucleus around which a good many lawless adventurers gathered. The bay was the resort of whale ships, and in 1838 it was visited by 56 American, 23 English, 21 French, 1 German and 24 New South Wales ships. There was so much lawlessness and crime that a vigilance committee was formed, very much like the institutions of that name, which had been famous in California history. In 1837, continued the doctor, glancing occasionally at a book he held in his hand, an association was formed for the purpose of colonising the country, very much as India had been colonised by the East India Company. It was styled the New Zealand Company and was founded by Lord Durham, and after some delay a surveying ship was sent out, followed by several ships carrying emigrants. This was the beginning of the colonisation of New Zealand. The first settlement was made at what is now Wellington, the capital, though it was then named Port Nicholson. Auckland was founded soon after, and with the foundation of that city and the establishment of a government, the colony was well under way. It prospered for a while, and then, owing to quarrels with the natives, there was a long period of gloom. We will talk more on this subject by and by, said the doctor. Just at present we will use our eyes in studying the present, rather than the past. With this hint, the youths closed their notebooks and returned them carefully to the pockets where they belonged. The youths were curious to see a Maori, pronounced Maori, the first syllable rhyming with cow, and they had not left the steps of the hotel before their desire was gratified. Their fellow passenger from the Zealandia pointed out several of the Aborigines of New Zealand, and among them he recognised an acquaintance who greeted him cordially. Frank was disappointed at seeing the man dressed in European garb and looking altogether so much like an Englishman that he was not readily distinguished from the men of British origin. He was fully six feet high, muscular and well-formed, and had a slight tendency to corpulence. His face was darker than that of the average Englishman, and about the complexion of a native of the middle or south of France, and certainly lighter than the southern Italian. Frank thought it could be described as a light brown, but he was informed that these people are of different hues, and the Maoris have twelve names to indicate as many shades of colour. The eyes of this specimen native were black, and his hair was also black and slightly curly. As he talked, he displayed a fine set of teeth, and as dentists are unknown among the Maoris, it is to be supposed these teeth were natural. His features were regular and symmetrical, the nose having a slight tendency to an aquiline form, the lips large and well-developed, but not thick like those of the negro, and the mouth capacious enough for all practical purposes. After a short conversation with his friend, the Maori passed on, and then Frank learned that he belonged to one of the families of chiefs, and could therefore be considered as belonging to the aristocratic branch of the race. There are about 40,000 or perhaps 45,000 Maoris in New Zealand at present, said the gentleman. Two or three thousand of them live on South Island, and all the rest upon North Island. The families of the chiefs are readily distinguished by their superior grace and dignity, just as the aristocratic part of a race is distinguished in any other part of the world. When Captain Cook came here, the Maoris were savages and cannibals, though they had a patriarchal form of government and in several ways had made an approach to civilization. They practised tattooing, did they not? one of the youths asked. Certainly was the reply, and some of them still do so, though the habit is dying out. In another generation it will hardly be heard of any more. The Maoris are becoming assimilated to the European population around them, Many of them own houses and farms, have large herds and flocks, and there are several Maori merchants and ship owners. Many of them are employed by the English settlers and merchants, and you will find them on the railways and in the coasting steamers, where they make good sailors and are generally liked by their employers. Frank asked whether they were supposed to have come, and how long it probably was since they settled in New Zealand. They are of Malay origin, said the gentleman, and according to their traditions, 
which are unusually clear, they came here from either the Sandwich or the Samoan Islands four or five centuries ago, in a fleet of thirteen large canoes, which were followed by others. The names of their canoes, the chiefs that commanded them, and the place where they landed are carefully preserved in their traditions. They say that they came from an island called Hawiki, in the Pacific Ocean, and this is thought to be either Sabai in the Samoan group or Hawaii in the Sandwich Islands. Their language is so nearly like that of the Sandwich Islanders that the two people can understand each other after a little practice. They had no written language until one was made for them by the missionaries, and the nearest approach to it was a knotted stick by which the wise men transmitted the names of successive chiefs. They had a great many songs of love, war, religion and other things, but these are fast dying out, and so are their traditions and legends. Sir George Grey collected many of their poems, myths and fables and published them in a large octavo volume. And if you wish to know more on this subject, you can see the book in our public library. Fred asked if they were diminishing in numbers as rapidly as the people of the South Sea Islands had diminished since the advent of the white strangers. Yes, was the reply. But civilization has had less to do with their reduction than the quarrels among themselves. When Captain Cook took possession of the islands, it is thought there were 120,000 Maoris living here. Today there are less than 50,000. Before the whites came here, the Maoris were divided into 18 nations or great tribes, and the nations were subdivided into tribes, of which each had its chief whom it acknowledged. Each tribal chief regarded the head of his nation as his lord and obeyed his orders. The nations were constantly at war with each other, and then, too, the tribes of any one nation might be at war among themselves. The Maoris loved war for its own sake, vastly preferring it to peace, however much it might inconvenience them. Some of their ways were peculiar and quite at variance with European notions or customs. Shall I tell you some of them? The youths expressed their desire to hear more about this interesting people, and their informant continued. Their wars were conducted with great ferocity, and the vanquished were either enslaved by the victors or killed and eaten. That is not so very strange, said Fred, as the gentleman paused. Savages in many parts of the world do the same thing. Of course they do, was the reply, but they do not divide their ammunition and supplies with their enemies in order that they can fight on equal terms. Did the Maoris do that? Fred asked in astonishment. Certainly they did, on several occasions that are known to the white residents. While they were at war with the English, they used to send notice whenever they were about to make an attack. And they thought we did not treat them fairly in not doing the same. After the last war, one of our officers asked a Maori chief why it was that when he had command of a certain road, he did not attack the ammunition and provision trains. Why, you fool, answered the Maori, much astonished. If we had stolen your powder and food, how could you have fought? Once when one chief insulted another, the latter remarked that if chief number one had not known his own superiority in arms and ammunition, he would not have dared to behave in such a manner. Thereupon chief number one divided his fighting material into two equal parts and sent one part to his enemy with an invitation to war. Sometimes two villages would get up a little war, and after fighting each other all day, the inhabitants would come out of their forts towards evening and talk over the day's sport in the most friendly way. The next morning they would begin again and keep it up during the daytime to meet in the evening for a social conference. An old missionary used to tell how, in one of these local wars, he had known the defenders of a fort to send out to their assailants that they were short of provisions and the latter would immediately send in a supply of food. The same missionary said he had performed divine service one Sunday between two hostile forts, the inhabitants of which came out to worship, meet in the most perfect amity, and return to resume fighting on Monday morning. It is estimated, said the gentleman, that between the years 1820 and 1840, more than 30,000 Maoris perished in these intertribal wars. Many perished in the wars with the English, and many others have died in consequence of their contact with civilization, as in the islands of the Pacific, 
some from intemperance, and others from smallpox, measles, and kindred diseases, which were brought here by the whites. At present, wars among them have ceased. Cannibalism is unknown. Fully one half of the adults can read and write, and two thirds of them belong to the churches. End of chapter 8. Chapter 9 of The Boy Travellers in Australasia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by a fine voice. The Boy Travellers in Australasia by Thomas W. Knox. After a glance at the interior of Auckland, our friends naturally turned their attention to its surroundings. They were reminded of Naples, as Auckland is in a region of extinct volcanoes, one of which, Mount Eden, rises only a mile from the city. Following the advice of the landlord of the hotel, they drove thither, passing numerous villas of the well-to-do residents, with which the sides of the mountains are dotted. From the edge of the crater, there is a fine view of the city and its surroundings, and the view takes in several volcanoes. The Maoris had formerly a fortification on the top of the mountain. It surrounded the crater so that a whole tribe could be concealed there, if necessary, for purposes of defence. Frank and Fred traced out some of the terraces that formed the original fortification, and Dr Bronson said the works showed a good deal of military skill. Within a radius of ten miles of the city, no less than 62 points of eruption have been found, the greater part of them being only insignificant cones or hills. The largest and best specimen of the extinct volcanoes of Auckland is Rangitoto, which rises from a great mass of black lava, presenting a forbidding appearance. Unfortunately for the beauty of the landscape, the forest that once covered this region has been nearly all cut or burned away, and Auckland will doubtless regret in the near future the desolation which her settlers have made. The youths were anxious to see the famous cowrie pine, Damara australis, which is confined wholly to Auckland and is the most renowned of New Zealand trees. Before returning to the city, they were driven where they saw a single specimen, and before their departure from the district, they had the satisfaction of seeing a cowrie forest. Frank's note on this subject is interesting, and we are permitted to quote it. The peculiarity of the cowrie pine is that the trunk does not appear to diminish in size from the ground to where the limbs begin to spread. We saw some trees more than 200 feet high. They were 8 or 9 feet in diameter at the base, and had no limbs within 40 or 50 feet of the ground. They reminded us of the famous big trees of California, but were taller in proportion to their diameter. We don't think we ever saw more graceful trees anywhere. They haven't a great deal of foliage, and it grows in little tufts, very much like bushes. The wood is full of gum and is very valuable as timber. They told us it was the finest wood in the world for shingles, as the gum preserved it from the effects of the weather. A great deal of the lumber from the cowrie pine is shipped to other parts of New Zealand and also to Australia, China, Fiji and other places where it can find a market. Many of the sticks have been sent to England to serve as masts and spars for Her Majesty's ships of war and altogether the trade in cowrie lumber is very large. The result is a great deal has been cut away and the time is not very distant when the cowrie forests will be gone. While we were walking among the cowrie trees, our guide prodded the earth with a spear that he carried, and he kept doing this so frequently that we asked what it meant. He answered that he was looking for cowrie gum, and after a time he struck a hard substance, which he dug down to and brought to light. It was a lump of cowrie gum, and looked more like amber than anything else. In fact, it is said to be used very often in place of amber, for the mouthpieces of pipes and cigar holders, and for other purposes where amber is ornamental. It is worth eight or ten cents a pound, and the shipment of cowrie gum from Auckland amounts to nearly a million dollars annually. How do you get the gum? one of us inquired of the man who was showing us through the forest. 
In just the way you see, he replied, the gum cannot be obtained from the tree by any process of tapping or reducing from the wood. The tree falls and dies, and then, when it decays, the gum collects in lumps in the ground. It takes years and years for it to collect, and this little lump, which I have just taken from the ground, has probably been lying here for centuries. A new forest has risen where the old one stood, and has taken a long, long while to grow. We asked what other timber trees there were in New Zealand, and our informant mentioned the kahikatea, or white pine, the rimu, or red pine, the tatara, which is claimed to be impervious to the attacks of the teredo, and the tenikaha, which has a handsome, close-grained and durable wood, and whose bark furnishes a strong dye. Then there is the matai, which is much like the English yew, and is used for making furniture, the miro, which has a beautiful red fruit on which pigeons grow fat, and the kawaka, which has a remarkable leaf and a durable wood. There is a great variety of tree ferns, some of them reaching a height of 40 feet and a diameter of 12 inches or more. The most tropical of all the trees of New Zealand is the nikau, which is the only representative of the palm family. The ferns are more tropical than the trees and add very much to the beauty of the forest, though they impede locomotion in many places. As for fruit trees, there are very few indigenous to the country, but nearly everything that grows in the United States or England flourishes, and they have many things here that are strangers to us at home. Peaches, apples, apricots, figs, oranges, strawberries, pears and other fruits are abundant in their seasons, and some of them reach a luxuriance and perfection surpassing that of the countries whence they came. Near the Cowrie Forest we were shown a Māori pa, or fort, that is said to have been the scene of severe fighting in the early days of the colony. While we were looking at it, a man joined our group, and our guide told us he was a Pakeha Māori. You will wonder, as we did, what a Pakeha Māori is. Well, he's a white man who lives among the Māoris, and in former times before the colonisation, there was a goodly number of them, for the simple reason that unless a man was a missionary, he couldn't easily stay in the country without living among the natives. Pakeha means stranger and is applied to any white man, and a Pakeha Maori is a white man living among the natives. The tribes were very desirous of having Pakehas among them, for the reason that they could learn useful matters from them, but more particularly they could buy muskets, gunpowder, tools and other trade goods, of which they were in great need. A Pakeha who had trade goods was always welcome, but a man who had nothing was of little consequence and sometimes had a hard struggle to keep his head on his shoulders. With a judicious present of a few shillings, we got on the right side of this man and induced him to talk about what he had seen or knew among the Maoris. I have written down some of the things he said. I can't vouch that they are all absolutely correct, but his statements are corroborated by intelligent white men who have long lived in the country. Here we will close Frank's journal for a few minutes and listen to the Pakeha Maori. You see, I'm an old man. I came here when I was very young and have seen a great many changes. I was in Sydney and heard New Zealand was a good place for trade. So I loaded some goods on a schooner that was coming this way and in due time was landed in the country. At first I made my home with one of the whites who had come here before me and got on friendly terms with the tribe where he lived. It didn't take long to do it as the Maoris were very anxious to buy my goods. Frank asked what goods they wanted most. Muskets and ammunition was the reply. And for these they paid fabulous prices in wild flax, which was the principal product worth shipping away. They were constantly at war, and the tribe that possessed the white man's weapons could destroy any tribe that was without them. This happened in many cases, and whole tribes who were without guns were destroyed by their more fortunate adversaries. They were literally eaten up, as the natives were cannibals in those times. 
To get muskets, they impoverished themselves, neglecting their agriculture in order to gather flax to buy them with, and literally starving themselves. Many died of starvation in consequence, and in another way muskets proved the death of those who owned them. In the times of clubs and spears, the Maoris had their paths and villages on high hills, where the air was pure and the ground dry. When they got muskets, they moved into the low ground, where they were carried off by the dampness and its consequent fevers. I have known whole villages and tribes killed in this way, so that not one man, woman or child remained. The musket was as fatal to those who owned it as to those who did not. It was deadly either way. Now about some of the customs of the Maoris. They used to be tattooed very finely, and some of the fighting men were beautiful to look at. The warriors used to bring back the heads of those they killed in battle, and some of the traders got to buying these heads provided they were finely tattooed. They gave a musket for a good head, and as soon as this was known, some of the tribes began to make war on others, just for the sake of getting tattooed heads to sell. You may think it strange, gentlemen, said the Bakeha, but I've known the head of a live man to be sold and paid for beforehand, and afterwards honestly delivered according to the agreement. And one time, when the heads of warriors were not equal to the demand for them, some of the chiefs tattooed the faces of several slaves, whom they intended to kill whenever the traders arrived who had agreed to buy the heads. But the slaves were not faithful to their masters, as they all ran away into the bushes, just as the inflammation in their faces was passing away, and they were getting in good condition to be marketable. They had the taboo in its most rigid form here, he continued, but as you probably learned all about it in the South Sea Islands, I won't take your time to talk about it. Another curious custom of the Maoris was the muru. The word means plunder, and some folks might call it robbery, which it amounted to, though it was the custom and practically the law of the country. If a man's child fell into the fire and was severely or perhaps fatally burned, he was plundered of nearly everything he possessed. And the same was the case of his canoe upset while he was fishing, or any other accident happened to him. The people of the tribe assembled and gave him notice that they would be there for the Muru on a particular day. He prepared a great feast for them, and after the feast they sacked his house and carried away pretty nearly everything he had. Sometimes he did not have enough left to live upon, but he had the opportunity of getting even by joining in a Muru against somebody else. These performances were never opposed, and in fact a man would feel insulted if a serious accident of any kind happened to him, and no notice was taken of it. The greater the robbery, the greater the honour conferred upon the victim. If a man killed another through malice and with deliberate intent, the act was generally considered of no consequence, or it might even be meritorious. If it was his own slave that he killed, it was considered his personal affair entirely. If the victim was of another tribe, it was a matter of tribal revenge or retaliation, and if of his own tribe he would be defended by his family or section, and nothing came of it. But if he killed a man of his own tribe by accident, such as the discharge of a gun, then the law of Maru had full force, and the man and all his relatives were plundered of everything they possessed. Fred asked if the Maoris were given to the ordinary kind of thieving, like most savage nations. Much less than you might suppose was the reply. Of course there were pilferers, but on the whole private property was pretty safe from burglary and sneak thieving. The Maru gave an opportunity for plundering, and so did the warfare between the tribes. But a man could exempt himself from the Maru if he wished, by giving up all claims to its advantages on his own account. When I first came to New Zealand I was the subject of a Maru, and afterwards joined in one upon a Maori friend. But I found so many disadvantages, losing so much more than I gained, that I stipulated to have nothing to do with these affairs in future. In actual honesty, the Maoris have been injured by their contact with Europeans. They will steal and do other improper things more than formerly, but against this we must offset the abolition of slavery, cannibalism, tribal wars, polygamy and many of their superstitious and cruel practices. 
When anything is stolen from you, the chief can recover it, and will do so if you apply to him. Custom requires that you should tell him to keep it as a reward for his trouble, and so you don't gain much by the recovery of the plunder. They were not favoured by nature, continued their historian, as they did not have the breadfruit, banana and coca tree to supply them with food, and they did not even have the pig until it was given to them by Captain Cook. Dogs and rats were their only quadrupeds, and they ate both. The native dogs are extinct, as the Maoris did not care to preserve them when pigs became plentiful. It used to be the custom to make human sacrifices on the death of a chief. Prisoners of war were used for this purpose, their blood being sprinkled on the grave and the flesh roasted and eaten. There was a grand feast at a funeral, and even now this custom is kept up, though they have no longer any human sacrifices. The festivities at a Maori funeral are very much like those of an Irish wake, and something like an Arab burial ceremony. They eat and drink all they can get, and the mourning is performed by the women, who howl and cry for hours, simply because it is the custom to do so. As the time of our friends was limited, they bade adieu to the Pakea Maori, and left him to meditate upon the changes that had taken place since his advent into New Zealand. He might have told you, said their guide, that the native rat has been killed off by the European one, which was introduced from ships, and the European housefly has driven away the native blue blowfly. The foreign clover is killing the ferns, and European grasses generally are supplanting the native ones very rapidly. The English sparrow has become very common in New Zealand and will doubtless destroy some of the native birds. Fred asked about the birds of the country, but his informant could not describe them with any degree of accuracy. Later the youth learned that there are 136 varieties in all, of which 73 are land birds. One of these, the Apteryx, or Kiwi, is wingless and lives in the mountains. He is very scarce and only rarely captured or even seen. There are six varieties of parrots and two of falcons, one about the size of a pigeon and the other a very active and industrious sparrowhawk. There is one owl and there is a blackbird, which is called the parson bird by the settlers, for the reason that it has two white feathers under its chin, like the ends of a clergyman's necktie. Fred asked if New Zealand was not the home of the now extinct Dinomis, the largest bird of which we have any positive knowledge. Yes, replied his informant. The bird was called Moa by the natives, and it is pretty clearly established that he was abundant when the Maoris came here, but was wiped out of existence some two hundred years ago. Skeletons of the moa have been found and show that the largest of these birds must have attained a height of 14 to 16 feet. Were they dangerous was the very natural query which followed. Not by any means. They were wingless and belonged to the ostrich family and the naturalists say they were stupid birds that could easily fall a prey to man. This fact accounts for their extinction in the first two or three centuries of the presence of the Maoris in New Zealand. It is fortunate that their skeletons have been preserved in the earth, so that we can know positively that such great birds existed. How do you know the Maoris lived upon these birds? Partly through their traditions, and partly from the discovery of many of the bones of the mower, in the ovens and in the heaps of rubbish around the ruins of ancient villages. The natives devoured any birds they could catch, parrots, pigeons, parson birds, anything and everything edible was legitimate food. Those that dwelt on the coast lived chiefly on a fish diet, and those in the interior made annual or more frequent migrations to the seaside for purposes of fishing. The rivers abound in eels, and they grow to an enormous size. I have seen eels weighing 50 pounds each, and I've heard of larger ones. Frank asked what the clothing of the natives was made of before the Europeans came to the country. It was made from the fibre of the flax, was the reply. There are several kinds of flax, and it grows everywhere and near every village. Not only did it supply the material for garments, but for nets, baskets, lines, mats, dishes, cordage and other things. 
They used cords made from it for binding the walls and roofs of their houses together, and thus made it serve in place of nails. Great quantities of flax are raised here nowadays, as you will understand when you know there are some forty and odd flax mills in the colony, and considerable flax is exported every year. Most of the Maoris that you will see during your stay in New Zealand wear clothes of European style, as they find them more convenient than the cloaks and mats of former days. On ceremonial occasions the old finery is displayed, and the cloaks of some of the chiefs are really magnificent. Cloaks and mats or blankets were the ordinary dress, one mat being wrapped around the waist and the other thrown over the shoulder. Men wore their mats on the right shoulder and women on the left, and they sometimes adorned their heads with the gayest feathers they could find. Children went naked in their early years, except in the coldest weather, when they wrapped themselves in any old garments they could lay hands on. The youths learned many other things about the Maoris, but we have not room for all the notes they made on the subject. Frank asked particularly about the marriage ceremonies of the natives, probably for the information of his young lady friends at home. He learned that children might be betrothed by their parents when very young, or if not so betrothed, they could marry very much as in civilised lands. Sometimes the parents and families, and more frequently the whole tribe, discussed any proposed match and made all sorts of hindrances to it. Courtship was begun by the girl quite as often as by the young man, and when marriage was decided there were great preparations for a festivity, and the bride and bridegroom were provided with new mats and many other articles of household use. The funny part of the business was that during the marriage feast everything movable was carried away by the friends, under the law of Muru already described. The young couple started in life with nothing except the clothes they wore and the house that had been built for them. During their stay at Auckland our friends visited some of the islands in the bay, including that of Kawar, where Sir George Grey, a former governor of New Zealand, has a fine residence. The house is quite English in appearance and character and contains a good museum of Maori and other curiosities, the grounds around the house abound in pheasants of several kinds from Europe and Asia, kangaroos from Australia, tree kangaroos from New Guinea, and several members of the deer family. Near Kaur, they saw a fleet of boats manned by Maoris engaged in the capture of sharks. The creatures they pursued were not the ordinary shark, which is abundant in New Zealand waters, but a smaller variety, measuring about six feet in length. As the sharks were hauled into the boats, they were killed by sharp blows upon the nose, and then flung into the hold. When a boat was filled, it proceeded to an island, where the prizes were hung up to dry, and Frank was told that from twelve to twenty thousand of these sharks are taken in the bay of Waitamata every year, and either dried for winter food, or eaten fresh. Out of curiosity, our friends took a luncheon of shark steak, which had been baked on a hot stone, after the native fashion. They found it palatable, but rather tasteless, and so dry that Fred suggested oiling each mouthful, or smothering it with butter. It was unanimously voted that shark with the Maoris was not half as enjoyable as salmon with the Indians of the Columbia River, or shad with the fishermen of Delaware Bay. More palatable than shark steak were the oysters which abound in the bay. The island of Kawar has a coastline of about 30 miles, and all around it there are oyster beds, some of them of great extent. Not only do the oysters grow on the rocks and in the water, but they cling to the overhanging limbs of the trees, and grow there quite contented with their immersion of a few hours, twice a day during the rising of the tide. Frank and Fred found the oysters of good flavour, and soon became quite expert at opening the shells with the oyster knives which were opportunely brought along in the boat. Don't fail to visit the gold mines and the hot lake district, was the injunction repeatedly made to Dr. Bronson and his young companions. As soon as they had exhausted the sights of Auckland and its neighbourhood, they proceeded to follow the foregoing advice. First in order were the Thames goldfields. A steamer carried them in five hours from Auckland to Grahamstown, and as soon as they were on shore, they began their inspection of the mines. There are no placer diggings here, 
the mining being almost entirely confined to the veins of quartz in the mountains, which rise abruptly from the shore of the bay on which Grahamstown is built. For this reason, Grahamstown, which takes its name from Robert Graham, its founder, has a more permanent and substantial appearance than the ordinary town in a newly opened mining country. It lies along the shore of the bay, and the numerous reduction works, foundries, and similar establishments were suggestive of a manufacturing centre rather than a mining one, only a few years old. Dr Bronson had a letter of introduction to a gentleman interested in one of the larger mines, and the trio of travellers were at once made welcome. Clad in appropriate costumes, they were taken into the mine, where they walked a long distance through a tunnel, and were then conducted through a perfect maze of shafts and levels, where the workmen were busily occupied in removing the auriferous rock, which was carried directly to the reduction works, where it was crushed and the precious metal extracted. The gold contains a large amount, 30% of silver, and consequently has an appearance of pallor when turned out from the retorts. As the work of gold mining has been described elsewhere in the wanderings of the boy travellers, it is hardly necessary to give it here, the processes of mining and reduction being practically the same all over the world. Frank and Fred obtained the following information relative to gold mining in New Zealand, and especially in the region now under consideration. Gold mining in New Zealand properly dates from 1861, when gold was discovered by Mr Gabriel Reed at Tuapika in the province of Otago. The existence of the precious metal was known nine or ten years before that date, it having been found at Coromandel by a Mr Ring, who reported his discovery to the authorities at Auckland. Since 1861 it has been found in many places, and is now an important industry of the country. Some of the mines are wholly alluvial, or placer, diggings, others are wholly quartz mines, which are called reefs in New Zealand and Australia, and others are combinations of alluvial and quartz mining. With the enlightenment of some of my younger readers, I will here explain that alluvial, or placer, mines are those where the gold is found in the earth or soil, and is separated from it by washing. Quartz mines are those where the gold is in the ledges of the mountains and requires to be removed by tunnelling or blasting, or both. The rock containing the rock must be crushed to powder, and the gold separated from the powder by washing and mingling it with quicksilver. Quartz mining requires a great deal of money to carry it on, so much indeed that it is generally conducted by companies, and these companies, it is proper to say, very often take more from the pockets of the stockholders than they do from the mines. Alluvial diggings are the resort of the poor man who needs only pick, shovel and pan to set him up in business. During the year ending March 31st, 1886, the mines of New Zealand yielded 233,068 ounces of gold, which was valued at more than four millions of dollars. At least this was the amount entered at the Custom House for exportation. Some was doubtless absorbed in the colony, but no one can tell how much. The yield of the Thames district for the same time was 61,939 ounces, or more than one-fourth the entire amount for the colony. During the month of May 1886, 3,039 ounces of gold were taken from 2,574 tonnes of rock. Some of the mines have paid good dividends to their owners, but others have never made any returns. The ups and downs of mining in New Zealand are about the same as in other parts of the world. There are nearly 500 mining companies registered in New Zealand, with a paid-up capital of about $10 million. Down to the end of 1885, more than $200 million worth of gold had been exported from New Zealand, so that there can be no question of the importance of the colony as a mining region. According to the official returns, there are more than 11,000 men engaged in mining. 2,000 of these are quartz miners, and the rest, including 3,000 Chinese, are in the placer mines. The placer mines do not confine themselves to the valleys of the rivers among the mountains, 
but seek gold along the west shore, where they find it under the boulders and other stones embedded in the sand of the beaches. The popular idea is that this gold is washed up from the sea during severe gales. The scientific men say it is really washed up by the lifting power of the waves on the sand that has been brought down by the rivers and drifted along the shore. Some of this gold is obtained by washing the sands in sluice boxes, just as in operations among the mountains, and deposits or pockets are occasionally discovered in the sand under the loose stones. Sometimes these deposits are of considerable value, and we have been told of a miner who found a single pocket containing nearly 30 ounces of gold. Similar pockets exist in the mountains, and it is the height of a miner's ambition to find a well-filled one and secure its contents without anybody's help. The alluvial mines in North Island are less extensive than those of South Island. It is estimated that these mines cover an area of 20,000 square miles in South Island alone, and as very little capital is required for working them, they are more popular than the others. The principal quartz mines are in the Coromandel and Thames districts. The reefs have been prospected to six or 800 feet below the sea level, and also to a height of 2,000 feet above it. In some places the rock has yielded 600 ounces to the ton. At least it has assayed to that extent. But the amount obtained upon working it in quantities is far less. Of course, such rock as this is a rare exception in New Zealand as everywhere else. In the province of Otago there are rich reefs, and in some places gold has been found at elevations of six and 7,000 feet above the sea. The highest mine in New Zealand is on the summit of Advance Peak, near Lake Wakatipu in South Island. The mines have been beneficial to the country in two ways, first by the yield of gold, and secondly by attracting attention and emigration to New Zealand. Like the colonies of Australia, New Zealand offers inducements to emigrants and is very desirous of promoting emigration from the overcrowded countries of the old world. An agent general is maintained in London and a vast amount of printed matter setting forth the advantages of the colony to actual settlers is issued annually from his office. Emigrants with families are carried to New Zealand at a reduced rate of fare and at one time they were transported almost free of charge. So anxious was the colonial government to increase its population. The colony now has nearly, if not quite, 600,000 inhabitants, which is certainly a good showing when we remember that the settlement had its beginning in 1840, when its first governor came out from England. Our friends remained at Grahamstown over Sunday and observed a state of affairs which was an improvement over that of American mining towns in general on the first day of the week. All work was suspended and the whole population turned out in its best clothes. There are churches of nearly every denomination at Grahamstown and all were well filled with worshippers. One of the churches has a stained glass window which costs some $1,500, certainly an unusual sight for a mining town. Monday was spent among the hills and in the mines of the Thames and the youths retired to bed that night thoroughly wearied with the exertions of the day. On Tuesday, the party returned to Auckland and immediately arranged for a visit to the Hoft Lake district. The trip was planned as follows. The heavy baggage was sent by steamer to Tauranga, which is on the east coast, and the nearest port to the district they were to visit. Then, with only their handbags and some rough garments and necessities for mountain travel, the trio proceeded by rail, coach and horseback to their destination. By this plan they were unable to see the country and avoid travelling the same route twice over. The route for the ease-loving tourist is from Turanga by coach to the Hot Lakes, a distance of about 50 miles and back again over the same route. It is proper to say that travellers who come as far as New Zealand for the sake of sightseeing are greatly disinclined to repetition and nearly all visitors go by one route and return over another. The government has established a sanatorium and laid out a town in the centre of the Hot Lake District. It is building a railway from Oxford to this town 
and the promise is confidently made that by the end of 1888, travellers may go by train from Auckland, direct to the hot lakes, without the fatigue of a coach ride over the present rough road. We had a charming ride, said Frank, over the railway to Oxford, where we took the coach in the direction of the famous region of New Zealand geezers. Much of the country through which the railway passes resembles England, both in scenery and products. English fruit trees grow well here, and English grasses seem adapted to the soil. American pines have been introduced, and are doing well. They make a pleasing contrast to the New Zealand wattle tree and cabbage palm, and the ferns which abound everywhere. The country is thinly settled, but will undoubtedly support a large population in course of time. Villages with European houses alternate with Maori encampments, the latter abounding with lazy aboriginals. One of the advantages claimed for New Zealand is its similarity to England in climate and products, with the great point in its favour that while the climate has all the mildness of that of England, it lacks its severity. The average temperature of London is said to be seven degrees colder than that of North Island, and four degrees colder than the temperature of South Island. They tell us that snow seldom lies on the ground at the sea level on North Island, and not very often on South Island. But the summit of Ruapehu, the highest mountain in North Island, and also the tops of the peaks of the great mountain chains in South Island, are perpetually covered with snow. The snow line is about 7,500 feet high. The sun was shining brightly, and there was a genial warmth to the air when we left Auckland, but within an hour we were in a terrific rain that beat heavily against the windows of the railway carriage and pattered like hail on the roof. This is our one drawback, said a gentleman who accompanied us when the rain began to fall. The changes of weather and temperature in New Zealand are very sudden. The alternations from heat to cold, from sunshine to storm, from calms to gales, are so frequent and marked as to defy calculation and prevent our saying with truthfulness that there is any uniformly wet or dry season throughout the year. Then he went on to say that compared with Great Britain, the climate seemed to be far superior when the death rate was considered. It was less than 11 in 1,000 annually and lower than in any of the colonies of Australia. He claimed that the salubrity of the climate was due in great measure to the breezes for which New Zealand is noted, there being no less than 126 gales or high winds in a single year, 1885, and good winds for nearly all the rest of the time. The prevailing winds are from the northwest and southwest, with occasional storms from the opposite quarters. The annual rainfall is 28 inches at Auckland, 36 inches at Wellington, and 25 inches at Dunedin, and there is more rain on the east coast than on the west. We will learn in the next chapter what our friends saw among the hot lakes of New Zealand. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of the Boy Travellers in Australasia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by a fine voice. The Boy Travellers in Australasia by Thomas W. Knox. Chapter Ten. The volcanic region of North Island is a large one, wrote Frank in his journal. And as I can't find any two persons who agree as to its extent, I won't attempt to give its area in square miles or acres. But it is large enough to meet the wants of everybody, and hot enough to suit the most fastidious. Long before you reach the neighbourhood of the hot lakes, you find steaming springs, and there is hardly one of them that is not credited with some wonderful healing properties. On an area of a 150 square miles, there are many thousands of hot springs of all temperatures, from tepid to boiling, and of all sorts of composition. Only a few have been analysed, but enough of them to show that hardly any two are alike. All the mineral springs of the world seem to be represented in this district, and when they have been properly catalogued, they will form a sanatorium to which the entire globe can send its invalids 
for relief and healing. To make a list of the chemicals they hold in solution would be to copy the index of an exhaustive work on chemistry, and therefore I refrain. These springs have been the resort of the Maoris for centuries, and for white people ever since New Zealand could boast a white population. Wonderful cures are recorded or reported, but it is evident that an invalid should have the advice of a competent physician before trying the springs in earnest. To come here and take the baths indiscriminately, when the number and variety are so great, would be much like turning oneself loose in a drugstore and tasting the content of all the jars in succession. Thus far the principal diseases treated have been gout and rheumatism, and many a sufferer has found relief and been cured of his malady. One bath has been so successful in curing skin diseases that it is known as the painkiller. Its ingredients are sulphate of potash, sulphate of soda, chlorides of sodium, calcium, magnesia and iron, silica, hydrochloric acid, sulphuretted hydrogen and traces of alumina, lithium and iodine. What disease could stand such a combination as that? Most of the villages are near hot springs, not so much for the curative properties of the waters as for the convenience of cooking food without the trouble of collecting fuel or even building a fire. At one village where we stopped for dinner there were twelve or fifteen springs of all temperatures from tepid to boiling. We bathed in one spring while the potatoes for our dinner were being boiled in another, not a dozen yards away. Around the springs and along the path by which we walked from them to the house there were cracks and holes in the ground from which steam issued and occasionally little jets of boiling water. It gave us an uncanny feeling to walk along this path and we agreed that it was not a nice place for promenading in the dark. The proprietor of the hotel accompanied us and said it was not safe to stray from the path as one was liable to break through the thin crust and find his feet plunged into hot water which had accumulated beneath the surface. He showed us a pool which is the special resort of the Maoris and where half a dozen of them were bathing. The bathers being watched by as many more of their kinsmen who were squatted on flat stones erected over the steam jets at the edge of the pool. The temperature of the water is about 90 degrees but it rises occasionally to a hundred and more. We found a secluded pool and took a bath there. After the bath we greatly enjoyed a luscious melon which our host brought us. It is a curious sensation to stand on a hill and look over a considerable area of country which may easily be imagined to be undergoing a cooking process from one end to the other. Jets of steam rise from the ground in a great many places, some of them continuously, others in quick or slow jets, and with intervals of a second or so, or perhaps fractions of a second, and others with dignified intervals of several minutes. Some of the geezers threw up columns of water fifteen or twenty feet in height, but on the whole they were less interesting than the geysers of Yellowstone Park in America. At one place the sulphur fumes were so stifling that it was next to impossible to look into the holes in the ground, and only possible by holding the nose firmly and looking while the breath was retained. And these sulphur fumes came very near causing a horrible death to Fred. We were among the boiling springs where the greatest precaution was necessary to avoid falling into the pools, as they were only short distances apart, sometimes less than a foot. Our guide had called attention to one of the geyser holes, where the water at the bottom was boiling furiously. Fred was looking into it when suddenly there rose a puff of sulphur that half stifled him. He sprang backward as he threw his head in the air, and in doing so stepped within three inches of the edge of a pool of water that was quiescent, though almost at the boiling point. Had he fallen into it, he would have been scalded to death in a few moments. Accidents of this sort are by no means uncommon. A child of the hotel keeper fell into a pool a few months ago and was scalded so badly that it died within an hour. They told how a native woman dropped her baby from her arms. It fell into a pool of scalding water by the side of the path. The woman went in to rescue it and both mother and child were drowned in the pool. Men, horses and dogs have fallen into these pools or more frequently broken through the thin crust that lies above the accumulated hot water or hot mud beneath the surface. 
One Maori village where we stopped is so completely built on a volcanic foundation that the steam rises in every house, and the little open space in the centre, where the village councils are held, is half paved with broad stones, which are all kept warm by steam from the earth. Close to the village are several mud baths, where one may sit up to his neck in hot mud for hours, and then wash off the adhesive stuff in a neighbouring pool. These solfataras, or mud baths, are very numerous, and in many instances very dangerous. Where they are small, the hot mud simply boils and bubbles, and slowly oozes out of the ground, and the chief danger lies in breaking through the crust near them, and finding yourself plunged in the scalding mush. The larger solfataras are like the mouth of a well, the mud bubbling up in the centre and forming a ring of dirt that solidifies and offers a good footing, so far as the eye can perceive, but woe betide the unfortunate stranger who ventures to step upon it. The crust gives way and he will be fortunate if he escapes with his life. We reached Rotamahana, the famous little lake of this district, without accident, although it was evening when we got there. We were lodged in a Maori wari or house close to Te Tarata, or the white terraces, and we had a glimpse of the terraces through the indistinctness of the evening. There were steam and water jets all around, and the potatoes for our supper were boiled in one of the natural cauldrons, free of charge. To boil vegetables in one of these springs, all you have to do is to enclose them in a net of hemp or flax and lower them into the water. When they have been there long enough to take them out, and that's all there is about it. What a nice thing it would be to have a natural hot spring at your door, provided you could escape the other inconveniences connected with it. We bathed in a pool and also in the lake, the latter, though warm, being less so than the pool. The ground was warm and made the atmosphere of the house too hot for comfort, and altogether we passed an uncomfortable night. Next morning we were up bright and early to look at the terraces, and of all the wonderful things in the world, there are few that can surpass them. The white terraces are on this side of the little lake, and the pink terraces on the other. Imagine, if you can, a series of irregular steps of silver or alabaster or polished marble, about 300 feet from side to side and rising about 200 feet from the shore of the lake. These steps or terraces have been formed by the crystallization of the silica contained in the hot water in the boiling lake above. The hot water holds it in solution, and as its temperature falls, the silica is released and deposited. In the sunlight, the terraces glistened and sparkled like a collection of all the precious stones in the world, and the picture was fascinating in the extreme. We ascended from the base to the edge of the boiling lake, where the terraces begin. Our guides cautioned us that we must expect to walk continually in the water, which flowed over the terraces. But as the surface is soft and smooth, we doffed our boots and encased our feet in moccasins or shoes of untanned skin. The water at the bottom of the terraces is tepid, but each successive stage finds it hotter, and at last it is too much so for comfort. On one terrace after the other you find delightful tubs suitable for bathing. We should have bathed in them, but had been told to wait for the pink terraces on the other side of the lake, where the baths are finer. There is just enough softness to the surface formed by the silica to make it pleasant to the touch and entirely safe to walk on without danger of slipping. Not only are the terraces beautiful, but the ornamentation which has been made by the hand of nature, busily working here through many centuries, is beautiful in the extreme. The hanging ornaments and cornices at the outer edge of the terraces and on the rims of the baths surpass the work of the most gifted designer or the most vivid imagination. Description by words is out of the question, and I must fall back on the picture which I send with this. The boiling lake at the top of the white terraces is a pool perhaps a hundred feet in diameter, and varying in height from time to time. Curiously enough, it changes with the wind, though why the wind should affect it I am unable to guess. It is boiling, boiling, boiling all the while, though more furiously at some times than at others. The water is a beautiful turquoise blue, 
and so intense is the blue that it reflects upon the cloud of steam that rises from the lake. In fact, nearly all the hot springs in this region are blue, and the colour is perceptible at very slight depths. We wanted to spend a whole day here, but time pressed, and we descended to the lake again and crossed to the pink terraces. The lake is a tiny one, only a mile in length by half a mile in width. The pink terraces are smaller and lower than the white terraces, and the spaces between the pools, or bathing tubs, are not so finely wrought. The pink terraces are really not pink at all, but salmon-coloured. The white terraces have a hint of salmon, but it is less pronounced than in the other. The formation is the same in both, and having described one, it is hardly necessary that I should describe the other. We were eager for the promised bath, and were not long in getting at it. And such a bath! We undressed on the rocks a short distance from the foot of the terrace, and then entered one of the pools. The water was tepid, almost too warm for thorough enjoyment, but we did not pay much attention to it. The tub or pool was large enough for six or eight persons to bathe in, and have plenty of room, and we splashed and played there like dolphins, at least as far as our limited abilities would allow us. What surprised us most was the wonderful smoothness of the rock. It was soft to the foot when we stood upon it, and soft to the hands when we pressed them on the sides of the bath. We dashed our bodies with no light force against the rock, and somehow it seemed to yield, or at all events it did not hurt us. We went from one bath to another, and kept ascending till the warmth was more than we could endure. We sat on the edges of some of these great shell-like baths and looked down upon the little lake and over to the white terraces on the other side. It was a remarkable sight, and I certainly never heard of any other bathing tub where there was so much scenery and so much enjoyment. At the top of the pink terraces there is a lake similar to the ones that feeds the white terraces. It is about a quarter of a mile around it. The water in the lake is all the time boiling and it has the same blue colour that I have already mentioned. A cloud of steam rose continually from the surface, and it was only when we got on the windward side of the lake that we could see the water at all, and then only as the wind blew the steam away. All around the lake the rocks were encrusted with sulphur, and the incrustation continued for a good part of the way down the slope. We brought away some interesting souvenirs of our visit in the shape of leaves and flowers, encrusted with silica, the substance out of which the terraces have been formed. Leaves, flowers, feathers, sticks, any small things placed in the water become encrusted with the silica in a short time, and are easily preserved by wrapping them in cotton or other soft substances. A bird dropping in the water becomes, as it were, petrified, feathers and all. Some of the Maoris who live in the neighbourhood have adopted the plan of killing small birds, and after stuffing them with sand or other heavy substance, immersing them in the water long enough to allow the feathers to be encrusted with silica. We have bought some of these petrified birds, and find them very pretty and interesting. From the little lake we descended by a small and swift stream to Lake Tarawera, which is about seven miles long by four or five in width. We were in the ordinary canoe of the country, hollowed from the trunk of a tree, and very ticklish to sit in, as you cannot make the least inclination to one side or the other without risk of overturning. The canoe which carried us had eight rowers, so that with ourselves and guide we were twelve in all. The stream connecting the lakes is narrow and crooked, and so swift that it threatened to dash us on the shore and smash things generally. But we got through without accident, and then crossed the lake to the village of Wairoa, on our way we passed near the foot of Mount Tarawera, a truncated cone about 2,000 feet high, which is considered sacred by the Maoris. They will neither ascend it nor allow anyone else to do so. It is the burial place of the Urawa tribe of Maoris and the dwelling place of one of their tutelary gods, and for these double reasons it is held in rigid taboo. There's another taboo here, and that is on the ducks and other waterfowl that inhabit the lakes, and as no one is allowed to shoot them, they are in great numbers. 
The taboo was removed when the Duke of Edinburgh came here, and probably anyone who would pay a high price could get it suspended long enough to allow him to satisfy his desires for shooting. But the taboo does not include trapping or netting, and we had roast ducks for dinner and luncheon on payment of a few shillings. There is a grand slaughtering festivity in December of each year, and this is the real reason of enforcing the taboo at other times. Sightseeing places the world over are the cause of great demoralisation to the people that live near them, and the Hot Lake District of New Zealand is no exception. The Maoris here are as rapacious as the hackmen at Niagara Falls, the guides and hotel keepers at Rome, Naples and hundreds of other places on the continent, or the custodians of the Taj Mahal at Agra, or the Mammoth Cave of Kentucky. Every step we take has a fee of some kind attached to it, and they have even established a charge of five pounds, twenty-five dollars, for the privilege of taking photographs in the Hot Lake District. Miss Cumming, who wrote At Home in Fiji and other interesting books, tells how they tried to make her pay the photograph fee for taking sketches of the white terraces and other curiosities during her visit. She resisted on the ground that a sketch was not a photograph, but they refused to listen to her excuses and threatened to destroy her sketches unless she paid the sum demanded. She managed, however, to smuggle them away by concealing the sketches among some rugs and leaving the district under the escort of a large party of English tourists. Wairoa is a pretty village with some two or three hundred inhabitants, most of them Maoris, and has a church, a schoolhouse and two hotels for the accommodation of tourists. The church and school are less prosperous than they used to be, as the natives are not as zealous in Christianity as when they were first converted. Soon after the Maori war broke out, they hanged one of their pastors, and compelled another to flee to avoid the same fate. We were comfortably lodged at one of the hotels, and the next morning took the coach for Toranga, rejecting the advice of several persons, who told us we should not fail to see Lake Torpo and Mount Tongariro. The country is desolate, and the most that can be said of it, so far as we could learn, is that it contains large geysers and hot springs than are to be found around Lake Tarawera. There is a hot river, which is fed from boiling springs below it, and Lake Taupo is a pretty sheet of water 25 miles long by 20 in width. Tongariro is an active volcano, much larger than Tarawera, and has been ascended by very few people. The ascent is attended with so many difficulties that we did not care to undertake it. And as we had seen the most interesting part of the volcanic region of New Zealand, we concluded to return. The road from Wairoa to Taranga was rough, but the strong coach endured it without injury, and the team of six horses carried us along at a good pace. Toranga has a melancholy history, as it was the scene of severe fighting in the Maori War. About four miles from the town is the celebrated Gate Pa, which was built by the Maoris as a defiance to the English, who had a fort at Toranga. It was a fortification of double palisades, such as the Maoris usually make, the inner line of palisades being much stronger than the outer one. Inside the inner line there is a ditch where the men can stand, with the earth breast high in front of them, and they aim their guns through loopholes notched in the logs of the palisades. The outer fence is expected to delay the assailants sufficiently long to enable the defenders to shoot them down. A Maori fort is constructed with much more military skill than one would expect of a people without any training in engineering work. An English officer says that the salients, angles, ditches and parapets of the Maori pars greatly astonished the generals who tried to capture them and often led to disasters. The Tauranga Gate Pa was held by about 300 Maoris while the English had about 1,700 men for the attack. They shelled the Pa all day with heavy guns and about 4pm tried to carry it by assault. They got inside the Pa and there the soldiers were taken by panic and retreated in disorder, leaving the Maoris in possession though they evacuated the place in the night. The English lost 27 killed and 66 wounded, 
and among the dead there were eleven officers. We went through the ruins of the Pa and could not understand how the Maoris were able to stay there in all the rain of shot and shell that was poured in before the assault. There is a monument at Tauranga to commemorate the event, and an English resident showed us the little cemetery where those who fell at the gate Pa were buried. It is quite close to the sea and, like English cemeteries generally, is carefully tended and kept in order. Perhaps you would like to know something of the Maori War, as we have had occasion to mention it two or three times. Well, there was trouble between the natives and the English a few years after the establishment of the government at Auckland. It grew out of the imposition of customs duties and the purchase of land, and the natives thought they had not been treated properly. There was a good deal of fighting on a small scale, but after a while peace was established, and it lasted practically for ten or twelve years. But in March 1860 there were fresh troubles, and from the same cause as before, or rather from one of the causes, the sale of land. The government had bought some land, for which they paid the man who claimed to own it. After he had been paid, the tribe claimed it, and because the government would not pay a second time, the tribe declared war. It was joined by other tribes, and in a very short time a considerable number of Maori tribes were in full insurrection against the military authority. Bishop Selwyn and others thought the natives had been unjustly treated, and there was much dissension among the Europeans as to the right and wrong of the matter. The war lasted through 1860 and down to March 1861, when the natives, having been several times defeated, ended the trouble by surrendering. Soon after this, the Maoris thought they would have a king of their own, and representatives of some of the tribes assembled and proclaimed a native sovereignty. Previously to this, they had formed a league, which opposed the sale of land to the white strangers, and this league was entered into by a good many tribes. The movement for a king was based on the belief that, as the English had a queen, the Maoris could have a similar ruler and so in 1862 a king was chosen. War broke out again in May 1863. Troops were sent from Australia and from England, and a vigorous attempt was made to suppress the insurrection. There were many opinions as to the proper policy to pursue, owing to the differences between English and Maori laws and customs, and whatever was done by the governor or the military authorities was sure to receive severe criticism. Sometimes there were long periods of inaction, in which there was much negotiation, which generally amounted to nothing. The Maoris refused to give up their lands or arbitrate the questions in dispute, and seemed determined to defend their homes. They not only repudiated English laws regarding land tenure, but they started a movement for reviving their old practices of paganism, or rather setting up a new religion in place of the Christianity which so many of them had adopted. Several tribes joined in this movement, and the new religion spread. It was called the Pei Maria by its adherents, who are known as Hau Haus, or Hau Haus, for the reason that they pronounced that sound in loud tones during their ceremonial worship, or when engaged in battle. Some of the tribes killed or drove out their former pastors and Christian teachers, and all among them who refused to adopt the new faith were relentlessly persecuted. On the other hand, many tribes and individual Maoris remained friendly and materially aided the government in prosecuting the war. The Hau Haus were subdued in 1866, and the murderers of Reverend Mr. Volkner and other missionaries were captured and executed. Peace came, but it was temporary. Hostilities were soon resumed, but the fighting that followed was not of a very serious character. Straggling bands and isolated tribes continued to give trouble, and there was one guerrilla warrior named Tikuti, who was hunted for years without success. The king of the Maoris lived among his own people, and made no trouble as long as he was allowed to remain undisturbed. His territory was known as the King Country, and no Englishman was allowed to enter it except with a special permission from the king or some other Maori authority. Gradually his power melted away, and he is now a very shadowy king indeed.
Finding that war was not made upon them, the natives became less and less exclusive regarding the king country, and in 1883 the chiefs consented to have their land surveyed with a view to having the titles determined in the native land courts. In 1884 the Minister for Public Works passed right through the king country with the avowed object of selecting a suitable route for a railway. He was not opposed in any manner, but on the contrary was respectfully received by the chiefs. A law has been passed which reserves a large area of land for the sole use of the natives, and from present appearances there will be no further trouble with the Maoris. There you have the Maori war boiled down. It cost the government a vast amount of money, caused the shedding of a great deal of blood, led to bitter quarrels between the civil and military authorities, and very often was a matter of much perplexity to the home government of Great Britain. And practically it all came from the determination of two races of people, one native and the other foreign, to possess the rich soil of New Zealand. From Tauranga, our friend went by steamer to Napier, touching on the way at two or three ports of secondary importance. Napier is the chief town in the provincial district of Hawke's Bay, and is prettily situated in a position that in some of its features reminded Fred and Frank of Naples. The harbour is fairly good, but not as deep nor as well sheltered as that of Auckland. Important works are in progress for improving the harbour, and one of the leading citizens with whom our friends conversed assured them that before their words were in print, Napier would be ready to accommodate the largest steamers in any of the regular lines between New Zealand and Europe. Fred learned on inquiry that Napier was the outlet of a large area of grazing country, its exports consisting mainly of wool, frozen and canned meats, hides and other products of regions whose chief industries were the raising of cattle and sheep. His informant told him that since the railway had reached the forest region, they had done a fine business in lumber, and expected the lumber trade to increase year by year. He further said that while Napier was an excellent place for a man in good health, it was attractive to invalids, owing to the mildness of its climate. It is, said he, the resort of consumptive and asthmatic patients from various parts of New Zealand, and in time we expect to have them come here from Australia and India. A sanatorium has been established here in charge of our local medical men, and we also, he added, have a fine cemetery, where anybody who fails to be cured can be sure of a comfortable and quiet place. After this, what more could a town claim in its behalf? Hotels, churches, public buildings and all the paraphernalia of a perfect and prosperous town were visible to the eyes of the strangers as they rode or walked through the streets. Manufactories of various kinds were busy. There was a goodly number of ships in port and altogether Napier had an attractive appearance. That it was in the region of the Maoris was evident by the numbers of the natives on the streets, though they did not seem to be busily employed. While looking at a group of them engaged in rubbing noses with friends they had just met, this is the Maori form of salutation, Frank asked a gentleman to whom he had been introduced if the Maoris around Napier were as industrious as those of Auckland and its neighbourhood. They are not, said the gentleman, at least such is my impression. The Maoris here were friendly during the war times and consequently were allowed to retain their lands, those of the hostile tribes having been confiscated. There are about 4,000 Maoris in the Hawke's Bay district, and they own large tracts of fertile lands. Some of them have farms which they cultivate, but the greater part of them prefer to lease their lands to European settlers, and live in laziness on the rentals they receive. They are, as a rule, improvident, and show little desire to improve their condition, though the government maintains native schools amongst them at its own expense. This district, he continued, is much more pastoral than agricultural, and we think it is the best part of New Zealand for sheep and cattle. I wish you could be here at the time of our annual fair, so that you could see for yourself what we produce. The show of sheep is excellent, and the merinos, Lincolns and Cotswolds exhibited, 
cannot be excelled anywhere in the whole colony. Our horses are certainly good, and at the last show there was not an inferior animal in the cattle pens. One class of eight heifers was so good that the judges commended all that did not take prizes. Then we had ploughs, horse rakes, grain sowers, wagons, pleasure carriages, and other things, all made in our own factories, together with jewellery and silver and gold work from New Zealand metals, various manufactured articles, such as farina, starch, glucose, and other products from the growth of our fields. And here, said the gentleman, as he took up a curious lump that resembled a dried and shriveled mushroom, here is something that will puzzle you. The youths looked wonderingly at it and confessed their ignorance as to its character. I thought it would be new to you, their informant continued. It is a fungus that grows in considerable quantities on the decaying forest trees. It is sent exclusively to China, where it is highly prized both as a medicine and an article of food, and it is said to be the base of a valuable dye. The export of this fungus began about 1870 or 71. In 1873 we sent about $10,000 worth of it to China, and ten years later nearly ten times as much. There is an abundance of it, and as fast as one crop is taken from a log, a new one starts, so that there seems to be no reasonable limit to the business which may grow out of it. Frank asked if the stuff was good to eat. I never heard of anyone trying to eat it here, was the reply, except a Chinaman. No European would venture to put it into his mouth. But that's no reason why we shouldn't send it to China for consumption. Dr Bronson and his young friends remained a day at Napier, and then proceeded by railway coach and railway again to Wellington, the capital of the colony. Napier is distant from Auckland by sea about 370 miles, and 200 from Wellington. The railway carried them southward to Tahoreti, a distance of 83 miles, where they took the coach for a ride of 40 miles to Morrisville. There they found the railway to carry them to Wellington, another ride of 83 miles. They were told that within a year or two the gap would be completed and the whole distance between Napier and Wellington could then be made by train between sunrise and sunset. The first part of the ride was through a broken country, and the flocks of sheep and herds of cattle scattered on the hills supported the statement of their Napier acquaintance that the country was an excellent one for grazing. After leaving the grazing country they entered a forest region where there seemed to be an inexhaustible supply of lumber, and farther south they came to a comparatively level and open territory, admirably suited to farms. The whole region was sparsely settled, but is said to be rapidly filling up. Rabbits are numerous and our friends were told that the government and settlers had expended a great deal of money to get rid of them. But in spite of all efforts they are on the increase and have already rendered worthless large areas of good pasture land. We will have more to say of the rabbit pest in another place. For the present we will land our travellers at Wellington and send them to one of its many hotels. End of chapter 10《ラブの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人たちの旅人 As they were journeying towards the latter city. Its position is a central one, while Auckland is far to the north. There may have been other reasons for the change, but the geographical one is certainly apparent to everybody. Yes, answered Frank as he studied the map, and see what a fine harbour it has in addition to its position. Here it is at the head of a bay, which ought to be a shelter from all the storms that blow. It is the safest and most commodious harbour in New Zealand. Remarked a gentleman who had joined them in conversation while the train was rolling through the forest and undulating land that lies to the north of the city. The bay is six miles long by the same in width. It was originally named Port Nicholson and is still called so on many of the maps. 
The first settlement of the New Zealand Company was made here in 1839, a year before Captain Hobson started the government at Auckland. You are probably aware that the government was not friendly to the New Zealand Company and its enterprises at that time, and consequently Captain Hobson, the first governor, went elsewhere to establish his authority and found his capital city. Commercially, Wellington has a good future before it, and already it is in the condition of a prosperity. It has a population of 30,000 and more. The country behind it is excellent for farming and grazing. And our position on Cook Strait, which separates North and South Islands, is the very best we could have. You will see for yourselves that we have a good many industries, and nearly all of them are profitable ones. In answer to a question by one of the youths, the gentleman enumerated tanneries, candle and soap factories, founderies, boot factories, coach and carriage shops, breweries, planing and other mills. In fact, all the establishments that might properly belong to a growing city. Besides these, said he, we have meat preserving works and steamers leave regularly, carrying our frozen and canned meats for consumption in the old world. We have several clubs, half a dozen banks, wharves and dry docks for shipping, three daily papers and several weeklies and monthlies and as for public institutions in the way of hospitals, asylums and the like, you cannot name one that we are without. In their walks and rides about Wellington, our friends verified the correctness of the foregoing statement in all its essential features. They saw the factories, foundries, shops and other industrial establishments the gentleman had mentioned. They called at one of the banks to obtain money on their letters of credit. They visited one of the newspaper offices and saw the press turning out the huge sheets which are the glory of Wellington and the admiration of all New Zealand, except where personal or local preferences are otherwise. And the doctor was made at home at half the clubs before he had been six hours in the place. It is an enterprising city, wrote Frank in his journal, after their first round of sightseeing was ended. It has a hospital with more than a hundred beds, a lunatic asylum and a prison, and according to what we hear, all these institutions are well patronised. But what most surprises us are the public buildings, which ought to be sufficient for the wants of the city for many years to come. The government building is an immense structure in the Italian style. It covers an area of two acres, and is said to be the largest wooden edifice in the world. Then there are Government House, where the colonial governor lives and exercises the duties of ruler of New Zealand, the Houses of Legislature, which are lighted by electric light, the Provincial Buildings, the Supreme Court Buildings, and the Offices of the City and of the Provincial District. The Telegraph and Postal Departments are in the largest brick building in the colony, and as for churches, they are, as the auctioneers say in their advertisements, too numerous to mention. We have the choice of twenty or more hotels, and if we should want to go to the theatre, we have three to choose from though the number is just now reduced to two, as one is closed for repairs. They showed us the college, which has about 150 students, who come mostly from Wellington and its vicinity, though there are representatives of every district in the colony. The streets are well paved and lighted with gas. They have street railways by which you can go quickly to all the principal suburbs, and if you prefer to ride by yourself, there are as many cabs as you could wish for. We have visited the Colonial Museum where we saw much to interest us, particularly in regard to the Maoris. There is a fine collection of Maori weapons and articles of manufacture, and one might almost make up a history of this interesting people by studying the Maori department of the museum. Of course they have a skeleton of the gigantic Dinornis, or Moa, which we have already described. And there is a beautiful display of the birds of New Zealand, which has been arranged by a skilled ornithologist. From the museum we went to the botanical gardens, which cover an area of perhaps a hundred acres, and are finally laid out. They are a favourite resort of the public, and here in the early evening we had an opportunity to see of what a curious mixture the population of a New Zealand city is made up. There were men and women from all parts of the United Kingdom. Yorkshiremen jostled against Londoners, a Dubliner against a representative of Glasgow, and a Welshman against one who first saw the light at Dover, or Brighton, English, Scotch, Irish, Catholic, Protestant, Gentile, 
and Israelite all met harmoniously, and if they brought to this country any of their old quarrels of race or religion, they forgot them all, at least while in the gardens. But if the assemblage at the botanical gardens was interesting, so was the collection of trees and ferns. The botanical gardens are rich in these things, and will be richer as the years go on. Not far from the gardens is a specimen of the New Zealand forest. We saw it at various points along the railway, but did not try to walk through it as we did here. Unless a path is previously cut, it is absolutely impervious. So closely woven are the vines that interlace between the trees and climb to their very tops. It is this impenetrability of the forest that gave the Maoris such an advantage during the war, as it was impossible for the English troops to follow them half a dozen yards into the bush. When Wellington was first settled, and down to a few years ago, the hills around the town were covered with this kind of forest. Most of it has been cut down now, partly for the sake of the wood, and more particularly for the purpose of clearing the ground, and making it available for agriculture or building. As we are in the capital of New Zealand, this is a good place to study the government of the colony. Well then, New Zealand is an English colony, with a governor appointed by the Queen, and acting in accordance with the principles of responsible government. Legislative power is vested in the governor, and two chambers. One of these chambers is called the Legislative Council, and consists of 54 members, nominated by the governor for life. The other is called the House of Representatives, elected by the people for three years, and consisting at present of 94 members. Down to 1876, each of the nine provinces of the colony had an elective superintendent and a provincial council. In that year, the provincial form of government was abolished, and the colony was divided into counties and road board districts, and the local administration is now managed by the county councils and municipalities. The colonial legislature meets once a year and has power generally to make laws for the government of New Zealand. The acts of the legislature may be disallowed by the Queen, and in some cases they require her assent, but the royal prerogative is very rarely exercised. Voters must be 21 years of age, either born or naturalised British subjects, and must have resided one year in the colony and six months in the electoral district. Every male Maori of the same age, whose name is on a ratepayer's roll, or who has a freehold estate of the value of £25, may also be enrolled as a voter. There are four Maori members of the House of Representatives, elected under a special law by the Maoris alone. Legislation concerning the sale and disposal of the public lands and the occupation of the goldfields is exclusively vested in the colonial parliament. In general, it may be said that the parliament and the county and local boards have the management of public affairs, just as the parliament of England and the local authorities there conduct the affairs of the nation at home. There is no connection between church and state, otherwise than in all ministers being registered once a year in order that they may legally perform the marriage ceremony. At the last reports, there were 638 registered ministers belonging to the following denominations. Church of England, 235, Presbyterian Church of New Zealand, 81, Roman Catholic, 86, Presbyterian Church of Otago and Southland, 57, Methodists, 95, Congregational Independent, 19, Baptist, 17, and 10 other bodies, with from 1 to 17 ministers each. The Episcopalians of various kinds have over 200,000 adherents, the Presbyterians, 113,000, the Methodists, 50,000, and Catholics, 70,000. The whole country is divided into school districts for educational purposes. The education is secular and free, the common branches being taught on the same basis as in the schools of most of the United States. There are high schools and academies in the cities and larger towns. There are colleges and universities in the principal cities, and there is the University of New Zealand, which is an examining body only, and has the power to confer the same degree as the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. All things considered, the educational system of the colony 
seems to be an excellent one, and the people deserve credit for the attention they have given to it. We were invited to visit some of the schools in Auckland, and also in Napier and Wellington, and while travelling through the country, we have had glimpses of some of the smaller schools. It was very much like visiting similar establishments in New England or New York, the branches of study, as well as the form of instruction, being practically the same. They tell us there are more than 1,100 schools of all kinds in the colony, and nearly 100,000 scholars attending them. 73% of the male and 68% of the female population can read and write, and about 5% can read only. In the coming generation, the proportion will be much greater. In another respect, New Zealand resembles England in having an enormous public debt in proportion to her population. According to the published figures, the debt amounts to £35 million, pounds, or $175 million, which is very nearly $350 for each inhabitant of the colony. The interest charge on this debt is about $13 annually for each inhabitant, so that the tax for this purpose alone is by no means light. And yet the colony seems quite unconcerned about it, and the authorities generally seem to think that there will be no trouble whatever in paying the interest promptly, and also in wiping out the principal in course of time. A sinking fund has been established for the reduction of the debt, and at the last report it exceeded $15 million. The money has been expended in various public works, especially in the construction of railways, of which there are nearly 2,000 miles in both islands, South Island having the greater number. There are a few private lines, principally for the use of coal mining companies, and not amounting in all to 20 miles. All the others are the property of the government, and are operated on its account. The profit of operating the railways is about 2% of their cost, but the lines are greatly benefiting the country in aiding its development and will doubtless pay much better before many years. There, I'm afraid I've given you a large dose of figures, but if you don't like them you can skip. They were interesting to Fred and myself and therefore I thought others might like to see them. Population, railways, education and public debt are interesting studies when they concern a country which has been colonised only since 1840 and is literally on the other side of the world from England and the United States. While Frank was occupied with the foregoing story, Fred was making further investigations about Wellington. One of his first queries was about the use of wood in the construction of so many of the public buildings and nearly all the private residences. He learned in response to his interrogatories that Wellington has suffered at different dates from earthquakes and at one time they were so severe and so numerous that it was thought it would be necessary to abandon the site altogether. Buildings of wood endure earthquakes much better than do those of stone or brick and then too wood is a cheaper material. All through New Zealand the proportion of wooden buildings to stone, concrete or brick is very large, and it is larger in Wellington than in any other city. Many of the buildings stand on ground, reclaimed from the sea, and the work of reclamation is still going on. High hills come down close to the original shore, and while they are good enough as the sites of residences, they are unsuited to the requirements of commerce, which prefers level ground. Wellington is the centre of a considerable steamship business, the lines from Sydney and Melbourne centre there. It is the port of the lines running between England and the colony, and all the coasting lines included in their itinerary. A pressing invitation was given to our friends to visit New Plymouth, the principal town of the provincial district of Taraniki, north of the provincial district of Wellington. They at first declined, but afterwards accepted when they found that their time and engagements would permit their doing so. The journey was by coach 70 miles to Foxton, and thence by rail 190 miles to New Plymouth. A railway is in course of construction between Wellington and Foxton, and is completed for a short distance from Wellington. The coach ride was more interesting than coach rides usually are, and is thus described by Fred. The weather was delightful, and we had seats on the outside of the coach. 
so that our view of the scenery was unobstructed. For the first few miles the road follows the shore of the bay, then it turns into a pretty valley, which was once heavily wooded, but is now cleared, and no doubt deprived of much of its former beauty. We cross the ridge, which separates the harbour of Wellington from the ocean on the west coast, and after winding among a series of hills, found ourselves rolling along close to the shore of the ever-restless Pacific. N.B. No joke is intended in the juxtaposition of the last three words of the foregoing sentence. The villages we saw had native and foreign names strangely mingled. One village was Johnsonville, and the next was Porirua. One was Horokiwi, and another close to it was Smithtown, or something of the sort. We wound through the Horokiwi Valley, ascending steadily, and suddenly reached the summit of a hill, which gave us a magnificent view. To the north was a great plain, which seemed almost as limitless as the ocean that filled the western horizon, and lay far below us at the base of an almost precipitous hill. Rising out of the sea was the island of Kapiti, its summit nearly 2,000 feet high, and forming a striking feature in the picture before us. The driver called attention to something that resembled a white cloud on the horizon to the northwest, and told us it was Mount Egmont, nearly a 150 miles distant, and which we should see very closely as we approached New Plymouth. We used our eyes every minute of the time the horses were taking breath, and then started down a steep hillside to the sea again. As soon as we reached the sea, we turned along the beach, and followed it for 40 miles till we drew up in Foxton. In a year or two, the railway from Wellington will be completed to Palmerston, where it will connect with the Foxton to New Plymouth line. When this happens, it is probable that the old stage road will be abandoned, and travellers deprived of a very interesting ride. Foxton is a flourishing little place, with perhaps a thousand inhabitants, on the bank of the Manawatu River, four miles from its mouth. We saw numerous fields of flax in the vicinity, and were told that flax was an important article of export. We had little time to look around, as our coach connected with the train, and in less than half an hour we were rolling up the valley of the Manawatu, which the railway follows for some distance. Ten miles out of Foxton we entered the forest, or bush as they call it here, though much of it has been cleared away. Lumber is an important product. We saw a goodly number of sawmills at work, and met freight trains laden with lumber on its way to the seaport. The gentleman who accompanied us pointed out some villages which he said were settled by Scandinavians, who had proved themselves the very best of colonists. From bush to open country, and from open country to bush, our train went on, stopping occasionally at stations with little villages grouped around them, but very often with no other buildings visible than those belonging to the railway. Our host explained to us that the railway was built to develop the country, and for the greater part of the route, it was in advance of civilization and settlement. I think, said he, you have built a great many miles of railway in the United States in the same way, and in doing so your stations have been practically in the wilderness until settlements sprang up around them. Railways in New Zealand have done a great deal for the development of the country, and will do a great deal more as time goes on. They give the settlers the communication they want with the markets, and without such communication they cannot get along. The passengers that boarded or left the train at the stations were principally settlers on the agricultural lands, labourers on farms or in sawmills, woodchoppers going to their work or leaving it for a visit to one of the towns, merchants and travelling agents of various kinds and occasional natives. The Maoris have not been slow to perceive the advantages of the railway. At first they were disinclined to travel by it, through fear of evil consequences, but their prejudice is steadily diminishing. Dr. Bronson says prejudice against railways is not confined to savages, as he has known fairly intelligent men in New England and other parts of the United States resolutely refuse to trust themselves inside a railway carriage under any circumstances. Our host tells us that the Maoris were once under the impression that the Englishman had a demon of some kind chained in the locomotive and compelled to move it by turning a crank. 
their more intelligent men have learned the power of steam and explained it as far as possible to the rest, so that the demon theory exists no longer. We left behind us the provincial district of Wellington and entered that of Taraniki. The district takes its name from the Taraniki Mountain, which has been called Egmont by the English, and is so known on the maps. Mount Egmont is a cone 8,300 feet high and volcanic. We wanted to ascend it, but had not the time to do so, and consoled ourselves with the reflection that we were saved from a great deal of fatiguing work. It is no easy matter to ascend this mountain. Those who have undertaken it have never shown any anxiety to repeat the journey. The mountain lies close to the sea, as you will observe by a glance at the map, and serves as a magnificent landmark for sailors approaching this part of the coast. New Plymouth has a population of some 4,000 or more, and is the port of a section of country which is said to be very fertile, as it can grow nearly every English fruit and cereal. It was settled in 1841, but suffered much during the Maori Wars, as most of the natives in the district of Taranaki were hostile. They showed us several factories, sawmills, and a large flouring mill, and they called our attention to an establishment for making iron from the sands of the seashore. All along this coast of North Island, there is a large quantity of iron in the sand, sometimes as high as 70%. The people call it steel, but it is really iron. It is in fine particles, just like the iron sands of the southern shore of Long Island near New York. They said the ironworks at New Plymouth had never been prosperous, as they could not get the proper flux for the metal. If they could only do this, their success would be enormous. Dr. Bronson told them that exactly the same thing had been tried near New York for utilising the black sand of Long Island, and thus far it had been a failure. The large proportion of iron in the sand is noticeable, not only to the eye but to the sense of touch. As you pick up a handful, its unusual weight at once calls attention to it. We visited a farm near New Plymouth, where we spent a night and a day listening to stories of the troublesome times of the Maori War, riding or walking through finely tilled fields and looking at herds of cattle and flocks of sheep, which were well calculated to excite the admiration of all who are interested in grazing or agricultural pursuits. One gentleman whom we met was an old settler who had fought the Maoris and had twice seen his farm devastated and his fields ploughed up to destroy the growing crops. On the road near his farm, a party of Europeans was waylaid and murdered one day by the Maoris and it was only an accident which prevented his being one of the party. As long as the troubles with the Maoris continued, the district of Taranaki was in a precarious state, as the lands could not be occupied, but with the establishment of peace, there was every reason to believe their settlement would be a matter of steady progress. We returned to New Plymouth in time to take the semi-weekly coasting steamer for Wellington, where we stopped a few hours and then continued across Cook Strait to Nelson and Picton, taking steamer at the latter place for Port Littleton on the east coast. The route is an interesting one, as the steamer is for most of the time close to the coast, which is bold and rugged, and contains many little bays that remind us of the fjords of Norway, or the inlets on the coast of Newfoundland or New Brunswick. Nelson is on a landlocked bay, which is rather difficult of entrance, but forms a perfect anchorage for a ship that once gets inside. Picton has a situation very much like that of Nelson, and each is a centre of a farming and sheep raising region. They had a great deal of trouble with the Maoris in the war times, and one of the sites of Picton is a hill a few miles from the town, which was the scene of the so called Werau massacre. Thirteen settlers were killed there in a fight with the natives, and after the affair was over, nine other settlers who had been taken prisoners were murdered in cold blood. At Port Littleton, our friends left the steamer and proceeded to Christchurch which is reached by a railway eight miles long and largely tunnelled through the hills, one tunnel being nearly two miles in length. Before the days of the railway, the means of communication was along a wagon road, which was known as the zigzag, and occasionally at present the road is patronised by those who dislike railway travel or seek the picturesque. Littleton has a good harbour, which is principally due to the expenditure of a large amount of money for the construction of a breakwater and other purposes, and the place is picturesquely situated 
at the head of a bay. Christchurch owes its existence to a movement in England, near the end of the first half of the century, for establishing a thoroughly English colony in New Zealand. Its projectors proposed to retain everything that was best in English life, government, habits, manners, and above all, the Church of England. The direction of the colony was to lie in the hands of the Canterbury Association at home, rather than in the control of the government, though there was no intention of taking a position hostile to it. One of the founders of the Canterbury colony had been instrumental in establishing a Scotch colony in another part of New Zealand, and being Scotch, it was naturally Presbyterian. There is a story about him that he once projected an Anglo-Hebrew colony, where the Hebrews should govern themselves according to their own laws and have no Christians living among them. He proposed this to a wealthy Israelite and hoped the scheme would be received favourably. The gentleman listened patiently to his proposition and then said, I do not see how my people can thrive in such a community. Most of them live by trade and will want to be where there's somebody to trade with. The plan of the new colony was rejected at once. The British government gave the Canterbury scheme all the privileges it desired, except that of perfect self-government, which of course could not be permitted. Canterbury was established as a province of New Zealand, with Christchurch as its capital, and altogether it has been prosperous. Christchurch is quite English in appearance and surroundings, and boasts a cathedral which is not yet finished, and it has a fine array of public buildings, several churches of the Church of England, and others of the Baptist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, and other faiths. The design of the founders of the Canterbury Colony has not been strictly carried out, but on the whole has been quite successful. There is an excellent museum which is especially rich in New Zealand matters, and there are parks, gardens, cricket grounds, and other places of amusement and exercise. With its suburbs, it has a population of nearly 30,000, and therefore is entitled to dignified respect as a city. It would not have been difficult for us to imagine ourselves in England, said Frank in his journal, after describing their arrival at Christchurch. Here are English shade trees along the streets, and in the gardens and parks. The houses are English in their mode of construction and furnishing, and the little river that runs through the town is called the Avon. There are tramways, or horse railways, along the broad and well-made streets. The lawns are velvety with English grasses, and along the banks of the winding river, the weeping willow droops almost to the surface of the water. We have been riding in all directions and in the suburbs, and everywhere we have seen signs of prosperity and comfort. As we went out on the principal road, we were very soon in the midst of some fine farms, and were not at all surprised to learn that the country around Christchurch is very fertile and well adapted to farming. The fields have English grasses and are surrounded by English hedges, and many of the farms looked for all the world as though they had been picked up in England and dropped down here. The city has its watering place at Sumner, nine miles away, and there the inhabitants go to get rid of the summer's heat, as New Yorkers go to Coney Island or Long Branch. A gentleman to whom we had letters of introduction invited us to dine at his house the day we arrived, but an hour before the time for us to start, he came to the hotel and evidently had something serious on his mind. After a few preliminary words, he came straight to the point and said he was obliged to ask us to consider the engagement off for the present. The fact is, said he, my wife's cook has just left to get married and our other girl left last week and we've not been able to fill her place. There's nobody in the house to cook the dinner. My wife can take care of the household, but we would hardly like to try to entertain visitors under such circumstances. Of course we excused him, and tried to make his mortification as slight as possible. The incident led to a conversation about the servant question, which has troublesome features in many other countries, as well as in New Zealand. The gentleman who wanted to be our host, but just then couldn't, told us that there was a great scarcity of house servants in the colony, and he thought Christchurch was a little worse off than any other city, though he was not at all sure about it. Very often it is impossible to get maid servants at any price, 
and those that can be obtained demand high wages and are independent to a degree that would not be tolerated in England. A discharge has no terrors for a cook or housemaid who knows that a dozen places are open to her and when she consents to take a place she can be sure of four dollars a week and her board with at least two evenings out in a week and sometimes three. Many of the well-to-do colonists had tried the experiment of importing maidservants from England but found the speculation a bad one as the girls generally left service in a few months to get married. Their passage had been paid to New Zealand and with matrimony in view they laughed at any idea of working out the time for which they had agreed. He further told us that in many houses the mistress was obliged to do all her own work with the aid of her daughters, if she had any. And this, too, where they were perfectly willing and able to hire servants. Dr. Bronson told him the story of the man in San Francisco who was trying to hire a maid servant that declined the situation on account of his three children. I will not go into a family where there is more than one child, was her ultimatum. Whereupon the gentleman said, We can easily fix that, I think. How so? she asked. I'll speak to my wife about it, and rather than lose the chance of engaging you, I've no doubt she would be willing to drown two of them. Our New Zealand friend laughed heartily over the story, and before he left us, he had evidently forgotten his annoyance at the circumstance that brought him to the hotel. He added that the story would not be inappropriate to Christchurch, but he feared all his neighbours would not appreciate the joke. All along this part of the coast, water is obtained by artesian wells at about 80 feet from the surface. Christchurch has hundreds of such wells, and the supply of water never fails. They reminded us of the wells in the sands of Long Island and along the Atlantic coast of the United States, all the way to Florida. End of chapter 11